What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. Um, so today this will be the cardiovascular system. This will be done as a remake from the previous cardiovascular system with hopefully better audio. It also has timestamps, so feel free to pause it at certain times or skip through to sections you want to study more. There's also a lot of pictures, so you can pause it and focus more on those concepts as well. So dilated car cardiomyopathy is a systolic dysfunction. It leads to a weakened dilated heart. It's the most common type of cardiomyopathy overall. Risk factors are more common in 20 to 60 years old in men. And the etiologies are idiopathic as the most common, maybe familial. Infections, viral is the most common, especially enteroviruses like Coxsackie B virus. Post-viral, myocarditis as well, HIV, Lyme disease, parvovirus B19, as well as Chagas disease. For toxic causes, it could be alcohol abuse, cocaine, also anthracyclines like doxorubicin and radiation. Pregnancy, autoimmune could also occur, and metabolic would be thyroid disorders, also vitamin B1, thiamine deficiency. So I put a mnemonic here for dilated cardiomyopathy, and it's A squared, B squared, C, and D. So A squared is A2, autoimmune in pregnancy, and also alcohol due to decreased thiamine. B2 is Coxsackie B virus, as well as B1 deficiency. C is cocaine, and D is doxorubicin. For clinical manifestations of dilated cardiomyopathy are systolic heart failure, left-sided failure, L is for lungs, so dyspnea and fatigue, right-sided failure can occur as well, peripheral edema, JBD, hepatomegaly, and GI symptoms. There could also be embolic events and arrhythmias as well. So for the arrhythmias, it's the dial how it results in this is it's stretching the desmosomes, which widens the gap junctions for depolarization of the actual myocardium. So when the electrical signal is conducted, down the pathways, it kind of gets disrupted and leads to arrhythmias. For physical exam findings, you can have an S3 gallop due to a filling ventricle defect, as well as mitral and tricuspid regurge. For diagnostic studies of dilated cardio, you want to do echocardiogram, which is the diagnostic test of choice, left ventricular dilation leading to a large chamber, also thin ventricular walls, and decreased ejection fraction, importantly. So this leads to HEFREF with reduced ejection fraction. Also ventricular hypokinesis as well. Similar findings in systolic heart failure as well. Chest radiograph, you'll have cardiomegaly, pulmonary edema, and pleural effusions. Low amplitude QRSs, remember for pleural effusions, that electrical alternance. And for EKG, they may show some sinus tack or some other arrhythmias like we said. For management of dilated cardiomyopathy, it's just standard systolic heart failure management with especially knowing our mortality reducers, um, with beta blockers, ACE and ARB, spironolactone, and don't forget hydralazine with a nitrate only. And um, you can do symptomatic control with diuretics or digoxin, but remember diuretics and digoxin actually don't lower mortality. And lastly, you can do an automated implantable cardioverter defibrillator, an AICD, if the ejection fraction is under 35 or 30 percent. So next will be Takotsobu or stress cardiomyopathy. Takotsobu cardiomyopathy is a transient regional systolic dysfunction of the left ventricle that can imitate myocardial infarction, but it is associated with an absence of significant obstructive coronary artery disease or evidence of plaque rupture. Risk factors for Takotsobu are postmenopausal women, importantly, being exposed to physical or emotional stress, such as the death of a loved one, catastrophic medical diagnosis, or acute medical illness. The pathophys of Takotsobu, it's thought to be multifactorial, but it does include a catecholamine surge, importantly, during physical or emotional stress. So catecholamine surge, also microvascular dysfunction, and coronary artery spasm. Clinical manifestations are similar to ACS, with some substernal chest pain, dyspnea, and syncope. And for diagnosis, for EKG, we'll see ST elevations, especially in the anterior lead, similar to an anterior MI. They may, may also have ST depressions too. <clears throat> and interestingly, the cardiac enzymes are often positive, so they may have positive troponins and ST elevations, which may make you think of a STEMI. But on coronary angiography, importantly, there's the absence of an acute plaque rupture or any obstructive coronary disease. On, on examination, this is an all the way question, meaning the diagnosis is considered in patients with ACS with no evidence of obstructive coronary artery disease on the coronary angiography. On echo, you can also do an echocardiogram. You'll have transient regional left ventricular systolic dysfunction 
especially left apical ventricular ballooning. Importantly, left apical ventricular ballooning. And this is usually performed, the echo is, after ACS has been ruled out. So again, they may have ST elevations, positive troponins, however, you take them to angiography, and they actually don't have any obstructive coronary artery disease, and then you do an echo, and it shows ventricular ballooning. So the management for this is, because the initial presentation of Takotsubu cardiomyopathy presents similar to ACS, patients are treated for ACS, such as with aspirin, nitro, beta blockers, heparin, and coronary angiography, like we said, to rule out any obstructive coronary artery disease. Short myopathy is a transient condition. Conservative and supportive care is the mainstay of treatment, again with beta blockers, ACE inhibitors for three to six months, with serial imaging to assess for improvement. Also anticoagulation in some with left ventricular dysfunction, with ejection fraction especially under 30%, or if any thrombus is present. Next we'll go into restrictive cardiomyopathy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is a diastolic dysfunction in a non-dilated ventricle, which impedes ventricular filling, decreased compliance. So the stiff ventricle fills with great effort. It's stiff not from hypertrophy, but from deposits actually into the ventricle itself. And these deposits are infiltrative diseases, especially amyloido amyloidosis, which is most common, sarcoidosis, hemochromatosis, could also be metastatic, scleroderma, endocar endomyocardial fibrosis, or idiopathic. So how I remember this is I has I infiltrative diseases, H hemochromatosis, A amyloidosis, which again is the most common, and S sarcoidosis. Clinical manifestations, they'll have right-sided failure, which is greater than the left-sided failure symptoms. Right-sided failure symptoms are hepatosplenomegaly, JV. D, and also hepatojugular reflux, peripheral edema, and uh, ascites. They could also have GI symptoms, so with that ascites, it actually pushes on their stomach, and then they're unable to, they have early satiety, they're unable to have an appetite, hold food down, they may also have nausea and vomiting. And for left-sided failure symptoms, they could have some lung symptoms like dyspnea, which is the most common complaint, as well as fatigue. They'll have the classic Kuzmal sign which is the lack of an inspiratory decline or increase in JVP with inspiration. So with each breath in, you would expect there to be more right ventricular filling, but for this, there's actually less, and all that blood that was going to go in there increases the JVP instead. So it kind of backs up trying to go into the right side of the heart. Again, signs of heart failure and S3 may be heard, and pulmonary hypertension. For diagnosis, you want to do echo, first line, this is the diagnostic test of choice. You'll see non-dilated ventricles with normal thickness, maybe slightly thicker. So it's not the thickness, it's not the hypertrophy, it's the deposits in there. Diastolic dysfunction, marked dilation of both atria. So the deposits are only in the ventricles, not the atria. So in response, the atria have to dilate out in order to compensate. So again, diastolic dysfunction, marked dilation of both atria. Systolic function is generally preserved in early disease. And you also may have a bright speckled myocardium in amyloidosis. This is the most common presentation. Chest radiograph, you'll have a normal ventricular chamber size and also enlarged atria. And there could be some pulmonary congestion as well. For EKG, low voltage QRS, also arrhythmias, increased BNP, increased BNP. Endomyocardial biopsy is the definitive diagnosis. However, this is not often used. And amyloidosis is associated with an apple green birefringence with Congo red staining. So amyloidosis, apple green birefringence with Congo red staining. For management, no specific treatment. You want to treat the underlying disorder. For instance, if they have hemochromatosis, you can do chelation. If they have glucocorticoids or sarco for sarcoidosis. And also note for hemochromatosis, in Rosh they ask what's the treatment for this. You would think chelation, but it's um, chronic phlebotomy. So you want to treat the underlying disorder, such as chelation for hemochromatosis or glucocorticoids for sarcoidosis. And in Rosh, actually, you'd think it's chelation for hemochromatosis, but they say serial phlebotomy um, as opposed to chelation. And also gentle diuresis for symptoms. So next will be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. For hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this is an autosomal dominant genetic disorder of inappropriate left ventricular or right ventricular hypertrophy with a diastolic dysfunction. 
So it's a subaortic outflow obstruction due to asymmetrical septal hypertrophy and systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. The obstruction worsens with increased contractility, such as with exercise, the joxin or beta, beta agonists that increases the sympathetic, or, or and decreased left ventricular volume. So dehydration, decreased venous return, and valsalva maneuver. So basically, there's less blood to fill, so the septum, because it's hypertrophied in the interventricular septum, it can squish up against the lateral side of the ventricle and lead to no filling of the left ventricle, so no output. For clinical manifestations, you get dyspnea as the most common symptom, fatigue, angina, chest pain, presyncope, syncope, dizziness, arrhythmias, maybe asymptomatic initially. Also important to know, sudden cardiac death. For hokum, sudden cardiac death, especially in adolescents and pre-adolescent children, especially during times of extreme exertion due to ventricular fibrillation. So sudden cardiac death due to V-fib. For physical exam of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, you have harsh systolic murmur, heard best at the left sternal border. For increasing the murmur intensity, it's with decreased venous return, such as valsalva or standing or decreased afterload, such as amyl nitrate. So just to go over those quickly, Valsalva, you're bearing down and blocking the return of the IVC and the SVC to the heart, so there's less blood actually going to the heart. For standing, if you're going from sitting to standing, all the blood just kind of drops and pools in the lower extremities, so less going to the heart. And afterload reducers, so dilating the aorta, for instance, allows there to be, or allows it to be easier for the blood to get out of the left ventricle, so therefore there'll be less in it. For decreased murmur intensity, with increased venous return, like squatting, supine, or leg raise, or increased afterload, such as with hand grip, increased left ventricular volume, preserves the outflow. They may have a loud S4, also mitral regurge, S3, or pulsus bispherines. For diagnosis, you want to do echocardiogram. Asymmetric ventricular wall thickness, especially the septal wall, of 15 millimeters or greater. Systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve in small left ventricular chamber size. For EKG, you see left ventricular hypertrophy, anterior lateral and inferior pseudo Q waves, and an enlarged atria. For management, the overall goal is to decrease the time when the heart is not filled. So you want to hydrate them, slow them down exercise, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. So focusing also on early detection, medical management, surgical management, and or ICD placement. For medical, like we said, beta blockers first line. So again, beta blockers first line for hokum. Also alternatives are calcium channel blockers and desopyramide. For surgical, it's important to know myomectomy is usually performed in young patients that are refractory to medical therapy. And also alcohol septal ablation can be done. This is an alternative to a surgical myomectomy. Patients should avoid dehydration, extreme exertion and exercise, and cautious with digoxin, nitrates, and diuretics. Remember, digoxin increases contractility, and nitrates and diuretics decrease left ventricular volume. So it has here for exam tip the difference between aortic stenosis versus hokum. So both uh, aortic stenosis and hokum have angina, syncope, and systolic in nature. Both murmurs go in the same direction with afterload maneuvers, so both increase with amyl nitrate and both actually decrease with hand grip. For hokum, however, the preload maneuvers that decrease left ventricular volume, like we said, valsalva and standing, will actually worsen the murmur of hokum, whereas these murmurs will decrease the intensity of most other murmurs, including aortic stenosis, increase left ventricular volume due to squatting or leg raise, will decrease the murmur of hokum whereas these maneuvers will actually increase the intensity of aortic stenosis. No carotid radiation. Now we'll move to myocarditis. So myocarditis is inflammation of the heart muscle. It's most common in young adults. The pathophys is myocellular damage leading to myocardial necrosis and dysfunction leading to heart failure. The etiologies are infectious as the most common cause, viral being most common, especially the enteroviruses, just like dilated, like we said, Coxsackie B virus, and also bacterial could cause it. Autoimmune can cause it, SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, also RA, rheumatoid. Uremia, also medications like clozapine, it's important to know. Clozapine for myocarditis. 
methyl dopa, antibiotics, isoniazid, cyclophosphamide, phenytoin, indomethacin, etc. Clinical, uh, clinical manifestations, they'll have a viral prodrome, fever, myalgias, malaise for several days, followed by symptoms of a systolic dysfunction, dilated cardiomyopathy. So this goes almost hand in hand with dilated cardiomyopathy. Heart failure symptoms, dyspnea, fatigue, exercise intolerance, S3, gallop. Others, you could have a megacolon, also pericarditis, pericardial friction rub and effusion. For diagnostic studies, you want to do a chest radiograph, you'll see cardiomegaly, which is classic. For EKG, it will show nonspecific changes, sinus tack, normal may show pericarditis as well. And remember, pericarditis is those diffuse ST elevations that are kind of coved in, and also PR depressions in the precordial leads before the uh, diffuse ST elevations. For labs, may have positive cardiac enzymes, increased ESR. Echo will show ventricular systolic dysfunction and dilation. It also helps to rule out the other causes if you want to do an echo. For endomyocardial biopsy, this is the gold standard. And this is infiltration of lymphocytes within the myocardial tissue leads to necrosis, usually reserved for severe or refractory cases. Management is the supportive as mainstay of treatment, standard systolic heart failure treatment on ACEs, ARBs, and beta blockers and diuretics. Next, we'll go through EKGs and the different steps to how to analyze the EKG and what you might see in each step. So first, we want to determine the rhythm. Is it regular or irregular? We can use the rhythm strip. We can also check the R to R intervals. And if they're under 120 milliseconds, we consider it a regular rhythm. Step two, we want to determine the rate. Um, if it's a regular rhythm, we count 1,500 divided by the number of small squares, that's milliseconds, or 150. Or we can count down also 30, 150, 100, 75, 60, and 50 method for each small box between an R to R interval. If it's irregular, we should probably count the number of R waves in the six second strip and multiply that by 10. So we can do either one, it just depends on the rhythm, if the rhythm is regular or irregular. Again, if it's regular, we'll probably do the 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50 method. And if it's an irregular rhythm, we can't really use that reliably. So we want to just count the number of R waves in a total six second strip. And it has to be six second strip, and you can multiply that by 10. And then for step three, we should determine the axis, the QRS axis. We should determine the QRS axis. So how do we determine the QRS axis? We have to look at lead one and lead AVF. So we can do the thumb method, or we can look at it and see what it actually is. So for normal, they'll be positive in lead one, positive QRS complexes, that is, and positive also in AVF. If it's a left axis deviation, that means it's more towards the left side, like in LVH, and it will have a positive in lead one and a negative in AVF. If it's a right axis deviation, such as in right ventricular hypertrophy, etc., it will rotate to the right side, the heart will, and it'll be negative in lead one and positive in AVF. You can also use the thumb method. So the left thumb will be lead one, the right thumb will be AVF. Depending which one goes negative, the opposite side means that's where the axis is pointing to. Also, if left axis deviation, you wanna consider if it's based on lead one and AVF, and you're still not sure, you can check lead two. So if the QRS predominates in, uh, is predominantly positive in lead two, it's a normal axis. That's from zero to negative 30 degrees. But if the QRS is predominantly negative in lead two, you wanna consider that left axis deviation, which is less than negative 30. So you always wanna check that lead two if you're not sure, or if you think it's a left axis deviation. So next you can, for step four, you should evaluate the P waves or P to R interval. So you want to look at lead 2 and B1 for P wave morphology. Is it a sinus? If it's positive and upright in lead 1, 2, or AVF, and negative in AVR, each P wave is followed by a QRS complex. So that's important for step 4. Each P wave is followed by a QRS, and you should have that negative in AVR as well. Is the PR interval normal? A normal PR interval is 120 milliseconds, or 0.12 to 0 0.20 or 100, like I said, 120 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds or three to five small boxes. Or is it prolonged PR interval, which is greater than 
0 0.20 or shortened under 0 0.12? Or is there atrial enlargement? So we can look at left atrial enlargement versus right atrial enlargement. For left atrial enlargement, we're going to see an M-shaped P wave in lead 2, which is greater than 0.12 seconds or 3 boxes, and a biphasic P wave in V1 with a larger terminal component. So basically the SA node creates the electrical vector from the right atrium to the left atrium. If it is enlarged, it takes a little bit longer to get through the whole entire left atrium. So that's why we see those almost bunny ears, almost bunny ears, more of an M shape, because it depolarizes the SA node in the right atrium, and then takes a little bit longer to get over. So we kind of see that dip there, and that's for left atrial enlargement. So that's kind of opposite what we see for right atrial enlargement, where we see the tall P waves in leads two, which are greater than three millimeters. And this is a biphasic P wave in V1 with a larger initial component. So it's just basically like a much bigger P wave in that area. So step five, we want to evaluate the QRS complex. So is it narrow versus wide? Normal would be under 120 milliseconds or 0.12 seconds. If the QRS is narrow, skip looking for any bundle branch blocks because a bundle branch block is by definition a wide QRS. So like we said, first narrow or wide, and then is there a bundle branch block or is there not? For a left bundle branch block, you want to look in lead V1 and V6. So in V1, you'll see an RS pattern, which is a large V, a large dip down. And for lead V6, you see a broad slurred R wave in V5 and V6. Also a deep S wave in V1, and sometimes ST elevations in V1 and V3. And it's also a wide QRS. For a right bundle branch block, you'll have also a wide QRS, again over 0.12 seconds, and an RSR in V1 and V2, and a wide S wave in V6. So for a right bundle branch block, that's the classic bunny ears appearance, especially in V1, which is helpful to know to quickly spot this one. And then you want to look for any ventricular hypertrophy when you're evaluating the QRS. Is there right ventricular hypertrophy or left? For right ventricular hypertrophy, you want to look at V1. Is the R greater than the S in V1? or is the R greater than seven millimeters in height in V1? So it's closer overlooking the right heart. So this will show a peak. For left ventricular hypertrophy, there's the Sokolo Lyon criteria, as well as the Cornell criteria, which I won't go into, just to know those are part of the left ventricular hypertrophy. And for pathologic Q waves, which means basically a prior infarct or an MI, and the Q waves in greater than one box in depth or width. For step six, you want to evaluate for the ST segment. Is there ST depression or elevation greater than one millimeter in depth or in height? And for step seven, evaluate the T waves. Are there any T wave inversions? Are there T wave flattening? Or is there QT prolongation, importantly? So next we'll move to the summary of the 12 lead in their relation to the heart itself. So we'll go over the area of infarct in where's the Q waves and ST elevations and what artery will be involved. So if you have an infarct that's anterior wall or septal wall, this is V1 through V4, V1 and V2 if it's predominantly septal, and the artery involved is the left anterior descending, the LAD. If it's just V1 and V2, then you're thinking proximal LAD. For the lateral wall of the heart, you're thinking lead 1, AVL, V5 and V6, and this is the circumflex artery, the left circumflex. For anterior lateral, this is lead 1, AVL, V4, V5, V6, and this is the mid LAD, plus or minus the circumflex. For inferior, it's important to know lead 2, 3, and AVF, 2, 3, and AVF for inferior, and this is the right coronary artery. And for posterior wall, these are ST depressions in lead V1 and V2. It's really the reciprocal changes, however, there's no real posterior leads on a standard 12 lead EKG. And this could be from the circumflex or the right coronary artery for posterior wall. Next we'll go into, again, um, QRS access determination. So basically a couple points. Um, the general direction of the impulses through the heart is where the axis is determined. It's the summation of all the vectors. Vectors move towards hypertrophy and away from infarction. So the normal QRS axis is negative 30 degrees to a positive 90 degrees. So we remember the two methods, the thumb method, 
or we can look at it and see if it's pointed more towards lead one or further, which is more left axis deviation or further past AVF to the right, which is right axis deviation. And again, if it's normal, it's positive in lead one AVF. For left axis deviation, positive in lead one, negative in AVF. For right axis deviation, negative in lead one, positive in AVF. And left axis deviation, the vectors move towards hypertrophy, so this would be like left ventricular hypertrophy, or actually away from an infarction. So it could be a sign that it's moving away from a specific side of an infarction. So inferior MIs, for instance, could cause an LAD. Um, right axis deviation, vectors move towards hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy, or away from an infarction. So like a lateral MI could lead to some right axis deviation. So next we'll go into, importantly, the bradycardic and tachycardic algorithm. So first we'll go into the bradycardia algorithm. The bradycardia algorithm, of course, starts with checking a pulse and determining then if they do have a pulse, are they unstable or are they stable? If they're unstable, this would be deficiencies in uh, blood pressure, such as hypotension, altered mental status, refractory chest pain, acute heart failure as well. If they have none of these, then you just want to monitor and observe them. They don't need any acute medical treatment. If they are symptomatic with hypotension, altered mental status, refractory chest pain, or acute heart failure, you want to do atropine first line to help speed them up. So this inhibits the vagus nerve. So if atropine is not effective, then you can do epinephrine, dopamine, or transcutaneous pacing. So how I remember this is AEDT, atropine, epinephrine, dopamine, or transcutaneous pacing. And remember, transcutaneous pacing is actually first also if they have a third degree heart block. Um, okay, so tachycardic algorithm will be next. The tachycardic algorithm starts, of course, with checking the pulse. If there's no pulse and they're tachycardic, there's only two shockable rhythms using DFib, and this is unsynchronized cardioversion. So if they have no pulse, that's unsynchronized cardioversion. And this is VFib, ventricular fibrillation, and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. If they, so PEA and VFib are unsynchronized cardioversion, and that's if they don't have a pulse. If they do have a pulse, again we check unstable versus stable. Unstable would mean hypotensive, altered mental status, refractory chest pain, or acute heart failure. And if they are unstable, then we say this is an unstable tachyarrhythmia, and we do synchronized cardioversion. So synchronized cardioversion. If it is regular, narrow QRS complex, we could consider adenosine, but just remember for that synchronized cardioversion for unstable. If they're not unstable and they do have a pulse, then we check the QRS. Is it wide or narrow? So is it over 0.12 seconds? If it is wide, then we can do antiarrhythmics like amiodarone, lidocaine, or procainamide. Amiodarone first, so that's ALP, amiodarone, lidocaine, and procainamide. You also obviously want to get a cardiac consult. And if it is regular monomorphic, you could consider adenosine as well. And so back to the QRS, if it's not wide, it's narrow. So they had a pulse, they're unstable, and it's a narrow QRS. Then we want to try vagal maneuvers first, then adenosine, if it's regular and narrow, then beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. So an example would be stable, narrow, complex tachyarrhythmias. So this would be like A-flutter or A-fib, in which you'd use a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker first line. Also something like Wolf-Parkinson-White. However, procainamide, it's important to know, is preferred in Wolf-Parkinson-White. Could also do amiodarone, but you want to avoid ABCD um, if it is wide complex. So that's adenosine, beta blockers, calcium channels, and digoxin. If they have SVT, you want to try vagal maneuvers first, and then adenosine as the first line medical management. If they just have sinus arrhythmia, then you should treat the underlying cause if, if you're concerned about it. So next will be sinus rhythm. So we'll go into the many different sinus rhythms. These are impulses that originate at the SA node. So normal sinus rhythm. Every P wave is followed by a QRS. P waves are mostly positive and upright in leads 1, 2, and AVF, and negative in AVR, and the rates between 60 and 100. Next is sinus arrhythmia. Sinus arrhythmia is an irregular rhythm originating from the sinus node still. This is a normal variant of normal sinus rhythm. It meets the same criteria except that the rhythm is irregular. It's more commonly seen in children, young adults, and patients with sinus bradycardia. The physiology of sinus arrhythmia 
is beat to beat variations with respiration. So as we know, during inspiration, the right ventricular fills more and it pushes out of the left ventricle at that same time. Rhythm increases with inspiration and decreases with expiration, reflecting the change in stroke volume during respiration. Diagnosis of sinus arrhythmia is on EKG, normal appearing P waves, beat to beat variation of the P to P interval greater than 0.12 seconds, shorter intervals during inspiration due to the increased rate, and longer P to P intervals during expiration, a decreased heart rate. So although we're filling the right side of the heart more, it is also beating faster during inspiration. So no management is needed in most cases. It's considered a normal variant to have sinus arrhythmia. And if symptomatic bradycardia does occur, you can do atropine first line, and that's symptomatic. And again, transcutaneous pacing, epi and dopamine are second line. Next will be sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia is increased heart rate over 100 beats per minute, originating from the sinus node. Etiologies of sinus tach are physiologic, as a normal response to exercise, emotional stress, normal in young children and infants. It could also be then pathologic, fever, hypovolemia, hypoxia, pain, infection, hemorrhage, hypoglycemia, anxiety, thyrotoxicosis, shock, and sepathomimetics like decongestants, and cocaine. So for diagnosis, EKG, regular, rapid rhythm, over 100 beats per minute, with normal appearing P waves, with every P followed by a QRS complex. You want to treat the underlying cause as the first line treatment, and you want to use beta blockers, metoprolol for instance, and remember your cardioselective beta blockers, BEAM, bisoprolol, esmolol, atenolol, and metoprolol. So metoprolol used in the management of persistent sinus tach in the setting of ACS. Next will be sinus bradycardia. So sinus bradycardia is a decreased heart rate under 60 beats per minute originating from the sinus node. Etiologies are physiologic or pathologic again. Physiologic bradycardia, however, is in young athletes when they're really conditioned. It's a vasovagal reaction. An increased intracranial pressure as well could cause bradycardia. Also nausea and vomiting. So increased intracranial pressure, don't forget Cushing's triad, could be pathologic. This is beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, digoxin, carotid massage, SA node ischemia, also gram-negative sepsis, and hypothyroidism. For diagnosis, of course EKG, regular and slow, rhythm under 60, normal appearing P wave with every P followed by a QRS. Management, if symptomatic or unstable, atropine, of course. Again, epinephrine or transcutaneous pacing, if not responsive to atropine. If they're asymptomatic, no treatment is needed if it's physiologic. You can observe or do a cardiac consult if you do think it is pathologic. So next will be sick sinus syndrome. Sick sinus syndrome is also called Brady-Tacky syndrome. So this is a dysfunction of the sinus node that leads to a combination of sinus arrest with alternating paroxysms of atrial tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias. The etiologies are sinus node fibrosis, most commonly, older age, corrective cardiac surgery, medications, systemic diseases that affect the heart. Clinical manifestations of sick sinus are intermittent symptoms of bradycardia and tachycardia, palpitations, dizziness, lightheadedness, angina, dyspnea on exertion, presyncope or syncope. For diagnosis, you can do EKG alternating bradycardia, seeing a sinus pause or an SA exit block, and atrial tachyarrhythmias. You want to do telemetry or ambulatory EKG monitoring, which also may be needed to document the episodes. For stable, they may not require urgent therapy as the symptoms are often transient, and for hemodynamically unstable, for both, they may not require urgent therapy as their symptoms are often transient, but if they are hemodynamically unstable, atropine is the first line, if needed, dopamine, epi, transcutaneous pacing, or AEDT. For long term, they need a permanent pacemaker, however. That's the definitive treatment for sick sinus syndrome. The addition of an automatic, automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator if alternating between tachy and brady. So the fibrosis may not be too bad in the beginning with only some bradycardia, so you may only need atropine, but the progress continues requiring a pacemaker and definitively an implantable defibrillator. So next we'll go to atrioventricular conduction blocks. So AV blocks are an interruption of the normal impulse 
So next we'll go to arterioventicular conduction blocks. So AV blocks are an interruption of the normal impulse from the SA node to the AV node, AV node dysfunction. The PR interval is the most helpful in determining the presence of an AV conduction block. So we'll always look at the PR interval first when we're thinking about this. For our first degree AV block, this is AV node dysfunction leading to delayed but also conducted impulses. Etiologies are a normal variant, individuals with a high vagal tone without structural heart disease. However, if they have intrinsic AV nodal disease, could be from an acute myocardial infarction, especially an inferior wall MI, that's important, inferior wall MI is a predisposing factor to a first degree block, electrolyte disturbances like hyper-K, AV nodal blocking agents like digoxin, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, also myocarditis due to Lyme, and cardiac surgery. For clinical manifestations, asymptomatic most, most of the time in first degree, but they are, if they are symptomatic, it is due to a bradycardia-related decreased perfusion, like fatigue, dizziness, dyspnea, chest pain, syncope, or if it is severe, hypotension or altered mental status. For diagnosis of first degree, you got to get an EKG. All atrial impulses are delayed, but they are conducted to the ventricles. There will be a prolonged PR interval, which we'll remember is 0 0.20 seconds, and all P waves are followed by a QRS complex, so no dropped impulses in this one. For management, asymptomatic, no treatment, maybe cardiac consult. For symptomatic, atropine, epi, pacemaker is definitive if it's getting really severe. Second degree AV blocks. Second degree, or not all the atrial impulses are conducted to the ventricles. This leads to some P waves that are not followed by QRS complexes and the classic dropped QRS. So you have a Mobus type 1 and a Mobus type 2. A Mobus type 1 is a Winkeback. Mobus type 1 Winkeback is a progressive PR interval lengthening leading to a dropped QRS, so shortened R to R interval. The management for this is if there's symptomatic atropine, and again epinephrine or pacemaker, and asymptomatic is observation plus or minus cardiac consult. So remember, progressive PRI lengthening and then a dropping of the QRS for Mobitz type 1. Mobitz type 2 is a block commonly affecting the bundle of Hiss. So this is a constant or a prolonged PRI leading to a drop QRS. So it's basically random drops in the QRS. At, there's no discernible pattern for this one. And it's a Mobus type 2. For management, atropine again, or temporary pacing. And also it's important to know for Mobus type 2, this is a blockage of the bundle of Hiss. So progression to a third degree AV block is common. So permanent pacemaker is the definitive treatment in this. So you want to be cautious with a Mobus type 2, second degree, as it may progress to third degree, and it's often due to a underlying structural condition. So now we'll go over them in a little bit more depth. So first, the Mobitz type 1, second degree AV block, the wink back again. This is interruption of electrical impulse at the AV node, resulting in occasional non-conducted impulses. The pathophys is AV nodal dysregulation, commonly above the bundle of his. Etiologies, often a normal variant, individuals with a high vagal tone without structural heart disease. And also don't forget inferior wall MI for Mobitz type 1. Inferior wall MI, AV nodal ischemia, AV nodal blocking drugs, like we said. Clinical manifestations, mostly asymptomatic. They may have some bradycardia related decreased perfusion as well. Hypotension, altered mental status, dizzy, fatigue, dyspnea. <clears throat> for diagnosis, prolonging the length of the PR interval until an occasional non-conducting atrial impulse a dropped QRS complex. For management, if they are asymptomatic, you don't need any treatment, observation, cardiac consult in some cases. For symptomatic, atropine is first line. You can do epinephrine as well, and pacemaker is definitive if persistent. For Mobitz 2 second degree AV block, this is interruption of electrical impulses at the AV node, resulting in occasional non-conducted impulses. And remember, occasional non-conducted impulses for type 2, Mobitz second degree. Etiology is rarely seen in patients without structural heart disease, very important. So this could include myocardial ischemia, myocardial fibrosis, myocarditis due to Lyme, endocarditis, could be iatrogenic, clinical manifestations mostly asymptomatic, if they are symptomatic, again due to bradycardia related decreased perfusion, diagnosis is a constant PR interval before and after the non-conducting atrial beats, and then a drop QRS complex, so it's not lengthening for a Mobitz 2 second degree. If ischemia is suspected based on the clinical picture, 
cardiac biomarkers, chest radiograph, and electrolytes should be ordered. For management of Mobitz 2 second degree, transcutaneous pacing, or atropine if symptomatic bradycardia with a permanent pacemaker as long term. These patients often do not respond to atropine, so that's important to know. Definitively, permanent pacemaker is required in many patients because it often progresses to third degree AV block and it is associated with complications like hypotension and cardiac arrest. So next will be third degree AV block or AV nodal dissociation. This is AV dissociation. No atrial impulses reach the ventricles, so the atrial activity is independent of the ventricular activity. This leads to an escape rhythm from below the block. So the ventricle creates its own since none are getting through. For etiologies, myocardial ischemia, again, don't forget inferior wall MI is common with these. AV nodal blocking agents, again, such as beta blockers, digoxin, calcium channel blockers, endocarditis, myocarditis due to Lyme disease and cardiac surgery, increased vagal tone, hypothyroidism, hyper K, and myocarditis. Clinical manifestations may be asymptomatic. If they are symptomatic due to bradycardia-related decreased perfusion, especially during exertion. For diagnosis, EKG will show regular P to P intervals and also regular R to R intervals, but they are not related to each other. The patients are often bradycardic. So basically, the atrials do, atria is doing its own thing and also the ventricle is doing its own thing, and they don't talk to each other. Management, acute or symptomatic. Transcutaneous pacing is often followed by a permanent pacemaker, and definitively a permanent pacemaker. So next we'll go into atrial dysrhythmias. Next we'll go to atrial dysrhythmias. First will be atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is one irritable atrial focus. One irritable atrial focus firing at a fast rate, usually over 300 beats per minute. Similar to AFib, there's an increased risk for atrial thrombus formation that can lead to cerebral or systemic embolization, which is a stroke. It may occur alone or be an interval rhythm between sinus tach and atrial fibrillation. Manifestations can be symptomatic, palpitations, dizziness, fatigue, dyspnea, chest pain, or unstable. Unstable are due to hypoperfusion and can include refractory chest pain or hypotension due to systolic blood pressure in the double digits or altered mental status. For diagnosis, you want to see the classic flutter sawtooth atrial waves so the classic flutter sawtooth atrial waves, usually around 300 beats per minute, 250 to 350 is the normal range, but there's no discernible P waves themselves. The flutter waves are identical, so this is regular, one ectopic atrial focus, just beating fast. For management, if they're stable, you can do vagal maneuvers, rate control with beta blockers, beta-1 blockers, metoprolol, tenolol, esmolol, or non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, DILT and verapamil. If they're unstable, direct current, synchronized cardioversion. So if they're unstable, synchronized cardioversion, and they have to have a pulse for this. Anticoagulation, you want to do the chads vas 2 scoring system for non-valvular AFib in patients at risk for embolization. Reversion to a normal sinus rhythm, radiofrequency catheter ablation is the definitive management. And also you can do direct current cardioversion. Class 1A, 1C, or 3 antiarrhythmics can be used. Next will be atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is multiple as opposed to one. Irritable atrial foci firing at uh, very fast rates. So similar to a flutter, there's an increased rate and an increased risk of atrial thrombus formation that can lead to cerebral or systemic embolization, which again are strokes. Atrial fibrillation is the most common chronic arrhythmia. So AFib is the most common chronic arrhythmia. Most patients are asymptomatic, however. There's many etiologies, such as cardiac disease, ischemia, pulmonary disease, infarction, um, infection, cardiomyopathies, electrolyte imbalances, idiopathic, endocrine or neurologic disorders like thyroid disorders, thyrotoxicosis, increased age, genetics, hemodynamic stress, medications, drugs, or alcohol use. Men more common than women. And there's four types, importantly. There's paroxysmal, persistent, permanent, and lone. So for paroxysmal, it's self-terminating within seven days, usually under 24 hours, and it also can be recurrent at times. It could also be persistent, which fails to terminate and lasts over seven days, and this requires termination, whether it be medical or electrical termination. There's also permanent AFib, and this is persistent AFib over one year, and it's refractory to cardioversion or cardioversion has never been tried. It could also be lone, which is paroxysmal, persistent, or permanent, 
without evidence of heart disease. For the clinical manifestations of AFib, it could be symptomatic or unstable. Symptomatic, some palpitations, dizzy, fatigue, dyspnea. For unstable AFib, it's due to hypoperfusion and can lead to hypotension, systolic blood pressure in the double digits, altered mental status, and refractory chest pain, as we said are the criteria for being unstable. For diagnosis, you want to see the Ashman's phenomenon. So the Ashman's phenomenon, that's the occasional aberrantly conducted beats, which is a wide QRS, after a short R to R cycle. So that's the Ashman's phenomenon. So classic things here, irregularly irregular rhythm with fibrillatory waves, no discrete P waves. Atrial rate is often over 250 beats per minute. And the AV node refractory period determines the ventricular rate. For cardiac monitoring, a halter monitor or telemetry can be used if AFib is not seen on EKG but is still suspected. And for stable management, rate control with beta blockers, metoprolol, atenolol, esmolol, or again, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers just like um, atrial flutter, diltiazem, and verapamil. Rudoxin may be used when beta blockers or calcium channel blockers are contraindicated like CHF or severe hypotension. And if they're unstable, direct, synchronized, not unsynchronized, direct, synchronized cardioversion for unstable. For long-term management, rate control is usually preferred over rhythm control for long-term management, direct, synchronized cardioversion, or pharmacologic cardioversion. Radiofrequency catheter ablation or a surgical maze procedure could be done. And for anticoagulation, we'll go into in a few minutes the CHADS VAST scoring system. Um, use that criteria for the non-valvular AFib in patients at risk for embolization to see if we should prescribe an anticoagulant for them. So for cardioversion, direct synchronized cardioversion or pharmacological cardioversion can be done. Cardioversion is the most successful when performed within seven days after the onset of AFib. And echo, echocardiogram is needed prior to cardioversion to ensure there are no clots. So AFib greater than 48 hours undergoing elective cardioversion anticoagulation for at least three weeks before cardioversion, or a TEE, a transesophageal echo, guided approach when abbreviated anticoagulation. Okay, so if they have AFib, but it's been longer than two days since they've had it, you need to anticoagulate them for three weeks before cardioverting them. However, if it's really acute and it's been under two days, under 48 hours, they do not need elective cardioversion anticoagulation you can start right away and also anticoagulation must be continued for four weeks after cardioversion with elective anticoagulation the stroke risk is decreased threefold after four weeks of anticoagulation so we'll go into anticoagulation risk stratification in non-valvular AFib and this is with the chads vas criteria and the recommended therapy so for chads vas the C is congestive heart failure and this is one point the H is hypertension, that's one point. The age squared is over 75, that's two points. Diabetes is one point. Stroke, TIA, thrombus, that's two points. Vascular criteria or vascular disease, like a prior MI, aortic plaque, peripheral arterial disease, that's one point. Age 65 to 74 is one point. And females is one point. So the maximum score is nine. If you get two or more, this is a moderate to high risk, and it's recommended to do chronic oral anticoagulation. If it's one, you have a lower risk. You want to base it on the clinical judgment, consideration of risk to benefit assessment, and also discuss with the patient. Zero, very low risk, no anticoagulation needed. Next, we'll go into a couple anticoagulant agents. So first, the NOAX or DOAX, non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants. These are usually now preferred over warfarin, coumadin, in most cases due to the similar but lower rates of major bleeding as well as lower risk factors for ischemic stroke, convenience of not having to check the INR as well, and less drug interactions. So this is dabigatron, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor. It binds and inhibits thrombin. How I remember that is each letter represents what it is. So D, direct, I, inhibitor of T, thrombin. So D, then it has A, B, and then I for inhibitor, then GA, then T, thrombin. And then there's also rivaroxaban, apixaban, indidoxaban, and these are factor 10A. It has XA, so 10A right in the name there. For warfarin, indications may be preferred in some of the following patients. 
and these patients may be with severe chronic kidney disease, which, like we said, the NOACs are contraindication in. Contraindications to the NOACs, again, like HIV patients on protease inhibitor-based therapy, on CP450 inhibiting antiepileptic medications like carbamazepine, phenytoin as well, patients already on warfarin who just prefer to not change it, also cost issues. Warfarin is less expensive. Warfarin is usually bridged with heparin until warfarin is therapeutic as well. Monitoring um, INR, international normalized ratio. The goal is two to three typically, or if you have a valve, a prosthetic valve, it's 2.5 to 3.5, and you want to monitor the prothrombin time as well. And remember, this is a vitamin K acting drug. So that's on the extrinsic pathway there for warfarin. And for three, dual antiplatelet therapy. This is aspirin and clopidogrel. So these are anticoagulant monotherapy is superior to dual antiplatelet therapy. Dual antiplatelet therapy may be reserved for patients who cannot be treated with anticoagulation for other reasons than bleeding. So if you want, if you can, you want to do anticoagulants, but if you can't, then dual antiplatelet is your next option. So next we'll go to PSVT, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So any tachyrrhythmia originating above the ventricles, either an atrial or an atrioventricular nodal source. SVT is in an umbrella term when a more specific term cannot be applied to the tachyrrhythmia originating above the ventricles. The pathophysiology are various re-entry circuits. So there's AV, nodal re-entry tachycardia, and AV reciprocating tachycardia. So AV and RT, AV nodal re-entry and tachycardia, are two different pathways. One normal and one accessory pathway, both within the AV node itself. This is the most common type. So both within the normal node itself. So this is not Wolf Parkinson White. This is not LGL. AV reciprocating tachycardia, AVRT, is also two pathways. However, it's one normal pathway and one accessory pathway outside of the AV node. And we'll have a nice picture to depict exactly where these pathways are going. And these are Wolf Parkinson White and Longanong Levine syndrome, LGL. For manifestations, symptomatic, palpitations, dizzy, fatigue, dyspnea, chest pain. If they're unstable, they can have hypoperfusion, which can cause hypotension, and also altered mental status and refractory chest pain. For EKG, you want to know if it's orthodromic or antidromic. So orthodromic is actually 95%. These are regular, very narrow, complex tachycardias. There's no discernible P waves due to the rapid rate. And they have a quote here, if you can't tell if the bump is a P or a T, then it must be SVT, because there's usually no discernible P waves. It could also be antidromic, which is 5%. And these are regular, wide, complex tachycardia. They mimic ventricular tachycardia. So the heart rate's over 100. The rhythm is usually regular, with a rhythm is usually regular with a narrow QRS complex because orthodromic is the most common at 95%. And the P waves are hard to discern, like we said, because of that rapid rate. For management, if they're stable, regular, or narrow complex, you can do vagal maneuvers first. AV nodal blockers like adenosine is the first line medical management. Second line can be calcium channel with detiazin, beta blockers with metoprolol or digoxin. If it's stable and wide complex, you could use anti antiarrhythmics, amiodarone. Procainamide, you want to do if they have Wool Parkinson White. So, how I remember how, what the difference is between stable and wide, or rather narrow and wide. Narrow is adenosine, wide is amiodarone, unless it's Wool Parkinson White. But wide is amiodarone because wider word, it's a longer word, so amiodarone. Adenosine, a shorter word, so it's using the narrow complexes. If they're unstable, again, direct synchronized cardioversion. And definitive is important to know radio frequency catheter ablation. So next will be wandering atrial pacemaker and multifocal atrial tachycardia. Wandering atrial pacemaker is a multiple ectopic atrial foci generating impulses that are conducted to the ventricles. The heart rate is under 100 typically and there's greater than greater than or equal to three P wave morphologies. Multifocal atrial tachycardia is the same as wandering atrial pacemaker, except the heart rate is over 100. For EKG, the heart rate is over 100 beats per minute, and there's greater than three P wave morphologies. And it's very important to know that multifocal atrial tachycardia, MAT, is classically associated with severe COPD. So it's very difficult to treat. You can do calcium channel blockers like verapamil 
or beta blockers to use if. So now we'll go to Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. WPW is a pre excitation syndrome that is a type of a AV reciprocating tachycardia, AVRT. The pathophys is an accessory bundle, the bundle of Kent, that's outside the AV node and pre excites the ventricles. It directly connects the atria and ventricles, bypassing the AV node itself. This leads to a delta wave, which is a slurred wide QRS, and that's basically pathognomonic if you see that on the EKG. So bundle of Kent, delta wave for WPW. Clinical manifestations are mostly asymptomatic, but they are prone to the development of tachyarrhythmias. If they are symptomatic, they'll have palpitations, dizziness, fatigue, dyspnea, and chest pain. If they're unstable, it's due to hypoperfusion and can include hypotension, altered mental status, and refractory chest pain. So the three things we need to know on EKG for WPW are delta wave, slurred QRS upstroke, PR interval that is short. So it's obviously going to be short if there's a delta wave and a slurred upstroke because it's taking apart, taking away some of the duration of the PR interval and a wide QRS complex. So that's also self-explanatory if there's a delta wave that widens the QRS itself as well. So it's WPW, wave, delta wave, PR interval that's short, and a wide QRS complex. And again, zero, over 0 0.12 seconds or 120 milliseconds. So for management of WPW, if it's stable, that's wide complex, wide complex tachycardia, we want to do procainamide, which is preferred. We want to avoid also AV nodal blocking agents, ABCD, if wide QRS complexes. ABCD is adenosine, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and digoxin because they can lead to preferential conduction down the bundle of Kent, worsening the tachycardia. So basically they'll prevent the normal AV conduction and then we'll just have massive amounts flowing through that bundle of Kent which is outside of the AV node. If it's unstable, you want to do direct synchronized cardioversion. And if for definitive, definitive management, we want to do radiofrequency catheter ablation as the definitive management. This basically electrically destroys the abnormal pathway. It may be indicated in patients experiencing recurrent symptomatic episodes. So next will be AV junctional dysrhythmias. AV node junction becomes the dominant pacemaker of the heart in AV junctional rhythms. Some of the etiologies are sinus disease, coronary artery disease, most common rhythm seen in digitalis toxicity, also myocarditis, and it can be seen in patients without structural heart disease. On EKG for AV junctional dysrhythmias, we'll see a regular rhythm, and the P waves will be inverted, negative if they are present, in the leads where they are normally positive, so 1, 2, and AVF, or they're not seen. Classically associated with a narrow QRS as well. So for junctional rhythm, the heart rate is usually 40 to 60, which is basically just reflecting the intrinsic rate of the AV node firing itself, or it could be accelerated junctional, which is 60 to 100, or it could be junctional tachycardia, which is over 100. So now we'll go to ventricular dysrhythmias. First, we'll do PVCs, premature ventricular complexes, and um, it can be unifocal, multifocal, which is over one. It could be bigeminy, which is every other beat is a PVC, or it could be a couplet, which is two PVCs in a row. So a PVC is basically a, a premature beat originating from the ventricle, which shows up as wide, bizarre QRSs occurring, occurring earlier than expected. With a PVC, the T wave is in the opposite direction of the QRS usually. It's usually associated with a compensatory pause after, in overall rhythm, which is unchanged. AV node prevents retrograde conduction. So remembering that um, the T wave is in the opposite direction of the QRS, it's a wide, bizarre QRS, and it also has a compensatory pause. No treatment is usually needed. This is a common finding on the EKG, and most ventricular arrhythmias occur after a PVC. Ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia is technically three or more consecutive PVCs at a rate of over 100 beats per minute, and this is usually actually between 120 and 300. To classify VTAC, it could be sustained VTAC with a duration over 30 seconds, or it could be non-sustained if under 30 seconds. It could be a monomorphic VTAC, which is the same QRS morphology, or it could be polymorphic, which is many different morphologies. You could also lead to torsades to points, a variant of polymorphic VTAC, waxing and waning QRS amplitude on EKG, like a, like a, like a ribbon strip. For etiologies of VTAC, it's underlying heart disease most commonly, ischemic heart disease, 
post MI structural structural defects in cardiomyopathies, which will lead to a prolonged QT interval, electrolyte abnormalities, especially hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia as well, and digoxin toxicity. But that prolonged QT is important to know is associated with hypomag and leads to that torsades de points. Clinical manifestations, if they're symptomatic, palpitations, dizzy fatigue, dyspnea, chest pain. If they're unstable, again, due to hypoperfusion, which can lead to hypotension, altered mental status, refractory chest pain. And for EKG, there's a few different things we could see. For VTAC, we could see regular, wide complexes with no discernible P waves, so that's VTAC. And for torsades, we see that ribbon strip that's uh, waxing and waning, increasing and decreasing. So how do we manage this? Management of acute tachyarrhythmias. If it's stable, sustained VTAC, we can use antiarrhythmics like amiodarone. Remember, amiodarone, longer word, therefore use it in a wide QRS. You can also use lidocaine and procainamide. Remember, ALP. And if they're unstable VTAC with a pulse, then we want to do direct, synchronized cardioversion. If it's VTAC with no pulse, then we defib. So VFib, defib. VFib, defib, if it's, which is unsynchronized cardioversion and of course CPR. Torsades, we want to do IV magnesium and, co and correct the other electrolyte abnormalities. <clears throat> so going into torsades a little bit more, this is a variant of polymorphic VTAC, waxing and waning, cyclic alterations of the QRS amplitude on EKG. The pathophys is prolonged repolarization and early after depolarization plus a triggering event. Etiologies are, most importantly, a prolonged QT for torsades, electrolyte abnormalities as well, hypomag, most importantly, hypo-K as well. Females more common than males, also patients with congenital long QT syndrome. So again, hypomag, prolonged QT for torsades. There's also many important medications to know for prolonged QT interval, such as digoxin, um, class 1A antiarrhythmics like quinidine, procainamide, disopyramide. Class 3 antiarrhythmics like sotalol, abutilide, antibiotics, so macrolides, very important to know. Antipsychotics, like we know, first gen antipsychotics are most common. Antidepressants, especially TCAs, and antiemetics like metacropamide, even odansetron as well. So, most important macrolides, antipsychotics, TCAs, metaclopramide, and other antiemetics. Also, methadone, too. So clinical manifestations will be symptomatic with um, palpitations, dizzy, fatigue, dyspnea, chest pain. But most importantly for diagnosis of torsades, we want to see that on EKG, polymorphic VTAC, cyclic alterations of the QRS amplitude on EKG around the isoelectric line. And this is also called sinusoidal waveforms. For labs, we want to rule out hypomag and hypo-K. And for management, first line is IV magnesium sulfate. So we also use that in seizures for pregnant patients too. So suppresses, this suppresses early after depolarizations, terminating the arrhythmia. Magnesium is effective in both terminating and preventing recurrent torsades. It also, you also want to correct the other underlying electrolyte abnormalities. And remember, sometimes the potassium won't correct unless you correct the magnesium first. So also something to consider. You also want to, for management of torsades, discontinue all the QT prolonging drugs. And in refractory cases, you can do isoproteranol and transvenous overdrive pacing. So next for ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation is a type of cardiac death associated with ineffective ventricular contraction. Etiologies of VFib are an underlying heart disease. Ischemic heart disease is the most common post-MI, structural heart defects, cardiomyopathies, and sustained VTAC. Clinical manifestations, unresponsive, pulseless patient, and syncope. So for EKG, for VFib, we'll see erratic patterns of electrical impulses and no P waves. It could be coarse VFib or it could be fine VFib. For management, unsynchronized cardioversion, which is defibrillation, and CPR, we want to initiate the ACLS algorithm. So next for PEA, pulseless electrical activity. This is an organized rhythm seen on a monitor, but the patient has no palpable pulses. So basically the electrical activity is not coupled with the actual mechanical contraction of the heart. For management, CPR and epi, 
also checking for shockable rhythms every two minutes. Asystole, which is ventricular standstill, treat the same as a PEA. And now we'll go into a few other syndromes, so early repolarization abnormalities. This is usually a normal variant. It may be seen in thin, healthy males. And early repolarization abnormalities will show a diffuse, concave ST elevations greater than 2 millimeters with large T waves, especially the precordial T waves. So that sounds a little bit like pericarditis with the diffuse, concave ST elevations. However, with this early repol, the large T wave helps differentiate it. So large T wave. And also tall QRS voltages. And also a fish hook slurring or notching at the J point. So again, ST elevations over 2 millimeters with a concave pattern and large T waves and a slurring or notching at the J point. For left ventricular hypertrophy with left ventricular strain, you'll see um, asymmetric ST depression. It's often seen in patients with left ventricular hypertrophy who also suffer from ischemic disease. The coronary artery supply is strained, trying to supply the excess hypertrophy cardiac muscle. So basically, if we're hypertrophying the left ventricle so much, it's going to require more blood for contraction. So what will we see on EKG? We'll see some increased voltage with the QRS. We'll see asymmetric ST depressions and T-wave inversions in the lateral leads, 1, AVL, V5, and V6. And we could also see ST elevations in the right precordial leads. So it's important to also know Brugada syndrome. Brugada syndrome is a right bundle branch block pattern, often incomplete. You may also see ST elevations, but in, v, in V1 through V3, often a down sloping pattern, and T wave inversions in V1 and V2, plus or minus an S wave in the lateral leads. So again, the right bundle, the right bundle branch pattern in V1 to V3, ST elevations in V1 and V3, often down sloping, T wave inversions in V1 and V2, and plus or minus some S waves in the lateral leads. Okay, now we'll go into antiarrhythmic agents. Antiarrhythmic agents. So there's class one through five, and class one is the sodium channel blockers, so that will contain class 1A, which is procainamide and quinidine and disopyramide. Class 1B, lidocaine and tocainamide. Class 1C, flecainide, propafrenone, and echinide. So, class 1A, procainamide, inquinidine, and disopyramide, the mechanism is to decrease conduction velocity, prolonging repole and refractory period. It also prolongs the action potential and increases excitation threshold. This is indicated in Wolf Parkinson White, most notably. And also, side effects are torsades, hypotension, and also note procainamide and quinidine are associated with drug induced lupus like syndrome, just like we said. HIP-Q for um, drug-induced lupus, hydralazine, isoniazid, procainamide, and quinidine. So those are class 1A. Some of those are class 1A antiarrhythmics. So lupus-like syndrome drug-induced. Class 1B, lidocaine, tocanidine, decreases conduction velocity and shortens the repolarization. Class 1C, flecainide, propafrenone, decreases conduction velocity significantly, increases QT prolongation. Um, affects ventricular tissue and healthy cells, and no effect on action potential, indicated in VTAC. Class 2, so these are the beta blockers. There's, of course, this cardioselective beta blockers. We can remember that by BEAM, isoprolol, esmolol, atenolol, and metoprolol are cardioselective B1. And there's also the non-selective propanolol and sodalol, and the non-selective alpha and beta, 1 and 2, which are labetalol and carbetalol. So one person said CL. Carvedilol, labetalol is care less. They care less which receptors they go and hit. So that's they don't care if they're hitting alpha or beta 1 or beta 2. So, so the beta blockers, they antagonize the beta adrenergic receptors to different degrees by decreasing the slope of phase 4. They decrease the calcium currents, decreasing the SA and AV node conduction. They're indicated for rate control in A flutter, in A fib, PSVT, and VTAC, and also post MI. So for post-MI, it helps slow down the heart rate so the coronary arteries can fill more easily and supply the contracting muscle with oxygen. Side effects of beta blockers are bradycardia, of course, also AV blocks, hypotension, 
CNS changes like fatigue, depression, sexual dysfunction, and also importantly may mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia. So if your body is unable to, so typically in hypoglycemia we respond sympathetically. So if we're blocking sympathetic response, diabetics when they go into hypoglycemia, they may not show the symptoms which can, which can be um, very deadly for them. So it's contraindicated in sinus bradycardia, second and third degree heart block, shock and CSF, and also caution, like we said, in diabetics, also in peripheral vascular disease, non-selectives may cause bronchospasm in patients with asthma and COPD. So it's basically the opposite of using a SABA. Glucagon, also importantly, is the antidote for beta blocker toxicity. Class three antiarrhythmics, these are the potassium channel blockers. So amiodarone, sodalol, ibutilide, and dofetilide. Mostly amiodarone and sodalol. So Class 3 um, potassium channel blockers block potassium efflux during phase 3. Action potential prolongation and prolongation of the refractory period. Also QT interval prolongation. Amiodarone is a class 3 but possesses characteristics of class 1 through 4. And these are indicated in atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. Important to know for amiodarone, side effects are pulmonary fibrosis as well as thyroid disorders. Amiodarone, amiodarone contains iodine, so it can cause hyper or hypothyroidism. Also, corneal deposits, hepatotoxicity, blue-green um, hepatotoxicity, blue-green skin discoloration, which I've gotten a question about, hypotension. So again, you want to monitor TFTs, PFTs, and LFTs if they're on amiodarone. That's that pulmonary fibrosis and thyroid disorders. So class 4 antiarrhythmics. This will be your verapamil and ditiazem. These are calcium channel blockers. Slows SA node and AV node conduction, decreasing the L-type calcium channels, decreased conduction velocity. Increase the PR interval, slows the refractory period. Indicated in atrial arrhythmias, a flutter, a fib, PSVT. Side effects are peripheral edema. We don't want to dilate those vessels anymore. Bradycardia and AV blocks. Anti-muscarinic side effects with verapamil as well, like constipation. So there's also a class 5 antiarrhythmics. This will contain digoxin, a cardiac glycoside. It's indicated in AFib and heart failure. And the mechanism is to inhibit ATPase. It's a positive inotrope and has negative chronotrope and dromotropic effects. Next we'll go into a couple more medications. So adenosine. Adenosine is important to know. Adenosine can be used in paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, PSVT. It helps by slowing the AV node conduction times and also blocks AV nodal reentry pathways. Remember, adenosine has an extremely short half-life of under 10 seconds, so you always want to follow it when giving it by a 5 to 10 cc IV saline flush. It can also be used as pharmacologic cardiac stress testing, which activates adenosine receptors A1 and A2 producing vasodilation of the coronary arteries, including um, diseased coronary arteries. This leads to a shunting effect to mimic the increased demand. Adenosine is usually used with a thallium stress test. Adverse effects of adenosine are chest discomfort, dyspnea, flushing, lightheadedness, headache, and these are very short-lived um, short and common. Serious side effects could be bronchospasm. Contraindicated in WPW, wide complex tachy, Remember, adenosine is a shorter word, so we want to use it in a narrow complex. Amiodarone a longer word, so we use it in a wide complex. So next is amiodarone. So again, we always want to get PFTs, LFTs, and TFTs for amiodarone. Like we said, it's a class 3 antiarrhythmic, potassium, and it works. It is technically class 1 through 4, though. It prolongs the axon potential, and it's indicated in most um, stable, wide complex tachycardias. Adverse effects, hypotension, bradycardia, heart block, vasodilation, phlebitis. Long-term, it has a few long-term side effects that we should know. Corneal deposition, if used over six months, which is actually the most common side effect, corneal deposition. Thyroid disorders, hypo or hyper, as it contains iodine. Pulmonary fibrosis, increased LFTs, also a blue-green discoloration of the skin. Monitor PFTs, TFTs, and LFTs for adverse effects of amiodarone. And don't use procainamide and amiodarone together. And also note amiodarone affects the cytochrome P450 system. 
It's contraindicated in harp locks, who do not have pacemakers, and also in WPW with a concurrent AFib. Going to the normal fetal circulation. So to start off with fetal cardiac physiology, the fetal circulation uses right to left shunts. The fetus receives its nutrients and oxygen from the placenta, not the fetal lungs. The oxygenated and nutrient-rich blood goes from the placenta to the right atrium. There are then two right to left shunts that bypass the non-functioning fetal lungs. First, there's the foramen ovale, which shunts about two-thirds of the blood from the right atrium directly into the left atrium. The remaining one-third passes into the right ventricle. Most of the remaining one-third goes through the right ventricle and gets pumped into the pulmonary artery. We also have the ductus arteriosus. The ductus arteriosus shunts blood from the pulmonary artery directly into the aorta itself, systemic circulation, bypassing the fetal lungs. So also as the baby takes its first breath, the left-sided pressure becomes greater than the right-sided pressure, promoting closure of both of these openings. So first things um, occur is blood arrives via the umbilical vein, then the ductus venosus shunts the oxygenated blood from the placenta away from the semifunctional liver and towards the heart. Over in the heart, the oxygenated blood from the placenta enters the right atrium via the inferior vena cava. Then the foramen ovale allows the oxygenated blood in the right atrium to reach the left atrium. And then the ductus arteriosus connects the aorta with the pulmonary artery, further shunting blood away from the lungs and into the aorta. And then the mixed blood travels to the head and the body, and then back to the placenta via the aorta. So a couple of clinical correlations with these things. Um, it's important to know prostaglandins keep the ductus arteriosus patent. Prostaglandins are vasodilators. And so to close a patent ductus arteriosus, a PDA, the prostaglandin inhibitor must be given. So this is IV indomethacin or ibuprofen. And this is most commonly used in preterm infants within the first 10 to 14 days of life. So if we want to close the PDA, we want to use IV indomethacin. If we want to keep the PDA open, we want to administer prostaglandins. So IV indomethacin, ibuprofen are plus prostaglandin inhibitors. So to keep it open, administer prostaglandins. For instance, in severe cyanotic disease like severe coarctation of the aorta, tetralogy of flow or transposition of the great vessels, a patent ductus arteriosus allows for mixing of the blood to improve the cyanosis. Prostaglandin E1 analogs like alprostadil maintain the ductus arteriosus open, reducing the cyanosis and improving circulation until surgical correction can be performed. So next we'll go into pediatric functional murmurs. Innocent functional Physiologic murmurs are non-pathologic, functioning murmurs caused by blood moving through the chambers. Innocent murmurs tend to be soft, not associated with symptoms, position-dependent, and occur during systole, and they're also seen in up to 40% of children at some point in their lives. So systolic murmurs may be innocent or pathologic, but it's important to know that diastolic murmurs are almost always pathological. Diastolic murmurs are always almost pathological. So first, still murmurs. Still murmurs. Still murmurs are the most common innocent physiologic murmur. It's usually heard from two months until the age of pre-adolescence, so like two to ten years old. The pathophys of a still murmur is thought to be due to vibration of the valve leaflets during systole. Musical, vibratory, noisy, or twanging, low-pitched early to mid-systolic ejection murmur that is best heard at the inferior aspect of the left lower sternal border and apex. Minimal to no radiation may radiate to the carotids and also diminishes with standing or valsalva. It can be accentuated in the supine position and in hyperdynamic states like fever or anxiety. And it's also best heard with the bell. Um, cervical venous hum will be next. Cervical venous hum is the second most common innocent murmur after stills and it's the most common continuous benign murmur. So cervical venous hum is continuous, most commonly seen in two to eight years of life. The pathophys is due to turbulent blood flow returning to the heart at the junction between the jugular vein and the superior vena cava. So it's kind of like a brewery between those areas. Soft, whirling, low-pitched, continuous murmur, best heard at the right sternal border and the right infraclavicular area in the upright position.
the murmur does not radiate. It increases in intensity by sitting in the upright position with the head extended, and it decreases if you are supine, if there's jugular compression, if there's also rotation or flexion of the head, and also valsalva. So next will be pulmonary ejection murmur. Pulmonary ejection murmur is usually heard in older children and adolescents. It's best heard in mid-systole and in the second left intercostal space. Due to blood flowing across the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery, it's commonly heard in older children and adolescents, and it's best heard in a mid-systole in the left second intercostal space. And it's harsh in quality. So next will be a PFO, a patent foramen ovale. This is a covered but not sealed open communication between the right and left atria. So covered but not sealed. However, the PFO is not considered an ASD because no septal tissue is actually missing. It's just due to a failed septal fusion. So most are asymptomatic. And for PFOs, strokes from paradoxical emboli could occur, which is also called a cryptogenic stroke, a stroke with no underlying cause. Decompression sickness, migraine, acute limb ischemia, secondary to emboli could also occur from a PFO. Diagnosis is by echo. This is the best way to do it. And transthoracic echo is usually performed, but TEE is more sensitive. Management is percutaneous device closure, surgical PFO closure, and for cryptogenic strokes, you want to do antiplatelets or anticoagulants. Then for ASD, atrial septal defect, this is an abnormal opening in the atrial septum between the right and left atrium. Pathophys allows for left to right shunts, non-cyanotic, and there's two types, osteum secundum being the most common at 80%. There's also osteum primum associated with mitral valve abnormalities, sinus venosus, and coronary sinus. So remember, osteum secundum is the most common type of ASD. Clinical manifestations, mostly asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. Symptoms usually initially occur in the third decade of life or later. So it's been there for a while, but symptoms don't occur until much later. In infants and young children, it's important to know that they can get recurrent respiratory infections, so too much blood flowing from the left to the right to the pulmonary, and also failure to thrive and exertional dyspnea. In adolescents and young adults, they'll have exertional dyspnea, easy fatigability, palpitations, atrial arrhythmias, syncope and heart failure, and they may develop paradoxical emboli, strokes and venous clots, or dysrhythmias later. For physical examination, it's a crescendo-decrescendo murmur, at the pulmonic area, the left upper sternal border. It's a wide fixed split S2 that does not vary with respirations. So very important, a wide fixed split S2 that does not vary with respirations. A loud S1 and a hyperdynamic right ventricle. For diagnosis of ASD, echocardiogram is the best to make the diagnosis. EKG, maybe show incomplete right bundle branch block and crocotage sign, notching of the peak of the R wave in the inferior leads. Chest x-ray, cardiomegaly, increased cardiovascular markings, and cardiac cath is definitive but rarely needed. Management is important. A small ASD under 5 millimeters can be observed. Most small ASDs resolve spontaneously, and they spontaneously close usually in the first year of life. You would only do surgical correction if it's over one centimeter, which is 10 millimeters, or symptomatic, usually between two to four years of age. And this would be by percutaneous transcatheter closure or a surgical intervention. So again, for management, small ASD under five millimeters, observe over 10 millimeters or symptomatic, repair. And again, do an echo. And for auscultation, you'll have a wide fixed split S2 that does not vary with respirations. And osteum secundum is the most common type of ASD. Next will be a PDA, a patent ductus arteriosus. This is a persistent communication between the descending thoracic aorta and main pulmonary artery after birth. It's usually associated with a left to right shunt, non-cyanotic, and risk factors are preemie, female, and fetal hypoxia, so two times more common with females. Pathophys is continued prostaglandin E1 production and low arterial oxygen content, which promotes patency. Manifestations are mostly asymptomatic, but some may develop um, poor feeding, weight loss, frequent lower respiratory tract infections, pulmonary congestion, and infective endocarditis. Also, it's important to know Eisenmenger syndrome. So Eisenmenger syndrome in PDA is pulmonary hypertension, and cyanotic 
heart disease occurring when a left to right shunt switches and becomes a right to left shunt, cyanotic. The patient may develop cyanotic lower extremities and cyanosis and clubbing of the feet. So physical examination, a continuous machine-like, a continuous machine-like or a to and fro murmur loudest at the pulmonic area, the left upper sternal border. So PDA, continuous machine-like murmur, and also wide pulse pressures, bounding peripheral pulses, and a loud S2. So the increased pressure and blood flowing into the pulmonary, like an AST. So again, bounding peripheral pulses, continuous machine-like murmur for PDA. Diagnosis is by echo. On EKG, you may see some LVH and left atrial enlargement. Um, chest x-ray will be normal or cardiomegaly. And cardiac cath is definitive but not usually needed. Management is NSAIDs, first-line medical treatment, IV endomethacin, ibuprofen. NSAIDs inhibit prostaglandin synthesis. You can also do surgical correction as well. Next will be coarctation of the aorta. Coarctation of the aorta is a congenital narrowing of the aortic lumen at the distal arch or descending aorta. It's two times more common in males. So we said a PDA is two times more common in females. A coarctation of the aorta is two times more common in males. It's associated with a bicuspid aortic valve in 70%, also mitral valve defects, PDA, and Turner syndrome. So two important things there, bicuspid aortic valve and Turner syndrome. The pathophys of coarctation is narrowing of the aorta, most commonly at the insertion of the ductus arteriosus distally to the origin of the left subclavian vein in hypertension in the arteries and proximal to the lesion. So primary arteries supplying upper extremities with relative hypotension in the lower extremities. So in essence, it's a blockage because a narrowing of an area leading to hypertension proximal to it and hypotension distally to it. And over time, the body compensates by developing collaterals around the coarctation to supply that blood to the hypotensive area. So these will see intercostal arteries. For types, you have postductal and preductal. Postductal is typically the adult type, which shows narrowing occurring distally to the ductus arteriosum. And then preductal, the infantile type, narrowing occurs proximal to the ductus arteriosum. Uh, clinical manifestations of coarctation may range from asymptomatic to heart failure to shock, and you'll have bilateral claudication, however, dyspnea on exertion and syncope, and that's lower extremity, so bilateral claudication. Also, the neonatal presentation of a coarctation may be failure to thrive, um, which would be preductal, and poor feeding once two weeks after birth. Physical exam, very important, upper extremity systolic hypertension with lower extremity hypotension or diminished or delayed lower extremity pulses. That would be the femoral or dorsalis pedis pulse. Systolic murmur radiating to the back scapular neck. But very important, the upper extremity systolic hypertension, the lower extremity systolic hypotension. Diagnosis is on echo, which is the confirmatory test. And you can do a chest x-ray to see posterior rib notching and also a classic three sign a three sign, which is narrowing of the aorta, which looks like a notch on the number three. So EKG will have LVH as it's pushing against that obstruction in hypertrophy, and angiography is gold standard where you can actually see the outline of the aorta. For management, you want to do corrective surgery or transcatheter-based interventions, balloon angioplasty with or without stent placement, and it's preferably done in early childhood. Prostaglandin E1, alprostadil, can be done preoperatively to stabilize the condition, which basically maintains the patent ductus arteriosus, reducing symptoms and improving lower extremity blood flow. Next will be Tetralogy of Fallot. So Tetralogy of Fallot is a constellation of four things. Tetralogy, so right ventricular outflow obstruction, right ventricular hypertrophy, which is in response to that, large unrestrictive VSD, ventricular septal defect, and an overriding aorta. This is the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease. It's associated with a right to left shunt. Risk factors are genetic and environmental. It's also associated with a chromosome 22 deletion. So you can remember that by 2 plus 2 equals 4 tetralogy. Clinical manifestations. Infancy, they'll have cyanosis as the most common presentation. This is also called blue baby syndrome. And for older children, it's very important to know exertional dyspnea, cyanosis that worsens with age, 
and the all-important Tet spells. So Tet spells are paroxysms of cyanosis relieved with squatting. Squatting decreases the right to left shunting and improving oxygenation. In infants, Tet spells are relieved by putting the knees to the chest. Physical examination, harsh systolic murmur at the left mid to upper sternal border, the VSD, and a right ventricular heave due to the right ventricular hypertrophy, also digital clubbing and cyanosis. For diagnosis, you want to do echo, and for chest x-ray, you'll see a boot-shaped heart, which is due to the prominent right ventricle. EKG will show right ventricular hypertrophy and right atrial enlargement as it pumps into that right ventricle. Management, surgical repair, performed ideally within the first 4 to 12 months, and prostaglandin infusion prior to surgery to maintain the PDA and improve circulation. And also prophylaxis for bacterial endocarditis as well. Next will be transposition of the great arteries, TOGA. This is discordance between the aorta and pulmonic trunk. The aorta arises from the right ventricle and the pulmonic trunk arises from the left ventricle. It's most common cyanotic heart disease presenting in the neonatal period, de dextro. So there's two types, dextro TGA and levo TGA. Dextro TGA is the most common. This is when the aorta arises from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery from the left ventricle leading to two parallel circuits. So the systemic circuit sends systemic oxygenated blood back to the systemic circulation. The pulmonary circuit sends oxygenated blood, venous blood, back to the lungs. Prior to surgical correction, survival is dependent upon the presence of shunts between the right and left circulations. So a PDA, an ASD, or a VSD are pertinent for survival. It could also be a levo TGA, which is usually acyanotic as well. Clinical manifestations, severe cyanosis and tachypnea within the first 30 days of life, not affected by exertion or the use of oxygen. Echocardiogram, means of primary diagnosis. EKG, uh, right axis deviation or RVH. Chest radiograph, very important to know the egg on a string appearance for transposition. So egg on a string appearance. So the heart appears like an egg on its side with the narrowed atrophic thymus of the superior mediastinum appearing as a string. Mildly increased pulmonary vascular congestion and mild cardiomegaly. Cardiac cath is the gold standard but rarely used and the management is atrial arterial switch operation so you need to switch the vessels. And prostaglandin E1 analog to maintain the PDA and balloon atrial septostomy may be needed for temporary intercirculatory mixing prior to definitive surgical repair. So without treatment for a transposition, 90% die by one year, and the five-year survival rate after surgery is over 80%. So next we'll just highlight a couple different areas of each of the pediatric heart conditions, so congenital heart diseases. First, ASD, the atrial septal defect. Again, osteum secundum is the most common type, and it's usually asymptomatic until over 30 years old, so that when they're adults, it becomes symptomatic. They'll have a systolic ejection murmur, heard best at the pulmonic area, increasing pulmonic flow, and they may develop a stroke due to paradoxical emboli um, going between the atria. They'll have a classically widely fixed split S2 that does not vary with respirations. So typically it would vary with respirations, the S2, as more blood is coming into the um, right side of the heart with inspiration increasing the rate. For a PDA, patent ductus arteriosus, it's a hallmark, continuous machinery murmur, loudest at the pulmonic area. They'll also have a wide pulse pressure and bounding pulses. For TOF, tetralogy of Fallot, this is marked by the most common cyanotic heart disease overall. Cyanosis in infants, they'll have TET spells in older children. Periodic episodes of cyanosis relieved with squatting or putting the infant's knees to its chest. And on chest x-ray, a boot-shaped heart. Management is surgical correction. Prostaglandin E1 prior to surgery maintains the PDA. And of course, um, right ventricular hypertrophy, VSD, large unrestricted VSD, an overriding aorta, and right ventricular outflow obstruction. Next, coarctation of the aorta. So coarctation of the aorta, hallmark 70% have a bicuspid aortic valve. Um, Turner syndrome is common. And suspect in a child with secondary hypertension, bilateral lower extremity claudication as well. Systolic murmur that radiates the back, scapula, or chest, 
and the systolic blood pressure in the upper extremities greater than the lower extremities. Delayed or weak femoral pulses and a chest x-ray with rib notching due to the collaterals in the intercostal uh, arteries and also a three sign which is the shape of the coarctation itself seen on radiograph. So we'll go into VSD, ventricular septal defect. VSD is a hole in the ventricular septum usually associated with a left to right shunt. Most common type of congenital heart disease in childhood and small to moderate associated with a left to right shunt. Large unrestricted defects may eventually develop into a right to left shunt which is Eisenmenger syndrome. Types perimembranous is the most common at 80%. This is a hole in the left ventricular outflow tract near the tricuspid valve. It could also be muscular with multiple holes in a Swiss cheese pattern. It could be inlet, which is posterior, or supracristal outlet. Clinical manifestations, if it's small and restrictive, it could be asymptomatic or mild symptoms, and normal pressure differences between the ventricles are maintained. It's usually asymptomatic at birth and develops symptoms after a few weeks. For a moderate-sized VSD, it could have excessive sweating and fatigue, especially during feeding, and lacking adequate growth as well, and, and frequent respiratory infections. For large and unrestricted, severe symptoms. No pressure differences between the ventricles. And again, Eisenmenger syndrome is right to left shunt occurring with large unrestricted VSDs over time. For physical examination, high-pitched holosystolic murmur, very harsh high-pitched holosystolic murmur heard best at the left lower sternal border. Smaller VSDs are usually louder and associated with more palpable thrills than larger ones may be associated with a thrill or a diastolic rumble in the mitral area. So smaller VSDs are louder, larger VSDs are softer. Echocardiogram determines the size and location of the VSD. Echocardiogram is usually preferred over cath. EKG will show left ventricular hypertrophy. Chest radiograph may be normal, show left atrial enlargement and right ventricular hypertrophy in Eisenmenger syndrome. You can observe for management in small VSDs that are asymptomatic, most of them close within 12 months anyways, and you can also do a patch closure if they are symptomatic, or uncontrolled CHF, growth delay, recurrent respiratory infections as well, and large shunts repaired by two years of age to prevent pulmonary hypertension development. So we'll go over the congenital cyanotic heart diseases, so the five T's. Truncus arteriosus, this is one vessel instead of two normal vessels, the aorta and the pulmonary artery. There is transposition of the great arteries, which is a two-vessel switch, aorta and pulmonary artery. There is tricuspid atresia, absence of the tricuspid valve leads to a hypoplastic right ventricle. Tetralogy, tetralogy of Fallot, which is four problems, the right ventricular outflow obstruction, the ventricular hypertrophy, the overriding aorta, and the ventricular septal defect. And remember, large is more symptomatic, but harder to hear, and small is less symptomatic, but you can hear it better. And lastly, for number five, totally anomalous pulmonary venous return, five vessels involved. So this is all four pulmonary veins connect to one vessel, the SVC, instead of the left atrium. And also hypoplastic left heart syndrome is often associated with mitral valve or aortic valve atresia. So next will be pulmonary atresia. Pulmonary atresia with intra intact intraventricular septum, PAIVS, is characterized by a complete obstruction to the right ventricular outflow with varying degrees of right ventricular and tricuspid valve hypoplasia. So blood is unable to flow from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery in the lungs. It could be two types, valvular membranous, which is a atretic pulmonary valve, small valve annulus with fused valve leaflets leading to a thin intact membrane that causes right ventricular outflow tract obstruction or it could be muscular as well which is obliteration of the muscular infundibulum. It's associated with severe right ventricular hypoplasia. Manifestations are cyanosis due to the right to left shunt. Management mainstay um, or maintain the patency of the ductus arteriosus and how would we do this? Prostaglandin E1 which is alprosidil to stabilize it initially and then balloon atrial septostomy to improve the right to left atrial shunting. It can also be surgical repair which is definitive and if untreated approximately 50% of these children will die in two weeks and 85% within six months. 
So next will be tricuspid atresia. Tricuspid atresia is 2% of all congenital heart diseases. Absence of the tricuspid valve leads to a hypoplastic right ventricle. A PDA or VSD is necessary for pulmonary blood flow and survival. Clinical manifestations, cyanosis due to the right to left shunting. Single heart sound, the S2. EKG, left ventricular hypertrophy. And on chest x-ray, normal or enlarged cardiac silhouette with decreased pulmonary flow. Management, again, maintain the patency of the ductus arteriosus with prostaglandin E1, alprostadil, to maintain it. And the presence of a VSD improves the oxygenation of the blood as well. And then surgical repair will be needed. And lastly, the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome is failure of the development of the mitral valve, aortic valve, or the aortic arch. It leads to a small ventricular size unable to supply the normal systemic circulatory requirements. 1% of all congenital heart diseases. And again, prostaglandin E1s to keep the PDA, PDA open um, following surgical repair. So next we'll go into coronary artery disease. Coronary artery disease is a pathologic process affecting the coronary arteries, usually due to atherosclerosis, hardening and narrowing of the coronary arteries. This is due to inadequate tissue perfusion, due to the imbalance between increased demand and decreased coronary artery blood supply. The major risk factors are diabetes, which is the worst risk factor, as it's considered a coronary artery disease equivalent, and smoking, which is the most important modifiable risk factor. Also, of course, hyperlipidemia, hypertension in men, age over 45 in men or over 55 in women, and a family history of coronary artery disease as well, first-degree relative, father or brother before age 55, and in a mother or sister before the age of 65. So first we'll go into angina pectoris. Angina pectoris is a complication of coronary artery disease leading to symptoms. Pathophysiology, inadequate tissue perfusion due to an imbalance between increased demand and decreased coronary artery blood supply. Symptoms usually occur with 70% occlusion or greater. And clinical manifestations are chest pain, which of course is classic. Although there is significant variation, the pain is classically substernal, poorly localized, exertional, short in duration under 30 minutes, but often resolved within 5 minutes of cessation of activity. It's, of course, exacerbated with activity or stress and relieved with rest or nitro. It may radiate to the arm, teeth, lower jaw, back, epigastrium, or shoulders. And also some associated symptoms are dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, diaphoresis, numbness, and fatigue. Anginal equivalent will be instead of chest pain, patients may develop dyspnea, epigastric, or shoulder pain. And this is especially seen in women, elderly, diabetics, and obese patients. Very important. Physical examination is usually normal. So again, D-O-W-E, diabetics, obese, woman, and elderly. For diagnosis, stable angina is usually a clinical diagnosis along with testing. For EKG, we want to do that. Initial test of choice, ST depressions are a classic finding. T-wave inversions, poor R-wave progression, T-wave pseudo-normalization. And the resting EKG is normal, however, in 50% of the cases. Stress testing is the most important non-invasive testing. Options include stress EKG, myocardial perfusion imaging, or a stress echo. And of course, coronary angiography, which is the definitive diagnostic test. It also defines the location and extent of the coronary artery disease. So for medical management, typical outpatient regimen includes four drugs, a daily aspirin and beta blocker, both decrease mortality, and sublingual nitro as needed, and a daily statin as well. Calcium channel blockers can be used in lieu of beta blockers if beta blockers are contraindicated or in vasospastic disorders, especially like Prinz metals angina. Reduction of risk factors, hypertension and diabetes control, exercise, diet, smoking, cessation. And of course, revascularization is the definitive management. PTCA, percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, is a 1 to 2 vessel disease in non-diabetics and not involving the left main coronary artery with normal or near normal ejection fraction. So it's important to know cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft, this is indicated in left main coronary artery stenosis, three vessel disease, or two vessels in diabetes, or a decreased left ventricular ejection fraction under 40%. So a few things. So 
you don't do a PTCA if no diabetes. You do a PTCA if no diabetes, no left main coronary artery disease, no decrease in ejection fraction, and not over two vessel disease. So we'll go over the different classes of angina, class one through four. So class one for angina is angina only with unusually strenuous activity, no limitations of the activity. Class two angina is with more prolonged or rigorous activity, slight limitation of physical activity. Class three is angina with usual daily activity, marked limitation of physical activity. And class four is angina at rest, often unable to carry out any physical activity. So stress testing in coronary artery disease is what we'll go over next. This is the most useful non-invasive test in the diagnosis of coronary artery disease. The stress EKG is first. So the stress EKG is indicated if the baseline EKG is normal. So if the baseline EKG is normal, we do a stress EKG. And positive findings of this test would include any EKG changes like ST depressions, T wave inversions, poor R wave progression or reduction of symptoms or signs. And limitations is that it doesn't actually locate the area of ischemia. We can also do myocardial perfusion imaging and this is if it's abnormal. This uses thallium or technetium for imaging. So indications can be used if the baseline EKG is abnormal. Gives information regarding the location and extent of the ischemia, which the simple stress EKG does not. Can be performed in either exercise or a pharmacologic agent. If the patient cannot exercise, we can give vasodilators like adenosine or dipyridamol. Contraindications to vasodilators, bronchospastic disease, of course, hypotension, and AV blocks. Theophylline and caffeine should also be stopped 48 hours and 12 hours, respectively, prior to this test. So again, myocardial perfusion imaging, thallium or technetium, um, vasodilators like adenosine or dipyridamol, and remember your contraindications to these medications. And it's in, done in an abnormal EKG. So stress EKG, normal, baseline EKG. For myocardial perfusion imaging, it's done if it's abnormal EKG at baseline. Next will be a stress echo. A stress echo is indicated if the baseline EKG is abnormal, given information regarding the location and extent of ischemia, just like myocardial perfusion imaging. And it can be performed with exercise or pharmacologic if the patient cannot tolerate exercise. And it, we use positive inotropes like dobutamine or dopamine. Contraindications to these positive inotropes are severe left ventricular outflow obstruction, such as aortic stenosis, or ventricular arrhythmia, or a recent MI in the past one to three days, or severe systemic hypertension. And a couple other considerations during stress testing in patients without a history of coronary artery disease, anti-anginal medications like nitrates, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, should be withheld 48 hours prior to stress testing. Patients with, no, patients with a known history of coronary artery disease should continue their anti-anginal medications prior to stress testing. This allows for evaluation of the efficacy of the patient's current treatment regimen and also to determine the appropriate level of exercise that's actually safe for the patient. So if they have no history, we want to see what their response is without any drugs first so we can make a proper determination. So next will be coronary angiography which is the definitive diagnosis, it's the gold standard, it's a cath that outlines the coronary artery anatomy. Angiography also defines the location and extent of the coronary artery disease, just like the myocardial perfusion imaging does and the stress echo, but the coronary angiography is the gold standard. Indications for angiography are to confirm or exclude coronary artery disease in patients with symptoms consistent with coronary artery disease, or to confirm or exclude coronary artery disease in patients with negative, non-invasive testing, or patients who may possibly need revascularization, like a PTCA or a cabbage. And remember, cabbage is done if they have left anterior descending blockage. If they're diabetics, then you do it with two vessels, otherwise three vessels or more, and if they have a decreased ejection fraction as well. Okay, so now we'll go into some long-term management of stable angina. So long-term med medical management of stable angina. Angina is chest pain brought on by exertion due to decreased supply and increased demand of the heart. 
So the pharmacologic treatment is effective by increasing the supply while simultaneously, of course, reducing the demand. So first we'll go over beta blockers. Again, the cardioselective beta blockers, beta-1, bisoprolol, esmolol, atenolol, and metoprolol. They increase myocardial blood supply by increasing O2, prolonging the coronary artery filling time. So the coronary arteries do fill during diastole. And beta blockers increase diastolic timing. And they also decrease the demand, so reducing heart rate and myocardial O2 requirements during the rest and exercise, negative chronotrope or inotrope. Indicated in first line for stable angina, reducing mortality, decreasing symptoms, and preventing ischemic occurrences. So again, the drugs that reduce mortality are beta blockers, um, nitrates with hydralazine, spironolactone, and ACE and ARBs. Aspirin will be next. So aspirin prevents platelet activation and aggregation. This is done by inhibiting cyclooxygenase and thromboxane A2 and inhibiting prostaglandins. This does not directly address the supply and demand problem, but it prevents progression from stable chronic angina to ACS. The first step in ACS is thrombosis after plaque rupture. So aspirin is decreasing the mortality and thrombosis risk overall. However, cautious with use in patients with active peptic ulcer disease um, due to the increased risk of bleeding and renal as well for aspirin. It is an NSAID after all. Next will be nitroglycerin or nitrates, and this can be oral, spray, or patch. They increase myocardial blood supply, increasing O2 and increasing collateral blood flow to the ischemic myocardium, reducing coronary artery vasospasm as well, and increasing the coronary artery dilation. They also decrease the demand on the heart, decreasing the cardiac work, and also decreasing the preload by venodilation, and also decreasing the afterload by kind of dilating the aorta. Sublingual nitro is the most effective, and it's used when symptomatic or situations likely to induce angina. If there's no relief with the first dose of nitro, give the second and the third every five minutes. If there's no relief after the third dose, suspect ACS. It also can be used prophylactically about five minutes before any activity likely to cause ischemia. There's a few notable adverse effects of nitro, especially headache, flushing, tolerance, hypotension, also peripheral edema, tachyphylaxis after 24 hours. So that just means you want to have a nitrate-free period for at least eight hours to allow the body to rebuild its tolerance quickly. And also to note it deteriorates with moisture, light, and air. And a few important contraindications are a systolic under 90, right ventricular infarction because it's preload dependent on the heart filling so if we're inhibiting that filling that's going to be problematic also the use of sildenafil and other pde5 inhibitors for nitroglycerin so we'll go to calcium channel blockers calcium channel blockers are the non-dihydropyridines diltiazem and verapamil verapamil is long acting they increase myocardial blood supply by prolonging the diastolic filling time and also prevent and terminate ischemia induced by coronary vasospasm by increasing coronary vasodilation. They decrease demand by decreasing contractility and also decreasing heart rate, AV node blockers, and decreasing afterload. Indicated if patients are unable to take beta blockers and also first line for Prince Metals angina. So the typical outpatient regimen includes four drugs. Daily aspirin and beta blocker both decrease mortality, sublingual nitro as needed, and a daily statin, we want to lower their cholesterol so their plaques don't continue to build up. Reduction of risk factors, hypertension, very important, diabetes, which is a coronary artery disease equivalent, exercise, diet, and smoking cessation. So a note on aspirin for primary prevention. Aspirin for primary prevention is a low-dose aspirin may be considered for primary prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in select patients 40 to 70 years, who are not at risk for bleeding. Low-dose aspirin should not be administered on a routine basis for prevention in adults over 70, and do not administer with anybody with the increased risk of bleeding. So basically, don't use it if they're for primary prevention if they're over 70 or there's any risk of bleeding. So next we'll go into acute coronary syndrome. So acute coronary syndrome, symptoms of acute myocardial ischemia secondary to acute plaque rupture and varying degrees of coronary artery thrombosis, which is occlusion. So there's a spectrum of ACS, 
and there's unstable angina, end STEMI, and STEMI. So we'll kind of go over the history, coronary thrombosis, EKG, and cardiac enzymes for each of those. So for unstable angina, angina that is new in onset, crescendo, or at rest, usually over 30 minutes, and over 90% occlusion, by the way, can cause symptoms at rest. So unstable angina is a subtotal occlusion. You might see some ST depressions or T-wave inversions, and the cardiac enzymes are negative in unstable angina. As we progress up to end STEMI, we also have that subtotal occlusion with some potential ST depressions or T-wave inversions. However, this time there's some cell death, so the cardiac enzymes are positive. And for STEMI, an ST-elevated myocardial infarction, you have a total occlusion of the artery, and you have ST elevations on EKG, and of course, positive troponins as well. So how we can understand this is STEMI is the only one with elevated, um, with ST elevation, of course, but NSTEMI and STEMI both have troponins elevated, whereas unstable angina does not. However, NSTEMI and unstable angina both have some ST depressions or T-wave inversions, potentially. So some etiologies overall of ACS are atherosclerosis as the most common cause of MI, plaque rupture leading to ACS, thrombosis with platelet adhesion, aggregation, and activation, along with fibrin formation, vasculitis, and embolism. And 2% are actually coronary artery vasospasm, which can be cocaine-induced or variant Prince Metals angina. For clinical manifestations, chest pain, retrosternal pressure not relieved with rest or nitroglycerin, or pain at rest lasting over 30 minutes may radiate to the lower jaw, teeth, left arm, epigastrium, back or shoulders, or any change from the typical pattern. And pain at rest usually indicates an over 90% occlusion. So pain at rest over a 90% occlusion. Also sympathetic stimulation, which is why we get that anxiety, diaphoresis, tachycardia, palpitations, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. And also it's possible to have a silent or atypical MI, and this is actually 25% overall. So women, elderly, diabetics, and obese. DOWE, diabetes, obese, women, and elderly. It could be silent or atypical. And it could be abdominal pain, jaw pain, or dyspnea without any chest pain. So the physical exam in ACS is usually normal. Patients may be tachycardic. For an inferior wall MI, may be associated with bradycardia or heart blocks. The RCA supplies the AV node in 90% of patients. They may have an S4, especially with an inferior MI. And a triad of right ventricular infarction is important to know, with increased JVP, clear lungs, and a positive Kuzmal sign. So increased JVP, clear lungs, and a positive Kuzmal sign for inferior wall MI of right ventricular infarction. So for the diagnostic leads, you want to do a 12-lead EKG and, of course, cardiac enzymes. And for a STEMI, ST-elevated myocardial infarction, these are ST elevations greater than 1 millimeter in greater than two anatomically contiguous leads with reciprocal changes in the opposite leads. So you want to see those reciprocal changes in the opposite leads. So if you have a left anterior descending, you want to look at the um, 2, 3, and AVF for the inferior as well as the posterior to see if there's any reciprocal changes. And also it needs to be over 2, 2 or greater anatomically contiguous leads. And also it's important to know the EKG progression. So hyperacute T wave changes are the first change, and then we see the ST elevations, and then later on we see a Q wave formation. And also it's important to know a new left bundle branch block is considered a STEMI equivalent. So we'll go over the area of the infarction, where it is on the heart physically, what we'll see on the EKG, and what artery is involved. So if you have an anterior wall or a septal wall, you want to look at Q waves or ST elevations that might be in, v in V1 through V4 or V1 and V2 for septal. And the artery involved would be the left anterior descending or the proximal LAD if it's septal. So proximal LAD if it's septal, which is V1 and V2. For the lateral wall, this would be lead 1, AVL, V5 and V6, and this would be the circumflex. Anterior lateral, 1, AVL, V4, V5, and V6. And it might be the mid LAD or circumflex. If it's inferior wall MI, it's 2, 3, and AVF. And it's the right coronary artery, RCA. 
And if it's the posterior wall, you'll have ST depressions. Remember, these are reciprocation in V1 and V2, RCA and circumflex. And it's important to know the cardiac markers. So you want to get three sets of cardiac markers eight hours apart. CKMB and troponin are the most commonly ordered, however, mostly troponin now. And troponin may be falsely elevated in patients with renal failure, advanced heart failure, acute PE, or CVA. So troponin is excreted by the kidneys, so if we have somebody on end-stage renal disease, like not having dialysis, then we could have falsely elevated troponins. So for each cardiac biomarker and how long it takes for it to appear, peak, and return to baseline, CK or CKMB appears in 4 to 6 hours, it peaks in 12 to 24 hours, and it returns to baseline in 3 to 4 days. For troponin I and T, it appears in 4 to 8 hours, peaks in 12 to 24 hours, and very importantly, troponin I and T returns to baseline in 7 to 10 days. That's why it's the most sensitive and specific. In myoglobin, it peaks very quickly, 2 to 4 hours, it's the fastest, or rather appears the fastest 2 to 4 hours, peaks 4 to 6 hours, and lasts one day. So the benefit of actually CKMB in this situation is that if we're concerned that they had a previous MI that we didn't pick up, CKMB would go back to normal and allow us to see if they're having a reinfarct as opposed to where troponin would continue to be elevated for, like we said, 7 to 10 days after that initial infarct. So we'll go into management of acute coronary syndrome overview next. So the acute myocardial infarction protocol is an EKG within 10 minutes, importantly door to thrombolytics within 30 minutes, and door to PCI within 90 minutes, plus or minus 30 minutes in different situations. You also want to do the MONA regimen, M-O-N-A, so morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin. Morphine if no pain relief from nitrates. And for a STEMI, beta blocker, nitroglycerin, aspirin, heparin, ACE inhibitor, reperfusion, most important. Unstable angina or NSTEMI, beta blocker, nitro, aspirin, heparin, no emer emergent reperfusion. So you're not going to do reperfusion in unstable angina or NSTEMI. Cocaine induced MI, ASA, nitroglycerin, importantly, heparin, anxiolytics as well. Avoid beta blockers because of the vasospasm. So acute coronary syndrome, we'll go through the algorithm that they propose here. So symptoms associated with ischemia or infarction. You want to perform a brief history and physical, obtain cardiac markers, put them on 4 liters of oxygen, especially if they're O2 sats under 94 and Remer. Aspirin, you can give 160 to 325, and it's chewed, importantly chewed for faster absorption. Nitro can be sublingual or spray. And morphine, consider um, if pain's not relieved by the nitro. And obtain EKG within the first 10 minutes of entering the EKR, entering the ER. Then you want to do, of course, EKG interpretation, and you want to see what it is. So if it's normal, then you have a low intermediate risk of ACS, and you want to admit them to rule out the MI with serial EKGs and cardiac markers. If you have some ST depressions or T-wave inversions, this would indicate an unstable angina or an NSTEMI. If the cardiac biomarkers are negative, then unstable angina. If they're positive, NSTEMI. Either way, you want to start antithrombotic treatment with heparin, very importantly. It can be unfractionated or low molecular weight. And you want to also consider a GP2B3A inhibitor or clopidogrel as well. And consider adjunctive treatment like beta blockers, nitro, and importantly, assess a TIMI risk score for your unstable and your NSTEMI. And if you read that EKG and it shows ST elevation, then of course, start your antithrombotic treatment heparin, unfractionated, or low molecular weight. You can do, again, clopidogrel. Consider adjunctive treatments like beta blockers, nitroglycerin. Symptoms, if they're under 12 hours, you want to do, of course, the most important step, reperfusion for STEMI. So reperfusion for STEMI, door to PCI in 90 minutes or door to fibrinolysis in 30 minutes. PCI is much better, however, than fibrinolysis if you have the option and the time. So overall, ACS management. Normal EKG gets MONA plus serial enzymes and EKGs. Unstable angina or NSTEMI gets MONA, heparin, beta blockers, TIMI or a heart risk assessment, very importantly, and admission. STEMI gets, a mo gets MONA, heparin, beta blockers, and reperfusion, of course, reperfusion, ACE inhibitors for the long term. 
If you have an inferior or posterior wall MI, you want to do oxygen, aspirin, heparin, IV fluids, and reperfusion, no morphine or nitro in inferior or posterior wall STEMI. Cocaine induced MI or Prince Metals Angina. Cocaine induced MI or Prince Metals Angina. Calcium channel blockers is the treatment of choice. You can also do Mona, heparin, avoid beta blockers, however. If you block the beta receptors, then it's going to be an unbalanced alpha. So you're going to have unopposed alpha constriction, which will lead to further vasoconstriction, which is worse for patients who are having those vasospasms in the first place. And of course, PDE5s are contraindicated. And if they are on a PDE5, nitroglycerin is contraindicated. So next we'll go into the location of each type of MI and go into that in some further detail. So it'll be the anterior and lateral wall MI. This is complete occlusion of the LAD, the, later, uh, the left anterior descending artery, which is anterior, or the left circumflex, which is more lateral. On EKG for an anterior MI, there'll be ST elevations in leads V1 through V4 with reciprocal changes, ST depressions, in the inferior leads 2, 3, and AVF. For a lateral MI, ST elevations in 1, AVL, V5 and V6, with reciprocal changes, which are ST depressions, in the inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF. Cardiac enzymes will be positive. Management, aspirin, nitro, oxygen, morphine. Adjunctive, heparin, beta blockers. Uh, if there's no contraindications to the beta blockers, again, hypotension, cardiogenic shock, bradycardia, and also clopidogrel, we can add. In STEMI, long-term management with ACE inhibitors slows the progression of heart failure, and slows the progression of ventricular remodeling. For reperfusion, we want to do PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, ideally within 90 minutes of ER presentation, of PCI capable hospital, and within 12 hours of chest pain onset. Thrombolytics within 30 minutes of ER presentation is an alternative to catheterization if PCI is not possible. So including a transfer to a PCI capable hospital within the first 120 minutes. So PCI is better if it's possible. Inferior or posterior wall MI, this is complete occlusion of the RCA in 80%. In 20%, posterior descending artery is a branch of the left circumflex artery, actually. For physical exam, it's a little bit different. They may have bradycardia, importantly, or heart blocks. So the RCA supplies the AV node in 90%. And they may have an S4, especially if there's an inferior MI and the inferior is 2, 3, and ABF. This is the triad of the right ventricular infarct, which is increased JVP, clear lungs, and a positive Kuzmal sign. This, in, on EKG, we'll see ST elevations in the inferior leads, 2, 3, and ABF, with reciprocal changes, ST depression, in the leads 1 and ABL. Right-sided EKGs may increase the diagnosis, lead V4R, and in posterior, ST depressions in V1 through V4. Cardiac enzymes, of course, positive. <clears throat> so management initially, we can do antithrombotic therapy with aspirin or heparin, IV fluids, oxygen, and clopidogrel, <clears throat> and, avo and avoid nitroglycerin and morphine if inferior and posterior wall MIs. Right-sided MIs are preload dependent to maintain the cardiac output. Adjunctive beta blockers if no contraindications, like hypotension, shock, bradycardia, and for reperfusion, again, same thing. Catheterization is preferred within 90 minutes of presentation or within 12 hours of chest pain onset. And thrombolytics within 30 minutes is an alternative if catheterization is not available. For conservative management, it's used in patients whose chest pain began over 12 hours without current or active chest pain or a low TIMI score. Aspirin plus or minus clopridogrel for nine months statin, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, and nitro. It's important to know some of the complications of MIs as well. So complications of MIs can be arrhythmias, very important, V-fib. So that area gives off, it's basically destroying the cells, so it's giving off all the, not only enzymes, but electrolytes that were inside of the cell, which can mess up with the rhythm. There's a lot of potassium inside of the cells especially, which could lead to arrhythmias. Ventricular aneurysm or rupture cardiogenic shock, also papillary muscle rupture or dysfunction, heart failure, and left ventricular wall rupture. 
There's, of course, Dressler syndrome, which is PFP, pulmonary infiltrates, fever, and post-MI pericarditis. And then we'll go into some of the adjunctive treatment. <clears throat> so we went over these already um, in some depth. All right, that's enough. So generally, we'll go over some of the adjunctive therapy. Many of these we went over more so. However, I'll just highlight some of the more important points to go over one more time. So first, beta blockers. Again, cardioselective beta-1, BEAM, isoprolol, esmolol, atenolol, and metoprolol. Again, beta receptor blockade leading to decreased cardiac output, decreasing myocardial oxygen demand, BP, heart rate, contractility as well, and decreasing ventricular remodeling post-MI. So indicated in stable angina, ACS, and a 15% decrease in mortality, so this is a mortality reducer in STEMI, due to the decreased wall tension, which may prevent something like a free wall rupture or a wall aneurysm, and prevents MI complications such as, such as those. So adverse effects, fatigue, depression, erectile dysfunction, bronchospasm, and important contraindications for beta blockers are CHF, bradycardia, under 50, heart block, second and third degree specifically, hypotension with the BP under 90, severe restrictive airway disease, severe asthma or COPD, shock, cocaine-induced MI due to the unopposed alpha-1 mediated vasoconstriction. For nitrates, mechanism is increasing the myocardial blood supply, increasing the coronary artery flow and collateral circulation, as well as reducing coronary artery vasospasm. Vasodilation occurs due to stimulation of guanyl cyclase, which increases CGMP and also decreasing cardiac demand, decreasing preload and afterload. Knowing the many different routes, sublingual, translingual, transdermal, transmucosal, ointment, IV, oral sustained release. Also indicated in stable angina, ACS, pulmonary edema, heart failure, CHF, hypertensive emergencies, and vasospastic disorders, especially Prinz metals, and esophageal varices as prophylaxis. Administration, sublingual is the best. Adverse effects, headache, flushing, tolerance, hypotension, peripheral edema, tachyphylaxis after 24 hours, allow a nitrate-free period of 8 hours, and also reflex tachy. Deteriorates with light, moisture, and air. And again, those uh, contraindications to nitrates, systolic blood pressure under 90, right ventricular infarct, posterior and inferior while MI, also the use of PDE5s like sildenafil. ACE inhibitors, indications are STEMI, slows the progression of CHF during and after STEMI by decreasing ventricular remodeling, decreasing mortality, especially in patients with CHF, STEMI, left bundle branch block, or ejection fraction under 40%. Given within the first 12 to 24 hours is the best after the patient is stabilized. And some adverse effects of ACE inhibitors, important to know, angioedema and cough due to the increased bradykinin, a potent vasodilator, renal failure, and hyper-K. Contraindications are severe hypotension, renal failure, and pregnancy. And morphine relieves pain, decreases anxiety, and also venodilation, and contraindicated in right ventricular infarct. So we'll go into antithrombotic and antiplatelet therapy. First, the antiplatelet agents. First, aspirin. Aspirin prevents platelet aggregation and activation, inhibiting COX, and inhibiting thromboxane A2, chewed for faster absorption, 20% reduction in death from an MI. There's also the ADP inhibitors, which are clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticlodipine, and these are good for patients with aspirin allergy, given if conservative strategy or if a PCI is planned. 20% decrease in death of MI from stro or stroke, and the mechanism is inhibits ADP-mediated platelet aggregation. Caution if cabbage is planned within seven days or hepatic or renal failure. The G2B3A inhibitors like eptifibotide or terofibin is um, the final pathway for platelet aggregation. It inhibits, good for unstable angina, and STEMI, patients undergoing PCI. For anticoagulants, there's unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin. Unfractionated heparin. The mechanism is that it binds to and potentiates antithrombin 3's ability to inactivate factor 10A, inactivating thrombin, factor 2A, and inhibiting fibrin formation. It prevents new clot formation, 
However, it does not dissolve existing clots, importantly. Unfractionated heparin is indicated in ACS patients with EKG changes or positive cardiac biomarkers, decreasing in death and MI. For low molecular weight heparin, like enoxaparin or adaltaparin, Mechanism is binds to and potentiates antithrombin 3's ability to inactivate factor 10A again. Low molecular weight heparin is more specific to factor 10A than unfractionated. The indications are the same as unfractionated, whereas low molecular weight is superior to unfractionated. It has a longer half-life, about 12 hours, and there's no need for IV infusion or PTT monitoring as well. Decrease the incidence of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, more reliable dosing, and again, a longer half-life may be an issue if you're planning to do a cabbage. So it may be a choice to do unfractionated heparin if you're planning to do a procedure such as a cabbage. And low molecular weight heparin side effects would be thrombocytopenia, obtain a CBC prior to use of low molecular weight, and obtain serum creatinine levels. It must be renally dosed with renal impairment to prevent complications. And we also have Fonda Paranux. So Fondaparinux is a direct factor 10A inhibitor, binds to and enhances antithrombin. It has no effect on thrombin. So overall, to form a clot, factor 10A converts prothrombin, factor 2, to thrombin, which is factor 2A, and then thrombin activates fibrinogen to form the fibrin clot. So now we'll go into reperfusion in ST-elevated myocardial infarction. So the mainstay of treatment is reperfusion, and this is done within 12 hours of symptom onset. Either PCI or thrombolytics. PCI is percutaneous coronary intervention, and this is best done within 3 hours of symptom onset, especially within 90 minutes. PCI is also superior to thrombolytics. It's good especially for cardiogenic shock, large anterior MI, prior cabbage, and if thrombolytics are contraindicated. Cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft, again, is a three-vessel disease or over two in diabetics. Left main, coronary artery disease, or a decrease in the left ventricular ejection fraction under 40%. Thrombolytic fibrinolytic therapy is used if PCI is not an option or if they're unable to get to PCI early. So to go over the fibrinolytic actual agents, this will be drugs like tissue plasminogen activator, alteplase, Retoplase and tenecteplase, as well as streptokinase. So, alteplase is the best one, and the mechanism of action is dissolved clot by activating tissue plasminogen and turning that into plasmin. Plasmin is the proteolytic enzyme that degrades fibrin, so it's going to activate that plasmin to degrade the fibrin strands which form the clot in the first place. Indicated in a STEMI, earlier patency of coronary artery and a shorter half life, also thrombotic strokes and PE. Side effects are a higher rebleed risk, and it's also expensive. For streptokinase, the mechanism of action is a little bit different. It binds to plasminogen, activating into plasmin, and derived from streptococcus. So streptokinase, the mechanism of action is similar, where it binds to plasminogen, activating it into plasmin. It's derived from streptococcus. It's less effective than TPA, so it's only used in patients in whom a PCI is contraindicated. Next will be coronary vasospastic disorders. So first will be vasospastic, variant Prince Metals angina. Signs and symptoms are pain at rest. Importantly, it's called rest angina. This is due to coronary artery vasospasm. The triggers for this are cold weather, exercise, also alpha agonists like pseudoephedrine and cocaine, and also hyperventilation. Some of these risk factors could be females over 50 years old, smokers, history of other vasospastic disorders like Raynaud's and migraine, and they often occur at night as well. For clinical manifestation, manifestations, again, chest pain at rest, especially midnight to early morning, usually not exertional and not relieved with rest. For diagnosis on EKG, there'll be transient ST elevations in the affected arteries that resolve with symptom resolution. ST elevations may resolve with calcium channel blockers or nitroglycerin, and they may have ST depressions as well. You always want to do angiography as well for diagnosis to rule out coronary artery disease, and it may show evidence of coronary artery vasospasm during the angiography itself, especially with the use of ergonavine, hyperventilation, or acetylcholine. It's also like Takotsubu cardiomyopathy, where it's an all-the-way question, where you have to take all the steps, EKG, troponins, angiography, to come to the diagnosis. 
The diagnosis is made after angiography is performed. Management, calcium channel blockers are first line. Diltiazem, verapamil, amlodipine, nicardipine, given at night. Nitroglycerin is second line. And during an acute chest pain episode prior to the diagnosis, aspirin and heparin may be given until atherosclerotic disease is ruled out. Beta blockers are avoided, as we said, because they may lead to unopposed vasospasm, unopposed alpha stimulation. Next will be cocaine-induced myocardial infarction. Pathophys is similar, coronary artery vasospasm, due to cocaine's activation of the sympathetic nervous system and alpha-1 receptors. This leads to vasoconstriction of the coronary arteries. And MI may also occur if vasoconstriction is prolonged due to the decreased blood flow. On EKG, we'll see transient ST elevations may induce an MI, again, if prolonged vasoconstriction. Management is the same, calcium channel blockers and nitrates are the drug of choice to reverse the vasospasm. And again, it's often treated with aspirin, heparin, and benzos until atherosclerotic disease is ruled out. We want to avoid non-selective beta blockers in cocaine-induced MI. And remember that CL, carvedilol, labetalol, they care less which receptors they hit. This increases the risk of vasospasm, unopposed alpha constriction. So next we'll go into the large topic of heart failure. So heart failure is the inability of the heart to pump sufficient blood to meet the metabolic demands of the body at normal filling pressures. Coronary artery disease is the most common cause, in especially post-MI. There's a couple different forms of heart failure. There's left versus right-sided or systolic versus diastolic. So left versus right-sided. In left-sided, most common causes are coronary artery disease and hypertension. And other causes include valvular disease and cardiomyopathy. For right-sided heart failure, the most common cause of right-sided heart failure is actually left-sided heart failure. Also pulmonary disease, COPD, pulmonary hypertension, and mitral stenosis. It backs up all the way past the lungs to get to the right side. So systolic versus diastolic is also a way we can classify heart failure. Systolic is a decreased ejection fraction. We may have a S3 gallop for systolic failure. And systolic is the most common form of heart failure. Etiologies may be post-MI also dilated cardiomyopathy, and myocarditis. For diastolic heart failure, this is with preserved ejection fraction. So it's also called HEF-PEF, whereas systolic would be HEF-REF, um, reduced ejection fraction. So diastolic is preserved ejection fraction, normal or increased, actually, and it's an S4 gallop. S4 gallop is basically forced atrial contraction into a stiff ventricle. So the ventricle is hypertrophied, and we're trying to force it against these stiff walls. It's also associated with overall normal cardiac size. Etiologies would be hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy, elderly, valvular heart disease, and also cardiomyopathies, hypertrophic or restrictive or constrictive pericarditis. So to go over them, just to separate diastolic and systolic further, diastolic preserved ejection fraction, thick ventricular walls, small left ventricular chamber, and an S4 on auscultation. For systolic, decreased ejection fraction, thin ventricular walls, dilated left ventricular chamber, and an S3 on auscultation. We can also further differentiate it from high output to low output heart failure. High output is important to know. This is when the metabolic demands of the body exceed what our heart can put out, so the normal cardiac function. Things like this would be thyrotoxicosis, wet beriberi, severe anemia, AV shunting, and Paget's disease of the bone. For low output heart failure, this is an inherent problem of myocardial contraction, maybe due to ischemia or chronic hypertension. Then we can also further differentiate it with acute and chronic. So acute would be a largely systolic dysfunction, hypertensive crisis, acute MI, or even a papillary muscle rupture. For chronic, it's typically seen in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy or valvular disease. So the pathophysiology of heart failure. Initial insult leads to an increase in afterload, an increase in preload, and a decrease in the contractility of the heart. The injured heart tries to make short-term compensations that over time promote cardiovascular deterioration. Some of these compensations include sympathetic nervous system activation, myocyte hypertrophy and remodeling, and remember ACEs decrease that ventricular remodeling, 
and activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system due to fluid overload and ventricular remodeling and hypertrophy leads to that congestive heart failure. So the clinical manifestations of heart failure on the left side will have increased pulmonary venous pressure from a fluid back up into the lung. So L is for lungs and L is for left-sided. Dyspnea is the most common symptom. This includes exertional, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, also fatigue. Chronic non-productive cough may occur or productive cough with importantly pink frothy sputum. So that's left-sided heart failure. For physical exam, we may see pulmonary edema and congestion, rails due to the fluid in the alveoli, ronchi and wheezing, tachypnea, rapid shallow breathing, classically Shane Stokes breathing, which is deep, faster breathing with a gradual decrease in periods of apnea and cyanosis. We'll have again an S3 gallop with systolic heart failure and an S4 gallop with diastolic heart failure. They'll have dusky pale skin, diaphoresis, and cool extremities. They're having poor blood flow to the extremities, so they'll be cool and cyanotic. <clears throat> it's important to also know the NYHA, New York Heart Association, functional classifications for heart failure. Class 1 is no symptoms and no limitation during ordinary physical activity. Class 2 is mild symptoms, dyspnea or angina, slight limitation during ordinary activity. Class 3 is symptoms causing marked limitation in activity, even with minimal exertion, comfortable only at rest. In class 4 is symptoms even while at rest, severe limitations, and inability to carry out any physical activity. For right heart failure clinical manifestations, this will be an increased systemic venous pressure from the fluid back up into the roads, so the roads of the body, so the systemic R is for roads, and right-sided, inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, and hepatic circulation as well. So in the IVC, though, which will lead to peripheral edema, pitting edema of the legs and cyanosis. For the SVC, the superior vena cava, jugular venous distension due to increased jugular venous pressure. And for GI and hepatic congestion, they'll have some anorexia, nausea, vomiting. And remember, anorexia due to the vessels being congested around the stomach and the potential cardiac ascites leading to decreased appetite. They may have some vomiting as well, hepatojugular reflex or reflux, which is increased JVP with liver palpation, and also hepatosplenomegaly. For diagnosis of heart failure, echocardiogram is the diagnostic test of choice in the outpatient setting to make the diagnosis of heart failure. It measures ejection fraction, assesses ventricular function, and may reveal the cause. Ejection fraction is the most important determinant for the prognosis of heart failure as ejection fraction under 35% is associated with an increased mortality. For systolic heart failure, they'll have decreased ejection fraction, thin ventricular walls, and dilated left ventricle. And for a diastolic heart failure, they'll have preserved ejection fraction, normal or increased, thick ventricular walls, and a small left ventricular chamber. It's important to go into congestive decompensated heart failure, Chest radiograph and BMP are the initial test of choice for suspected CHF. For chest radiograph, we'll see cephalization of flow following um, curly B lines, which are linear lucencies in the peripheral lung fields, butterfly or a bat winging appearance, followed by cardiomegaly, pleural effusions, and pulmonary edema. CHF is the most common cause of pleural effusions as well. 90% of all of them are transidates. Other transidates could be caused by cirrhosis as well as nephrotic syndrome. And it's important to mention B-type natriuretic peptide, BNP. This is helpful to identify CHF as the cause of dyspnea. This indicates severity and prognosis. The ventricles release the B-type natriuretic peptide during volume overload, such as in congestive heart failure, in an attempt to reverse the process, causing a decrease in the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone activation and decrease of the total blood fluid volume, and increased sodium excretion, so natriuresis, excretion of sodium. A BNP over 100 means CHF is likely. An N-terminal pro-BNP may also be used, and that would be positive if over 400. Cardiac enzymes to roll MI should also be gotten. So now we'll go into the long-term management of heart failure. Initial management is done by ACE inhibitors, and it's important to know ACE inhibitors and beta blockers are the best two drugs to decrease mortality. And ACE inhibitors are the single best agent for mortality. 
So drugs and interventions, ACE inhibitors first, these are the prills, captopril, enalapril, lisinopril, etc. The mechanism is decreasing preload, decreasing afterload, decreasing aldosterone production, decreasing the synthesis of angiotensin II as it's converted in the lungs, potentiates other vasodilators as well, like bradykinin, which is why we have that cough, prostaglandins, and nitric oxide, which helps dilate the vessels. Increases in exercise tolerance and decreases in ventricular remodeling as well. And it's important to make a note of diet and exercise as well. So for heart failure management, we want their sodium restriction to be under 2 grams per day and fluid restriction under 2 liters per day. And of course, exercise and smoking cessation are important. So sodium under 2 grams a day, fluid restriction under 2 liters a day. So to continue with ACE inhibitors, the indications are a first-line therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It's the most effective singular medication for mortality benefit. It leads to decreased rehospitalization, and of course a diuretic may be added for symptom control. Adverse effects are hyperkalemia, non-productive cough, and angioedema due to the increased bradykinin, first-dose hypotension, azotemia, and renal insufficiency. So it's important to know azotemia and renal insufficiency. They're contraindicated in pregnancy, teratogenic, hypotension, as well as severe renal insufficiency, and bilateral renal artery stenosis as well. Although there has been some concern about their effectiveness in African Americans, the available evidence is not sufficient to support a difference in ACE inhibitor use based on race. For beta blockers, this is carvedilol, which is non-selective. It's a beta-1, beta-2, and alpha-1 and metoprolol and bisoprolol, and of course are part of our beam mnemonic, so th those are beta-1 selective as well. The mechanism decreasing harmful effects of sustained sympathetic and renin activation, reducing ventricular size and remodeling, increases ejection fraction long-term after the initial transient decrease in ejection fraction for the first 1 to 10 weeks, and prevents arrhythmias. Start at low doses and titrate every 2 weeks for beta blockers. They're indicated in a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, with no or minimal current evidence of fluid retention, so very important. If they have current fluid retention, you don't want to go with a beta blocker. And overall, they're indicated for a heart failure with a 35% decrease in mortality. They usually add it to an ACE inhibitor or an ARB if additional treatment is needed. So beta blockers are contraindicated in decompensated heart failure, and decompensated heart failure would be concordant with fluid in the lungs as well. Adverse effects discontinue or reduce beta blocker in decompensated heart failure and also carbidolol is not selective so it may cause some dizziness, hypotension, secondary to that alpha receptor blockade. Next we'll go into ARBs, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. So these block angiotensin 2, Losartan, Valsartan, Candesartan, and Erbisartan. The mechanism is blocking of angiotensin 2 not its production, so there's no increase in bradykinin, so this is why we don't have any cough or any angioedema with this medication. Indications are for patients unable to tolerate an ACE inhibitor, and adverse effects are similar to ACE inhibitors with hyper-K and also teratogenicity. Hydralazine and nitrates combined decrease mortality, but neither alone. So hydralazine and nitrates combined decrease mortality by decreasing preload and afterload, and hydralazine only decreases afterload. It's indicated in African Americans with a New York Heart Association class 3 to 4 heart failure with a left ventricular ejection fraction under 40% despite optimal therapy with a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, or ARB, or aldosterone agonist if indicated, and diuretic, or if they're unable to tolerate any of those therapies. It may be used in non-African Americans with hypertension, and mitral regurgitation refractory to conventional th treatment. The combination is associated with decreased mortality, as we said, and adverse effects are similar to nitrates, dizziness, headache, and of course tachyphylaxis, which is why we got to give that eight hour nitrate free period to prevent it. So next will be the diuretics. The diuretics will start with loop diuretics. This is furosemide, bumetanide, and torsemide. Furosemide is also called Lasix. The mechanism is inhibition of water transport across the loop of Henle, leading to increased excretion of water, chloride, sodium, and potassium. It's indicated as the most effective treatment for symptoms of mild to moderate CHF. 
Adverse effects of loops are volume depletion, it's a pretty strong diuretic. Decreased electrolytes decreases the chloride, sodium, and especially potassium. Hyperglycemia, hyperuricemia, also sulfa allergies, and hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. So we're losing that K, so it makes sense that we're having an alkalosis. So and don't forget hyperuricemia and hyperglycemia. Next we'll go to potassium sparing diuretics. This is spironolactone and eplerinone. The mechanism of action of these are aldosterone antagonists. They're a weak diuretic, however, but useful in combo with loop diuretics to minimize the potassium loss and inhibit the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. They also decrease mortality due to the aldosterone antagonism. Indications are to add to an ACE or an ARB in patients with class 2 heart failure with ejection fraction of 30% or class 3 with an ejection fraction of under 35%. Adverse effects of the potassium sparing are hyper-K, of course, gynecomastia, importantly, metabolic acidosis, and eplerinone is less likely to cause gynecomastia. So it's interesting in cirrhosis, as a side note, we give spironolactone, however cirrhosis can manifest with gynecomastia as well as a side effect of spironolactone. So for their contraindications, renal failure and hyponatremia. And also we have HCTZ, which is hydrochlorothiazide and metolazone. So these are the thiazide diuretics. And the adverse effects are hyponatremia, hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis, hyperuricemia, and hyperglycemia. So how I remember this is GLUC, G-L-U-C. It increases these four things, HCT HCTZ does. So GLUC, G-L-U-C, glucose, lipids, uric acid, and calcium. As opposed to loop diuretics, which increase uric acid, glucose, but they decrease potassium. Sympathomimetics, positive inotropes, such as digoxin. The mechanism of action is a cardiac glycoside that's a positive inotrope. It increases contraction, but it's a negative chronotrope, so it decreases heart rate by increasing the vagal tone, and negative dromotrope, so it slows the conduction velocity. So it slows the heart but it makes it beat stronger. It's a positive inotrope um, due to the NAK pump inhibition increase in the calcium mediated contraction. Indications for digoxin are systolic heart failure, decreasing the rate of hospitalization, but does not decrease mortality. It's not a drug that decreases mortality. It's also indicated in atrial fibrillation. Patients in whom a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker are contraindicated, such as in hypotension or CHF, and for adverse effects, for the CNS, they'll have seizures or dizziness, potentially. For GI, anorexia, common early finding. Also nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and gynecomastia as well. And it's important to see the digitalis effects on the EKG. So they may have some PVCs or downsloping of the ST segment. For digitalis toxicity, hypokalemia predisposes to the toxicity, but it causes a hyperkalemia. Clinical manifestations, GI symptoms are the most common, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and very importantly, visual findings, yellow, green, color changes, double vision, or halos around lights. Also arrhythmias, bradycardia, which is more common than tachycardia in digoxin toxicity. And management is digoxin-specific antibody, and magnesium as well to prevent against torsades. <clears throat> Also, we'll mention dobutamine and dopamine. These are also positive inotropes. They increase contractility through beta-1 stimulation, producing, producing peripheral vasodilation. And on high doses, they act as a beta agonist as well. At low doses, acting as a diuretic by increasing renal blood flow. Also, we'll mention nasiratide. So nasiratide is a synthetic BMP. It decreases the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone activation and it increases sodium excretion. It's only used in the ER or inpatient settings as well, nasiratide is. We'll also mention ivabradine. Ivabradine is a selective sinus node inhibitor, so it's slowing the heart rate down. It's indicated and associated with a decreased hospitalization and decreased mortality, and it's used in symptomatic, chronic, stable heart failure with a left ventricular ejection fraction under 35%, in the sinus rhythm with a resting pulse of over 70 and already maxed out on beta blockers or unable to take beta blockers.
So it's only given if we have an over 70 beats per minute because we don't want to risk them of going mm, too bradycardic as well. And it's important to mention Secubitril Valsartan, which is an ARNI, which is also called Entresto. Secubitril is an angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitor. It increases the levels of natriuretic peptides. And the Valsartan, of course, is an angiotensin II receptor blocker. They're put together. So they reduce mortality and they decrease hospitalization for chronic heart failure management, class 2 through 4, with reduced ejection fraction. Important principles in the management of systolic heart failure overall. ACE inhibitors are the single most effective medication for mortality benefit in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, that's systolic heart failure. Beta blockers, carvedilol, metoprolol, and bisoprolol are often added to ACE inhibitors for additional mortality benefit. And medications that decrease mortality, again, we'll repeat this, it's important to know, ACEs, ARBs, beta blockers, angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitors, the ARNIs, that's, again, secubitril, valsartan, or entresto. Also, hydralazine plus a nitrate and aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone. And it's important to know automated implantable cardioverter defibrillator, AICD, is to be used in patients with an ejection fraction under 35%. And remember, in heart failure, these patients, if they have an arrhythmia, they tolerate this very poorly. In medications with no mortality benefit, it's important to mention, there's no mortality benefit of the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like diltiazem and verapamil in the management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And it actually may be deleterious as well. They have a greater depressive effect on the cardiac conduction. It might slow the heart down and not allow it to pump. <clears throat> and also digoxin is associated with decreased hosp hospitalization, but like we said, no mortality benefit. So we'll go into it in a little bit more detail congestive or decompensated heart failure. So the manifestations are similar to what we said, left-sided failure, pulmonary symptoms, dyspnea, cough, rails. L is for left-sided and lungs. For right-sided, we have those systemic symptoms, increased JVP, lower extremity edema, hepatojugular reflex. Right, R is for right-sided and roads. It backs up into the IVC, the SVC, the hip, hepatobiliary system, and could lead to cardiogenic ascites. Diagnosis is by chest radiograph and BMPs. Again, BMP over 100, NT pro BMP over 400. Chest radiograph, we might see that pulmonary edema, the butterfly bat winging, the curly B lines, the cephalization of flow, maybe some cardiomegaly and pleural effusions as well. For management, we can remember this by LMNOP for acute decompensated heart failure. Lasix, L, decreases dyspnea and peripheral edema. Takes, some, uh, takes overall fluid off them very quickly. Morphine for their pain and also decreases anxiety. Nitrates, venodilators. Oxygen relieves the sensation of dyspnea. And position. So we want to sit them upright. We want to have their legs dangle over the bed to decrease the preload and venous return. And we can also use positive pressure ventilation as well, which helps them get more oxygen in and kind of helps push that fluid out of the lungs. So now we'll go over some of the chest x-ray findings in congestive heart failure. Like we said, cephalization of flow leads to curly B-lines and bat winging appearance, which is basically pulmonary edema. Cephalization is really increased vascular flow into the apices of the lungs as a result of increased pulmonary venous pressure. It occurs with pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of 12 to 18 millimeters of mercury, where the normal PCWP, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, is 6 to 12 millimeters of mercury. And a quick note about diastolic heart failure. The management of diastolic heart failure is heart rate control, BP control, and relief of ischemia. If there is beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, you can do calcium channel blockers and diuretics. And also note that although calcium channel blockers may be used in diastolic heart failure, they worsen systolic heart failure, as we mentioned earlier. Next, we'll go into hypertension. So hypertension, based on the 2017 AHA guidelines, is classified as normal if it's under 120 and under 80. If it's elevated blood pressure, it's 120 to 129 and under, one, and under 80. If it's stage 1 hypertension, it's 130 to 139. 
or 80 to 89. And if it's stage 2 hypertension, it's greater than or equal to 140 or greater than or equal to 90. So important that we don't forget that elevated blood pressure is before stage 1. So elevated is 120 to 129 and still under 80. So you could have under 80 diastolic but still be elevated if you're 120 to 129. And stage 1 doesn't start until we have 130 or 80 to 89. <clears throat> and also I got a question. They had a diastolic that was elevated but a normal systolic and you would still call them elevated. So if any of those two diastolic or systolic is over the indicated numbers then therefore it would classify as the highest one. So definition of hypertension overall is a systolic blood pressure of 130 millimeters of mercury or more and or a diastolic blood pressure of 80 or more. The elevations must be at least two different readings at at least two different visits. The etiologies, primary and essential hypertension, most commonly associated 95% due to idiopathic etiology. Associated with an increased salt sensitivity, increased sympathetic activity, and increased mineralocorticoid activity. Secondary is only 5%, but this is due to an underlying, often correctable cause. Renovascular is the most common cause of secondary hypotension at about 4%. This would be renal artery stenosis, whether it be fibromuscular dysplasia in middle-aged women, or atherosclerotic disease of the renal arteries over time. <clears throat> could be endocrine, Cushing syndrome, and hyperaldosteronism. Hyperaldosterone, so aldosterone holds on to salt and gets rid of potassium. So if we're holding on to a bunch of salt, we're going to have hypertension. And Cushing syndrome secretes cortisol, which increases your blood pressure, and um, glucose as well. Secondary hypertension could also be pheochromocytoma coarctation of the aorta, remembering that its upper extremities are much more increased than lower extremities, sleep apnea, alcohol use, oral contraceptives, psychooxygenase 2 inhibitors as well. Some complications are importantly cardiovascular, coronary artery disease, heart failure, myocardial infarction, left ventricular hypertrophy, aortic dissection, aortic aneurysm, peripheral vascular disease, as well as neurologic with TIA, stroke, ruptured aneurysms, and also hypertensive encephalopathy. For a nephropathy, they can have renal artery stenosis as well as sclerosis. And hypertension is the second most common cause of end-stage renal disease in the U.S. after diabetes mellitus. Optic complications, retinal hemorrhages, blindness, and retinopathy. And for workup, the initial workup includes a EKG, 12 lead. You want to document if there's any left ventricular hypertrophy to see how it progresses over the years. Also, fundoscopy is very important to look for any retinopathy. Creatinine, to look at their kidney function. Cholesterol, and also urine albumin to creatinine ratio, the UAC. So for management, lifestyle management is first. Initial management of choice for a newly diagnosed hypertensive, salt restriction, smoking cessation, exercise, diet, and weight reduction. For weight loss, we want to achieve a BMI of 18 to 24. Also smoking cessation, sodium restriction under 2.4 grams per day, and remember heart failure, as we said, under 2 grams per day. The DASH diet is diet to stop hypertension, increase in fruits and vegetables, and decrease in saturated fats, and low in sodium. Exercise at least over 30 minutes per day, every day of the week, and also limit the alcohol consumption to under 2, days, under two drinks per day in men, and under 1 drink per day in women and also patients with a low BMI. Medical management in patients who fail a trial of diet and exercise first, and the BP target is less than 140 over 90, so less than 150 over 90 in adults 60 years of age or older. Treatment results in 50% decrease of heart failure complications, 40% decrease in strokes, and 20, 20, 20 to 25% decrease in myocardial infarctions as well with heart failure, with hypertensive treatment. So we'll go into the pharmacologic management of hypertension. Initial hypertensive therapy in an uncomplicated hypertension. Any one of the four classes can be used. So these are thiazides, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin II receptor blockers, ARBs, or calcium channel blockers. So any of those four classes. So we'll make note of hypertensive therapy with coexisting conditions and what is, the, what is the comorbid disease, and what is the optimum therapy for that specific patient. So if they have angina, we want to do beta blockers and calcium channel blockers first. 
If they're post-MI, we want to do ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. Remember, we want to decrease that remodeling. So we don't want them to continue to progress with that left ventricular hypertrophy even more and have worse heart failure. If they have systolic heart failure, same thing, ACE, ARB, beta blockers, and diuretics. If they're a diabetic and, or with chronic kidney disease, we want to do an ACE inhibitor or an ARB first. If they have isolated systolic hypertension in an elderly patient, you want to do diuretics first and then calcium channel blockers. If they have osteoporosis, we want to do thiazides. So remember, gluc for thiazides. That's why it would be a good treatment for osteoporosis. Glucose, lipids, uricemia, and calcemia, it increases. So thiazides increase those, so we can put some calcium back into the bone in the osteoporotic patients. For BPH of the prostate, we want to do alpha blockers like tamsulosin, which is the best one. For African Americans, thiazides first and calcium channel blockers. For young Caucasian males, thiazides, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs. For gout, definitely calcium channel blockers. And also note, Lasartan is the only ARB that doesn't cause hyperuricemia. So also note, loops, HCTZ, ACEs, and ARBs usually do cause hyperuricemia, except for Losartan. So again, gout, you want to do Losartan. And of course, that's secondary to calcium channel blockers, which don't really touch the uric acid. For AFib or A-flutter, you want to do beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. For Raynaud's, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like amlodipine because it's peripheral, so we don't want those cardiac-focused ones. Hyperthyroidism, beta blockers like propanolol. Essential tremor, beta blockers like propanolol. For migraine, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers as well. Some adverse effects on the comorbid condition. For depression, it would be beta blockers, which we don't want to give. And also essentially acting alpha-2 agonists like guanificin and methyl dopa. For gout, we don't want to give thiazides or loop diuretics. For hyper-K, we of course don't want to give ACE inhibitors, ARBs, renin, um, and renin inhibitors, and aldosterone antagonists. For hyponatremia, we don't want to give thiazides. And for severe renal disease, we don't want to give ACEs or ARBs or renin inhibitors. So it's important to remember if they're just starting to have renal disease or diabetic, we want to give ACEs and ARBs. But if they've had it for a while and they're progressing to end stage, we don't want to give ACEs or ARBs. For angioedema, ACEs and ARBs are contraindicated. And for severe renovascular disease, like we said, ACEs and ARBs are contraindicated. For second and third degree heart block, beta blockers, non dihydropyridines like verapamil and diazem as well are contraindicated. So we'll go further into depth, into some more depth with the pharmacologic management of hypertension. So first we'll start off with the diuretics, which we spoke about briefly before. Start with hydrochlorothiazide, chlorthalidone, and metolazone. These are the thiazide diuretics. The mechanism of thiazide diuretics are affecting blood pressure by reducing blood flow, preventing kidney, sodium, and water reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule. So the distal convoluted tubule lowers urinary calcium excretion as well. The adverse effects of HCTZ are hyponatremia, hypokalemia, mild cholesterol elevations, hyperuricemia, hyperglycemia, therefore caution in patients with diabetes or gout, as we mentioned, and hypercalcemia, so GLUC, as we stated before. We'll also go into loop diuretics, which is furosemide and bumetanide. The mechanism, again, is inhibiting water transport across the loop of Henle, increasing the excretion of water, chloride, sodium and potassium. These are the strongest class of diuretics as well, the loops. And adverse effects are volume depletion, hypokalemia, natremia and calcemia, hyperuricemia, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. Again, we correlated the hypokalemia with the alkalosis. Ototoxicity, importantly, ototoxicity, hyperlipidemia and hyperglycemia. And they're contraindicated in a sulfa allergy. So if they have a sulfur allergy and you still want to give a loop, you can give ethacrinic acid as well. And uh, for potassium sparing diuretics, spironolactone, amylaride, and aplerinone. So the mechanism of action of the potassium sparing are to inhibit aldosterone mediated. Sodium water absorption spares potassium. They are weak diuretic and often used in combo. Adverse effects, hyper-K of course, metabolic acidosis because we're holding on to that K. Gynecomastia with spironolactone, contraindicated in renal failure and hyponatremia. 
The ACE inhibitors like captopril, enalapril, ramipril, benzipril, cardioprotective, synergistic effect when used with thiazides, decreasing preload and afterload, decreasing the synthesis of angiotensin II aldosterone production, and also potentiates other vasodilators like bradykinin, prostaglandins, nitric oxide importantly, and increases exercise tolerance and improves insulin's action, which is also why we have which is also why we're helped by them in diabetics. And also ACE inhibitors dilate the efferent arterial in the glomerulus. So after the glomerulus, it dilates that, so it decreases the renal blood pressure that way as well. They're indicated in hypertension with a history of diabetes. Also nephropathy, CHF in old MI2, decreasing that remodeling. Adverse effects, first dose hypotension, azotemia and renal insufficiency, hyperkalemia, they can be ameliorated with low salt and diuretics, and of course cough and angioedema due to the increased bradykinin production and hyperuricemia. And remember, Lasartan is the only one that doesn't increase uric acid of the ARBs. Okay, calcium channel blockers. So there's like two different types of calcium channel blockers, the dihydropyridines and the non-dihydropyridines. The non-dihydropyridines are diltiazem and verapamil, and the dihydropyridines are nifedipine and enlodipine, for example. The mechanism of the dihydropyridines are potent vasodilators, little to no effect on the cardiac contractility or conduction. They're neutral or increased vascular permeability. And dihydropyridines are commonly used in hypertension because we want that systemic effect, not just heart. Non-dihydropyridines affect the cardiac contractility and conduction, as well as potent vasodilators, reducing vascular permeability. Adverse effects overall, headache, dizziness, lightheadedness, flushing, peripheral edema, and constipation with frappamil. So that makes sense because we're not allowing the calcium to enter the smooth muscle cells in the GI tract, which is how they contract. So if we're inhibiting that, then we're not going to have as much peristalsis in the intestine, so therefore some constipation with especially verapamil. Contraindications, CHF, especially non-dihydropyridines, and second and third degree heart block. We don't want to slow the heart down anymore, and especially patients taking beta blockers as well for this. And beta blockers, we'll go through one more time quickly. Cardioselective beta-1, BEAM, B-E-A-M, bisoprolol, esmolol, atenolol, metoprolol. Mechanism, catecholamine inhibition, blocks the adrenergic, run and release also notably. They're not used as a first-line therapy in hypertension in general unless there's a comorbid condition in which we went over in which the beta blockade is actually helpful for them as well. Non-selectives, which are beta-1 and beta-2, is propanolol. And CL, carvedilol, and labetalol care less, so they affect alpha and beta-1 and beta-2. Overall, some adverse effects are fatigue, depression, impotence as well. They also may mask the tachycardic symptoms of hypoglycemia in diabetics. So use with caution in diabetic patients for beta blockers. And caution if hypotensive or a BP um, under 50. Contraindicated in second or third degree, heart block or decompensated heart failure as well. Non-selective agents are contraindicated in asthma and COPD. Also, they may worsen peripheral vascular disease or Raynaud's phenomenon. For alpha blockers, you have prazosin, terazosin, and doxazosin, and the mechanism of these are alpha blockade leading to peripheral arterial dilation. Generally not used as a first-line therapy, but they may be helpful in patients with hypertension and BPH. Adverse effects are first-dose syncope, dizziness, headache, and weakness. So now we'll go to hypertensive urgency and emergency. For hypertensive urgency, this is a systolic over 180, according to this book. I've heard over 120 before as well. But according to this, systolic blood pressure over 180 and a diastolic over 120 without any evidence of end organ disease. Clinical manifestations may be general with headache as the most common symptom, dyspnea, chest pain, focal neuro deficits, altered mental status, seizures, nausea, and vomiting. For management of urgency, we want to do a gradual reduction in the MAP, mean arterial pressure, by no more than 25% in the first 24 to 48 hours with oral medications like clonidine, captopril, labetalol, nicardipine, or furosemide. And the treatment goals are a BP of under 160 over 110. Oral medications used for hypertensive urgency we'll go over. First, clonidine. 
clonidine is a centrally acting alpha-2 adrenergic agonist, so agonist, short-term use only, however. It's contraindicated in depression as well. And headache, tachycardia, nausea, vomiting, sedation. Most important thing for our adverse effects are rebound hypertension if discontinued abruptly. It mimics a pheochromocytoma, actually. Captopril is an ACE inhibitor, angioedema and acute kidney injury. Furosemide is a loop. Labetalol is an alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 blocker. Nicardipine is a calcium channel blocker. Side effect could be reflex tachy, headache, and nausea. Hypertensive emergency. This is a systolic over 180 and a diastolic over 120 with evidence of end organ damage. So some of these manifestations are a little bit different than urgency. With emergency, we have a headache again, most common, altered mental status, focal neurodeficits, etc. Neurologic, encephalopathy or stroke, hemorrhagic or ischemic, and seizure. For cardiac, non uh, acute coronary syndrome, aortic dissection, acute heart failure, pulmonary edema. Workup includes a chest x-ray, EKGs, cardiac enzymes, BNP as well. For renal acute kidney injury, proteinuria, hematuria due to glomerulonephritis, renal uh, or retinal malignant hypertension, and severe grade 4 retinopathy. For management of hypertensive emergency, we want to do IV blood pressure reduction agents. For most hypertensive emergencies, we want to lower the MAP by 10 to 20 percent in the first hour and by an additional 5 to 15 percent over the next 23 hours. So if you round it and get the mean, so 15% in the first hour, then 10% over the next 23 hours. So the three main exceptions are important to know. The acute phase of an ischemic stroke, in ischemic stroke, BP is usually not lowered unless it is over 185 to one, over 110, and the patients who are candidates for reperfusion, or over 220 over 120 in patients who are not candidates for reperfusion. So if we think that we're going to do thrombolysis, we want to lower it to at least under 185. Otherwise, we want to preserve the penumbra, the area around the infarct that still has a chance to survive by increasing the blood pressure so that mm, that area can still get some oxygen and not die out too quick. Acute aortic dissection is also an exception where systolic blood pressure is rapidly lowered to a goal of 100 to 120 within 20 minutes. So, aortic dissection, rapidly lower it within 20 minutes. Intracerebral hypertension, treatment depends on different factors. So next we'll go through different neurologic and cardiovascular causes and what the first line and some notes are based on the um, emergency. So for neurologic hypertensive encephalopathy, nicardipine or clavidipine, labetaval, phenaldopam, and sodium nitroprusside. So, these are CL, clavidipine, and labetalol. Notes, you must rule out a stroke for hypertensive encephalopathy, and hypertensive encephalopathy often presents with confusion, headache, nausea, and vomiting, and the symptoms should improve with lowering of blood pressure. Nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, and hydralazine may increase intracranial pressure. Hemorrhagic stroke, nicardipine or labetalol, and benefits versus risk of lowering the BP, must be weighed in hemorrhagic strokes. Ischemic stroke, nicardipine labetalol. For ischemic stroke, avoid cerebral hypoperfusion if ischemic. As we said, reduce the blood pressure only if the BP is over 220 and 120, not in a thrombolytic candidate, and over 185, over 110 in a thrombolytic candidate for ischemic stroke. For cardiovascular aortic dissection, we want to use quick-acting beta blockers, they decrease the shearing force, that would be esmol and the beta law. And we want to decrease with the beta blocker with a target systolic of 100 to 120 and a pulse of under 60 within 20 minutes for aortic dissection. Acute coronary syndrome, nitro and beta blockers like esmol and metoprolol. Nitroprusside can also be used. And remember, nitroglycerin should not be used if you're suspecting a right ventricular infarct. And remember, the right ventricle is preload dependent, so we don't want to dilate the vessels in that case. And of course, with um, sildenafil, a PD-5 inhibitor. Acute heart failure. The first line is nitroglycerin and furosemide and nitroprusside. 
importantly furosemide, and you want to avoid hydralazine and beta blockers in congestive heart failure. So again, we see that beta blockers in congestive heart failure we want to avoid, only if there's no evidence of cardiac ischemia as well. So next we'll go into a variety of different hypotensions. So first, postural orthostatic hypotension. This is hypotension within two to five minutes of quiet standing, or after five minutes of a period of supine rest, defined at at least 20 millimeters of mercury fall in systolic, or at least 10 millimeters of mercury fall in diastolic pressure. It's common in older patients over 65 years old. The etiologies of orthostatic hypotension would be impaired autonomic function or decreased intravascular volume, also medications, including antihypertensives, alpha blockers, nitro, ACE inhibitors, diuretics, narcotics, like morphine, antipsychotics, antidepressants, and alcohol consumption, all could be medications that dilate or are having a hypotensive effect. Also neurologic includes diabetic neuropathy, Parkinson's and polyneuropathies, and hypovolemia overall due to loops, hemorrhage, or vomiting. Clinical manifestations would be due to cerebral hypoperfusion. So in orthostatic hypotension, they'll be dizzy, lightheaded, palpitations, maybe blurred vision, or darkening of the visual fields, or syncope as well. Workup, BP management, tilt table test, blood pressure reduction at a 60 degree angle. For labs, you want to get a hematocrit, electrolytes, BUN, creatinine, and glucose to evaluate for anemia or if it's just dehydration. For management of orthostatic, the initial management is conservative initially with increasing salt and fluid intake, gradual position changes, compression stockings or abdominal binders, exercise and discontinuation of the offending medications, and caffeine is also helpful as it vasoconstricts. Fludrocortisone is important to know. Fludrocortisone for orthostatic hypotension is the first line medical management if symptoms persist despite non-pharmacologic measures, which you have to do first. You can also do metadrine, which is an alpha-1 agonist, or droxydopa, a, pressure, a presser agent, which may be used in patients if additional therapy is needed, or if the patient is unable to take fludrocortisone. So overall, fludrocortisone first, conservative management, fludrocortisone, then metadrine or droxydopa, and some education about this, avoiding a flat position, sleeping with the head of the bed raised to 30 to 45 degrees, especially if they're refractory to medical treatment. Next, we'll go into reflex-mediated syncope. Reflex-mediated syncope is a neurally mediated syncope, and this includes vasovagal, carotid sinus, and situational syncope. Vasovagal syncope is due to vasovagal hypotension, a self-limited systemic hypotension associated with bradycardia or peripheral venodilation or vasodilation. It's the most common cause of syncope, vasovagal is, especially without the apparent neurologic or cardiovascular disease. Triggers could be examples like blood phobia, emotional stress, fear, pain, and trauma. And manifestations are a prodromal phase of dizziness, lightheadedness, epigastric pain, palpitations, blurred visioning, again darkening of the visual fields, and following syncope with a postdromal state. There's also carotid sinus syncope. This is syncope with minor stimulation of the carotid sinuses, such as shaving, putting on a necktie, wearing a tight collar, head turning, or applying mild pressure to the carotids, or situational syncope. Triggers include defecation, micturition, coughing or sneezing, postprandial or trigger points. Next, we'll go into circulatory shock. Circulatory shock will be next. What is circulatory shock? It's the inadequate organ perfusion and tissue oxygenation to meet the body's oxygenation requirements. It's often associated with hypotension, but not always, and shock is determined by either a low cardiac output or a low systemic vascular resistance, the SVR. So the SVR equals the resistance to blood flow through the, through the circulatory system as determined by the peripheral blood vessels. Peripheral vasoconstriction increases the systemic vascular resistance and vasodilation decreases the systemic vascular resistance. So there's four main types of shock. One, hypovolemic, which is loss of blood or loss of fluid like in a hemorrhage. There's cardiogenic, which is primarily myocardial dysfunction like reduced cardiac output from an MI. 
There's obstructive, which is extrinsic or intrinsic obstruction to the circulation itself, like pericardial tamponade. And there's distributive, which is a maldistrib maldistribution of blood flow from essential organs to the non-essential organs. So this would be sepsis or a neurogenic shock as well. Pathophysiology of shock, inadequate tissue perfusion, in inability of the body's oxygenation requirements to meet the body's metabolic demands leads to a metabolic acidosis and organ dysfunction. Autonomic nervous system activation in an attempt to improve systemic O2 delivery. Sympathetic nervous system activation causes vasoconstriction, which is an increase in systemic vascular resistance and an increase in contractility to increase the cardiac output. And remember, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate increase in norepi, increase in dopamine, and increase in cortisol. The increase in systemic vascular resistance helps to ma maintain cerebral and cardiac perfusion by causing vasoconstriction of the splanchnic, musculoskeletal, and renal blood flow. Re renin angiotensin aldosterone activation as well, water and sodium retention, a decrease in urinary output to maintain the renal water and salt loss, also causes vasoconstriction to help maintain cardiac output. Systemic effects of shock, ATP depletion due to the ion pump dysfunction leading to cellular dysfunction, cell swelling and death, metabolic acidosis due to the lack of oxygen, cells resort to anaerobic metabolism producing lactic acid importantly as a byproduct. So you want, always wanna order lactate as a part of a workup for any sepsis. Multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, MODS. This is physiologic consequence of shock on an organ system. It includes the lungs, kidneys, heart, and brain, as well as in DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Also, MSOF, multi-system organ failure, organ failure if the condition persists. So MODs can persist to MSOF. Clinical manifestations of shock will see a generally acutely ill patient, altered mental status, decreased peripheral pulses, tachycardia, skin is usually cool and mottled, may be warm and flushed in distributive shock, however. They'll have a low systolic blood pressure, under 110 usually, and some patients in shock may be normotensive initially as well. For lab tests, you want to do a CBC, a BMP, which is a CHEM7, lactate coagulation studies, cultures to look for potential infectious sources, ABG and other, uh, and other studies depending on the etiology that you're concerned for. The general management of shock is your ABCDEs. So airway, of course, they may need intubation. Breathing, mechanical ventilation and sedation decreases the work of breathing, reducing the oxygen demand by um, tachypnea. So circulation, isotonic crystalloids like normal saline or lactated ringer should be given. Often given multiple liters and titrated to a CVP of 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury or a urine output, 0.5 millimeters per keg per hour, which is about 30 milliliters per hour, or an improved respiratory rate and heart rate. So we have to titrate the crystalloids that were given to a certain amount so we know if they're being effective or not. And also delivery of oxygen, monitor the lactate levels, and E, end point of resuscitation. So this is what we're working up to. The urine output, the CVP of 8 to 12, the MAP of 65 to 90, and the central venous oxygenation concentration of over 70. Hypovolemic shock will be next. So hypovolemic shock is a loss of blood or fluid volume due to hemorrhage or blood loss. Etiologies, hemorrhagic or non-blood fluid loss. For hemorrhagic, you have GI bleeds, triple A rupture, massive hemoptysis, trauma, ectop ectopic pregnancy, or a postpartum hemorrhage. Non-blood fluid loss would be GI, vomiting, bowel obstruction, pancreatitis, severe burns, diabetic ketoacidosis, which causes an osmotic diuresis in response to the hyperglycemia. And the pathophysiology of hypovolemic shock will be a loss of blood or fluid volume, leads to an increased heart rate and increase in systemic vascular resistance through vasoconstriction, hypotension, and a decreased cardiac output. The body's response to this hypovolemia is both rapid and sustained. It can respond rapidly to the hypovolemia by peripherally vasoconstricting and increasing the cardiac activity. Its sustained response is arterial vasoconstriction and sodium and water retention, and also a bump in cortisol as well. 
clinical manifestations of hypovolemic shock. A loss of volume leads to an increased heart rate, tachycardia, hypotension, and a decrease in cardiac output because they're oliguric and inert, and vasoconstriction, increasing systemic vascular resistance, which leads to the classically pale, cool, dry skin and extremities with slow cap refill over two seconds, a decrease in skin turgor, dry mucous membranes, and also altered mental status. It usually does not cause profound respiratory distress. So there's a few classes of hemorrhagic shock that are important to know. Class 1 through 4. So class 1 is under a 15% blood loss, and the pulses are usually normal, and the systolic is usually normal as well. If they're a class 2 hemorrhagic, that's 15-30% to 30 blood loss, and they'll be tachycardic over 100, and a systolic usually still over 100. If they're class 3, which is 30-40% to 40 blood loss, they'll be tachycardic, decrease systolic under 100, confusion, and decreased urine output. And if they're class 4 hemorrhagic shock, they'll be tachycardic, decreased systolic, lethargic, and no urine output, so anuric. For diagnosis of hypovolemic shock, Hallmark is vasoconstriction, the increase in systemic vascular resistance, hypotension, decrease in cardiac output, and a decreased pulmonary capillary pressure. CBC may show increased hemoglobin and hematocrit due to the dehydration and hemoconcentration. Decre uh, decrease in H&H &H is a late sign in hemorrhagic shock, however. Decreased CVP, central venous pressure, to pulmonary capillary wedge pressure as well. Management is ABCDEs, as we said. Insert two large bore IVs or a central line, volume resuscitation, crystalloids, normal saline, lactated ringers, often given three to four liters to restore the blood volume. You want to monitor urine output to assess for success of the resuscitation, so that echoes the endpoint of resuscitation, which again we want to monitor for the CVP 8 to 12, the MAP 65 to 90. We also want to see some urine output as well. We can con control the hemorrhage to prevent further sequelae such as packed red blood cells, if they're severe hemorrhage, O negative or cross-matched, and to prevent hypothermia, treat any coagulopathy. So that's very important, hypothermia. Next will be the cardiogenic shock. So for cardiogenic shock, it's primary cardiac myocardial dysfunction, leading to inadequate tissue perfusion and a decrease in cardiac output. This increases systemic vascular resistance, and it's often systolic in nature. Cardiogenic often produces increased respiratory effort and distress, whereas hypovolemia does not. Etiologies are cardiac disease, of course, myocardial infarction, myocarditis, valve dysfunction, congenital heart disease, myocard uh, cardiomyopathy and arrhythmias, and acute papillary muscle rupture, maybe. For pathophysiology, the decreased cardiac output and evidence of tissue hypoxia in the presence of adequate intravascular volume. So adequate intravascular volume. Sustained hypotension in the presence of increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure over 15. Vasoconstriction and increase in systemic vascular resistance. Hypotension, decreased cardiac output, and an increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure as we said. For management of cardiogenic shock, oxygen, isotonic fluids. You want to avoid aggressive IV fluid treatment, however. You want to use smaller amounts of fluid. Note that cardiogenic shock is the only shock in which large amount of fluids are not given. So only in cardiogenic shock, large amounts are not given. Inotropic support can be done. Drugs that increase the contractility and cardiac output. And you'd guess dobutamine, epinephrine. Dobutamine is that positive inotrope. Epi, epi is a positive inotrope and a vasoconstrictor. Amrinone may be used if refractory. Amrinone is a PDE3 inhibitor. That's a positive inotrope intraaortic balloon pump as well. And you also, of course, want to treat the underlying cause. If MI, you want to do early angioplasty or thrombolytics. Next will be obstructive shock. So obstructive shock is obstruction of blood flow due to a physical obstruction of the heart or the great vessels. This could be intrinsic or extrinsic. Increase in external pressure on the heart decreases the heart's ability to pump blood. Etiologies are a massive PE which leads to obstruction of pul pulmonary arterial blood flow, also cyanosis, tachycardia, hypotension, VQ mismatch, hemoptysis. Of course, for a PE, we see the S1, Q3, T3 pattern, and more commonly, sinus tach. ABGs will be a PaO2 of under 80, an A to A gradient that's increased, and a low 
cardiac output and an increase in peripheral resistance and an increase in central venous pressure. Also, pericardial tamponade is not a cardiogenic shock, but it's a obstructive shock. So many of these could be confused with cardiogenic as they have to do with the heart, but we have to think of what is physically obstructing the heart, or is it the heart itself that's the problem? So pericardial tamponade is blood in the pericardial space, preventing the venous return to the heart. So that's the classic Beck's triad, with the muffled heart sounds, increased JVP, and a systemic hypotension. For tension pneumothorax, this is when positive air pressure causes an external pressure on the heart, leads to a one-way valve into the chest, but not out. Hyperresonance to percussion will be seen, with a decreased breath sound on the affected side. Mediastinal and tracheal shift are classic to the contralateral side, to the opposite side. So air is filling in one side, pushing everything to the opposite side, and none of that air is getting out. So it's squishing down in the heart in the great vessels, not allowing it to fill. They may have some subcutaneous emphysema, and of course, increase in JVP. Aortic dissection can also cause an obstructive shock, where the proximal dissection most commonly, and it also can cause a hypovolemic shock as well for dissection. So again, the examples of obstructive shock, massive PE, pericardial tamponade, and then you have the Beck's triad, also tension pneumothorax and aortic dissection. Obstructive shock management is oxygen, isotonic fluids, ionotropic support, dobutamine, epi, intraaortic balloon pump, and of course, treat the underlying cause. So for example, PE, you want to do heparin plus or minus thrombolytics, pericardial tamponade, pericardiosynthesis, for attention pneumo, needle decompression, proximal dissections usually require surgical intervention as well. Next we'll go into distributive shock. So distributive shock is excess vasodilation and altered distribution of blood flow. Increased venous capacity with shunting of blood flow from the vital organs like the heart or the kidney to non-vital tissue like the skin, skeletal muscles, and the hallmark of distributive shock is a decrease in cardiac output, a decrease in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and a decrease in systemic vascular resistance as well. It's an important exception in early septic shock that's associated with an increased cardiac output and a decrease in systemic vascular resistance, so warm extremities are often noted in these patients. However, septic shock is the most common type of distributive shock, so that's one important exception is the increased cardiac output and decreased systemic vascular resistance in early septic shock. So septic shock is a subset of distributive shock. So in distributive shock, we have a few different things. So septic shock, it could be anaphylactic shock, neurogenic, and endocrine shock. So first we'll go into septic shock itself. Septic shock, the pathophys is infective organism, activating the immune system leading to the host producing systemic inflammatory response, leading to cytokines which cause prompt peripheral vasodilation, causing decreased systemic vascular resistance, which increases the capillary permeability initiating the shock, and end organ thrombosis as well. So these normally local responses to infection occur in a systemic fashion, fashion um, affecting multiple organs. So typically we release some cytokines in an area where we need some local inflammation. However, this is just happening everywhere, so blood just and fluids just flush everywhere, leaving no fluid to get back to the heart. Clinical manifestations of septic shock, warm shock, hypotension with a wide pulse pressure, bounding arterial peripheral pulses, and this is the only type of major shock associated with an increased cardiac output, fast capillary refill time, warm flushed extremities. SIRS, the Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. So it's important to know that. So it's temperature, pulse, respiratory rate, and white blood cell count for SIRS. So TPRW is how I remember it. T for temperature, and that's if they have a fever, so over 100.4 or over 38, or hypothermia too. So it's bimodal here with fever or hypothermia. Pulse, over, one, over 90 beats per minute. R is respiratory rate, either over 20 or a PaCO2 under 32. So they're breathing too fast, blowing off all that CO2. Or a white blood cell count, W, over 12,000 or under 4,000. So there's two of those things with either very high or very low. So temperature that could be very high or hypothermic, or white blood cells that are extremely high or very low. So TPRW. And interestingly, that blood pressure is actually not in the classification for SIRS. So that's important to remember. TPRW, temperature, pulse, respiratory rate, and white blood cell count.
And it's important to know the difference between SERS, sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. So SERS, we just went over. Sepsis is SERS plus a focus of infection. It's often associated with an increased lactate, which is over four. Severe sepsis is SERS plus multi-system organ failure. And then septic shock is sepsis plus refractory hypotension despite fluid administration, such as systolic under 90, a MAP under 65, or a drop in systolic 40 millimeters of mercury from the baseline. So again, sepsis is just SERS plus infection. Severe sepsis is SERS plus organ failure. And septic shock is you have the sepsis and it's refractory. The hypotension is refractory. So septic shock is the worst. For management overall of septic shock, broad spectrum IV antibiotics, a pan culture before initiating, of course, zosin plus ceftriaxone or imipenem, choosing between the, uh, choose depending on the suspected organism like gent for pseudomonas, vancomycin for MRSA, clinda or metronidazole for intraabdominal infections when you want to cover those anaerobes, ceftriaxone in asplenic patients to cover Neisseria meningitidis and H. influenza, and IV fluid resuscitation, of course, with isotonic crystalloids like normal saline or lactated ringers with a large bore IV, and vasopressors. So if no response to two to three liters of IV fluids with a goal of a MAP over 60, you can do plus or minus hydrocortisone as well. For anaphylactic shock, which will be next, anaphylactic shock is IgE-mediated, severe hypersensitivity reaction, history of insect bites or stings, food or drug allergy, or recent IV contrast. Symptoms usually begin within 60 minutes of the exposure. So again, IgE mediated for anaphylactic shock. This is hypersensitivity. The physical exam will be classic symptoms of pruritus, hives, angioedema, respiratory distress, strider, sensations of a lump in the throat, also hoarseness. And hoarseness is actually a sign of life-threatening laryngeal edema as it presses on the recurrent laryngeal nerve, causing that hoarseness. For management of anaphylactic, you want to do epi, first line, of course. 0.3 milligrams IM for every 1 to 1,000, repeat every 5 to 10 minutes as needed. If cardiovascular collapse, give epi IV 1 to 10,000. Airway management, antihistamines, diphenhydramine, Benadryl, 25 to 50 IV. You can also do H1, which is ranitidine, um, and also ranitidine IV blocking H2. So diphenhydramine blocks H1, ranitidine blocks H2. IV fluids, of course, and observe the patient for four to six hours because up to 20% of the patients have a biphasic phenomenon, which is when the symptoms return three to four hours after the initial presentation reaction. Next will be neurogenic shock. So neurogenic shock is due to an acute spinal cord injury, regional anesthesia as well. So the pathophys might be autonomic, sympathetic blockade, leading to an unopposed increase in vagal tone, bradycardia and hypotension, loss of sympathetic tone, warm and dry skin. Clinical will be warm skin, normal or a decrease in heart rate, decrease in uh, systemic vascular resistance, and hypovolemia and a classic wide pulse pressure, so a large width between the systolic and the diastolic. For management, fluids, pressors, plus or minus corticosteroids as well. For endocrine shock, this is typically adrenal insufficiency, so Addison's, and the management is importantly known, hydrocortisone, 100 milligrams IV, often unresponsive to fluids and pressors, and that's when you would start to even consider an endocrine shock, unless they had a specific history. So again, endocrine shock is adrenal insufficiency, Addison's, and you treat with the hydrocortisone 100 milligrams IV. So next we'll go into hyperlipidemia. Start with hyperlipidemia. The etiologies would be hypercholesterolemia. Some of these causes could be hypothyroidism. When we have an increased thyroid hormone, it increases the metabolism, which also clears blood cholesterol. So hypothyroidism could lead us to a hypercholesterolemia. Also pregnancy cholesterol is upregulated, and kidney failure, failure as well. Kidney failure typically because also nephrotic syndrome. If we're losing proteins, then the liver is going to upregulate all of its production. So part of the things that are produced in the liver is cholesterol as well as the proteins. And also another etiology of hyperlipids is hypertriglyceridemia. 
This would be from diabetes, alcohol, obesity, steroids, or estrogen. Manifestations of hyperlipidemia, mostly asymptomatic. However, hypertriglyceridemia can cause pancreatitis, typically if it's over 600. And they also may develop xanthalomas, such as on the Achilles tendon, or xanthalasma, lipid plaques on the eyelids. So xanthomas are the, on the Achilles tendon, and xanthalasmas are lipid plaques on the eyelid. Our goals for these patients with hyperlipidemia are weight reduction and increased exercise, which increases the HDL, and dietary restriction of cholesterol and carbohydrates, and a decreased trans fat intake. Goal of lipid lowering agents as well to stabilize the plaques that are already there. Also reversal of endothelial dysfunction, thrombogenicity, and atherosclerosis regression. Screening for hyperlipidemia, it's important to know. It's based on the risks. So sex, age, cardiac risk factors such as smoking, hypertension, family history of coronary heart disease, such as a first degree male relative with coronary heart disease before age 55, and a first-degree female relative with coronary heart disease before age 65. The American College of Cardiology and AHA in 2019 says, in adults between ages 20 to 39 who are free of cardiovascular disease, it is reasonable, in quote, to assess the risk factors every four to six years and calculate their 10-year atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk every five years. So four to six every five years. There is considerably high controversy regarding the optimal age to initiate screening, however. High risk with maybe over one risk factor like hypertension, smoking, family history, or one severe risk factor. Initiate screening at 20 to 25 for males and 30 to 35 for females. If they're lower risk, you can initiate at 35 for males and 45 for females. Some of the lipid guidelines for the initiation of a statin therapy are very important to know determined by a 10-year and a lifetime risk calculator instead of strict numbers only. The risk factors include gender, age, race, smoking, blood pressure, blood cholesterol levels, as well as diabetes. It is recommended to treat the following patients. For instance, patients with type 1 or 2 diabetes between the ages of 40 to 75, patients without cardiovascular disease ages 40 to 75, with a 7.5% or greater risk of having a heart attack or stroke within 10 years, people of over 21 years of age with an LDL of over 190, any patient with a form of clinical atherosclerotic heart disease, patients under 19 years of age with familial hypercholesterolemia. Benefits of lipid-lowering medications are many. So the best med to lower LDL is a statin, and then second would be bile acid sequestrant. The best med to lower elevated triglycerides are fibrates, importantly, and then niacin. The best meds to increase HDL are niacin, and the best meds for type 2s, diabetics, are statins and then fibrates. So again, best med for LDL, statins, best med for hypertriglyceridemia, fibrates, best med for HDL, that's low that we want to increase it, niacin. So now we'll go into those medications in further detail. So first, the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, which are statins, simvastatin, pravastatin, lovastatin, and the two um, high-intensity, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. Mechanism of statins are to inhibit the rate-limiting enzyme, the rate-limiting step in hepatic cholesterol synthesis via inhibition of the enzyme HMG-CoA reductase. They increase the LDL receptors, promoting LDL clearance, and reduce triglycerides as well. Indications are the best drug to lower LDL, as well as been shown to decrease cardiovascular complications. Adverse effects, it's important to know, myositis and rhabdomyolysis, and they can cause increased LFTs and hepatitis most commonly, also some GI symptoms and diabetes as well. Considerations. So atorvastatin and rosuvastatin can be taken any time of the day. Most others must be taken in the evening. LFTs should be ordered prior to initiation of statin therapy as well. Drug interactions, the CP450 system. So those drugs are erythromycin, diltiazem, anything with the azoles. And it's contraindicated statins are inactive hepatitis as well as persistently elevated LFTs, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. Next, we'll go over nicotinic acid, which is niacin, B3. 
the mechanism is increasing HDL, so it dele delays the HDL clearance, also decreases hepatic production of LDL, and its precursor, VLDL. It also decreases triglycerides a little bit. But the big thing for niacin is the increasing in HDL. Adverse effects increase prostaglandins, so that's why we get that flushing, warm sensation with pruritus and headache. And we always want to know pre-treatment before niacin with aspirin or an NSAID can reduce the flushing, especially if given 30 minutes before giving the niacin. And hyperuricemia as well, remember your drugs that can predispose you to gout, DAN, diuretics, aspirin, and niacin. Also, um, GI symptoms if taken, GI symptoms are reduced if taken with food. Contraindications, peptic ulcer disease, active liver disease, and arterial bleeding. For fibrates, for fibrates, we have phenofibrate and gemfibrazil. The mechanism are inhibiting triglyceride synthesis, increasing the activity of lipoprotein lipase, which stimulates catabolism of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, increasing HDL synthesis and decreasing LDL synthesis. They're indicated as the best drug to decrease triglycerides. Adverse effects are, most importantly, increased gallstones. Also some GI side effects, some increased LFTs, some myositis as well, especially with concomitant statin use, it's important to know. But mostly to know those increased gallstones as a side effect of fibrates. The only um, fibrate FDA approved to use in combination with statin is the phenofibric acid. And again, contraindications have had a biliary disease, so anybody who has gallstones, as well as breastfeeding and severe renal disease, as well as adding gemfibrazil to repeglinide. So next will be the bile acid sequestrants. The bile acid sequestrants this will be the bile acid sequestrants. The bile acid sequestrants are cholestyramine, cholestipyl, and cholestevalin. The mechanism is a bile acid sequestrant, binding bile acids in the intestine and blocking, therefore, the enterohepatic reabsorption of the bile acids. This reduces the overall, overall cholesterol pool, lowering the intrahepatic cholesterol. So because the liver has to make new bile, it increases its LDL receptors, therefore decreasing the LDL levels. So in order for it to make new bile, it has to soak up what LDL it has. So therefore, increasing the receptors takes away the LDL from the blood to actually make those bile acids. Indications, often in combo with statins to reduce LDL levels, mild to moderate increases in HDL, and it's also safe in pregnancy. It's not systemically absorbed. So that's very important that the bile acid sequestrants are safe in pregnancy. And also, it's important to know cholestyramine can be used to treat pruritus associated with biliary obstruction. Adverse effects, increased triglyceride levels. So remember, this is actually the opposite of what we want. So this has an adverse side effect of increasing triglyceride levels with the bile acid sequestrants, and also osteoporosis with long-term use, and of course some GI upset as well. Interactions, they may impair the absorption of other medications, especially since it's being used in this way. Antibiotics, digoxin, warfarin, fat-soluble vitamins. Oh, now we'll go to ezetimibe, or ezetimibe. So ezetimibe is a inhibitor of cholesterol absorption in the intestine. It's indicated to add to a statin to reduce LDL as well. So next we'll move to infective endocarditis, a larger topic here. So infective endocarditis is an infection of the endothelium and the valves secondary to colonization during transient or persistent bacteremia. The mitral valve is the most commonly valve affected. So the mitral is the most common, then the aortic, then the tricuspid, then the pulmonary. The exception is IV drug use, where a tricuspid valve is the most common in IV drug users. Risk factors are an increased age, rheumatic heart disease, IV drug use, immunosuppression, prosthetic heart valves, and congenital heart disease. There's many different types of infective endocarditis. Importantly, acute bacterial endocarditis, infection of the normal valves with a virulent organism like Staph, Staph aureus, Subacute will be more likely to infect abnormal valves, and it's most likely a less virulent organism. So that would be strep viridens for less virulent in subacute. IV drug-related endocarditis, most commonly due to Staph aureus, especially MRSA, but also Pseudomonas. So remember, Pseudomonas can occur in IV drug users for endocarditis. However, Staph aureus is still the most common. And again, don't forget the tricuspid valve 
in IV drug users. And for prosthetic valve endocarditis, it can be early or late. If it's early, within 60 days of the repair, staph epidermidis is most common. So whenever you hear prosthetic, you want to think of staph epidermidis even for orthopedic implants as well. But especially for these prosthetic valves, um, endocarditis, staph epidermidis. If it's late, it may resemble native valve endocarditis as well. For the organisms, very important to know. Staph aureus is the most common cause of acute infective endocarditis, rapidly progressive. It affects the normal valves, however. So in regular acute, it's typically the normal valves. It's also the most common, as we said, in IV drug users. For strep viridans, it's the most common of subacute, and it affects the damaged valves. Viridans, strep viridans is part of the actual normal flora in our mouth. Um, it's associated with poor dentition as well as dental procedures. So if somebody has a dental procedure and then they're having endocarditis, it may be likely that it's strep viridans if it's more of a subacute course. Staphylococcus epidermidis, again, prosthetic valves. Enterococcus, especially seen in men over 50 with a recent history of GI or GU procedures. And then it's important to know our HASEC organisms. So our HASEC, H-A-C-E-K, organisms are Haemophilus afrophilus, Actinobacillus, Cardiobacterium homonymus, Iconella coridans, Kingella, as well. So these are gram-negative organisms, and they're classically known as hard to culture. So you want to suspect these if you have a negative blood culture already for endocarditis, and it's still high on your differential. So those are the HASEC organisms. Also, it's important to know strep bovis. Streptococcus bovis is especially common in patients with colon cancer or ulcerative colitis that develop endocarditis. So you want to consider strep bovis. Manifestations of endocarditis overall are constitutional symptoms. The persistent fever is the most common symptom. Malaise, fatigue, anorexia as well. Also a new onset murmur with worsening of an existing murmur as well. And Osler nodes, classically, Osler, ouch, so these are painful. Painful, tender, raised, violaceous nodules on the pads of the digits and the palm. So and the palm with Osler nodes and they hurt. They're seen on the thenar and hypothenar eminence. Janeway lesions are painless. Erythematous macules on the palms and soles. Splinter hemorrhages, linear reddish-brown lesions under the nail blood, bed, and petechiae. Also Roth spots, retinal hemorrhages with a central clearing, splenomegaly, splenomegaly, septic arterial or pulmonary emboli, and also glomerulonephritis could occur. So again, Osler nodes, which are painful, Janeway lesions, which are painless, splinter hemorrhages, Roth spots, and also splenomegaly, arterial and septic emboli, and glomerulonephritis. So continuing with endocarditis, we need to know how do we diagnose this. So it's important to know blood cultures should be done first, before antibiotic initiation, and it's important to know that three sets of blood cultures should be done at least one hour apart if the patient is stable, however. An EKG should be done at regular intervals to assess for new conduction abnormalities, as these patients are often prone to arrhythmias. An echocardiogram should be done. We should obtain a transthoracic echo first, and then after we can get a TEE, a transesophageal echo, if it's not quite diagnostic. And remember that TEE is much more sensitive than the TTE, about 90% to 50%. And we want to do this especially if the patient has a prosthetic valve too. So for labs, we'll get a CBC, which should show leukocytosis, anemia, anemia of chronic disease, potentially, an increased ESR, and potentially a rheumatic factor as well. And of course, it's very important to know the modified Duke criteria. So the Duke criteria has major and minor criteria. For major criteria, it's two things. Two things. So how do we diagnose it? Two major, or one major plus three minor, or five minor, which is only 80% accurate as well. So it can either be two major, or one major and three minor, or five minor, which is 80% accurate. So those two major criteria are a sustained bacteremia, two positive blood cultures by an organism known to cause endocarditis. So if it's not an organism known to cause endocarditis, it's not considered a major criteria. And that's two blood cultures. And that's two blood cultures. And also endocardial involvement. 
So endocardial involvement would be either a positive echo with a vegetation, an abscess, a valve perforation, or a prosthetic dehiscence from the prior surgery. And it has to be that clearly established new valvular regurge, aortic or mitral especially. And for the minor criteria, the minor criteria are predisposing conditions, so abnormal valves, intravenous drug abuse, indwelling catheters would be some of the examples, and also minor criteria would be a fever of over 38, 100.4, also vascular or embolic phenomenon like Janeway lesions, septic or arterial emboli, intracranial hemorrhage, immunologic phenomenon like Osler nodes, Roth spots, a positive rheumatoid factor, or an increased ESR, or an acute gomeonephritis. Positive blood cultures not meeting the major criteria, so that would be a organism not known to cause endocarditis, or a positive echo, but does not meet the major criteria. So, for instance, a worsening of an existing murmur. So again, one more time, for the major criteria, that's a sustained bacteremia that's known to cause endocarditis, and endocardial involvement of a new, new endocardial involvement overall. So, a couple things to know the indications for surgery in infective endocarditis. So, it would be in patients with refractory CHF, persistent or refractory infection, invasive infection, or prosthetic valve, or recurrent septic emboli, or important to know, fungal infections. So, I've gotten that as a question patient with infective endocarditis with a fungal infection, what's the treatment of choice? It's to go to surgery. So management of the infective endocarditis, we want to do empiric therapy, of course, after we do those three sets of blood cultures one hour apart, empiric therapy, and we have to know what kind of valve they have in order to treat them correctly. So if they have a native valve, we want to use an anti-staph penicillin, like nafcillin or oxacillin, plus ceftriaxone or gent. So ceftriaxone and gent are that gram-negative coverage, and nafcillin and oxacillin are gram-positive coverage. We can also do vanc, vancomycin, which can be substituted if the penicillin allergy is there or MRSA is suspected. Prosthetic valve, we can do VGR, is how I remember it, vanc, gent, and rifampin. So don't forget that rifampin. So if that's if they have a prosthetic valve, vanc, gent, and rifampin. If they have fungal, we can do amphotericin B, which is six to eight weeks long, or patients often need surgical intervention, as we said. Penicillin and vanc, great gram-positive coverage, as we said, and gent and ceftriaxone for the gram-negative. In acute endocarditis, antibiotics are started promptly after the culture data is in subacute endocarditis. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, antibiotics may be delayed in order to properly obtain the blood culture data, especially if prior treatments with antibiotics. We also want to adjust the antibiotic regimen based on the organism, culture, and sensitivity. And the fever, also we should educate the patient, may persist up to one week after the appropriate antibiotic therapy has been initiated. So it's not necessarily the best indicator of a remitting disease. Duration of the therapy is usually long, at four to six weeks as well. And aminoglycosides should only be used for the first two weeks of treatment. And it's also important to know the indications for endocarditis prophylaxis. If they have cardiac conditions, we can give them endocarditis prophylaxis, which is amoxicillin 2 grams 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure. Or it could be clinda if they have a penicillin allergy, which is 600 milligrams. So the cardiac conditions which are indicated for prophylaxis are prosthetic or artificial heart valves, heart repairs using prosthetic material, not including stents, however, prior history of endocarditis, congenital heart disease, and cardiac valvulopathy in a transplanted heart. So transplanted heart, prosthetic valves, heart repairs but not stents, history of endocarditis, and congenital heart disease. And a couple specific procedures to know, dental procedures involving manipulation of the gums, root of the teeth, oral mucosa, perforation, respiratory as well, especially rigid bronchoscopy, and also procedures involving infected skin or musculoskeletal tissues, including abscess and IND. And again, that's amoxicillin, 2 grams, 30 to 60 minutes before, or if they're allergic, clinda, 600 milligrams. Next, we'll go into Libman Sachs endocarditis. So, Libman Sachs endocarditis is a non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. 
in a non-infectious patient due to a sterile platelet thrombi depositing on the affected valve. It most commonly affects the mitral and aortic. So how I remember its cause is Libman Sachs endocarditis, LSE, is switched around and it's SLE. So it's most commonly seen in systemic lupus erythematosus. So LSC and SLE, also antiphospholipid syndrome, rheumatic fever, and malignancy, but predominantly SLE. Manifestations are typically asymptomatic, and uh, management is to manage the SLE, and they may need anticoagulation as well. So next we'll go into acute pericarditis. So acute pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardium, the outer layer of the heart, it could be fibrinous or serofibrinous, like in post-MI or infectious. And if it's serous pericarditis, it would be due to SLE and RA as well, if remembering serositis as a cause in the SOAP brain MD mnemonic for SLE, serositis. Etiologies are the two most common for pericarditis are idiopathic and viral, so especially viral meaning Coxsackie B virus and echovirus. And also we have to know Dressler syndrome. For a cause of acute pericarditis. This is post MI pericarditis, fever, and pleural infiltrates. Autoimmune, uremic, also in CKD, they can have a uremic pericarditis. Radiation, previous cancer treatment and chemo, as well as medications. Clinical manifestations will be chest pain, sudden onset of pleuritic, sharp and worse with inspiration, persistent and postural. Importantly to know, postural pain, worse when lying down and better when sitting forward. So a little bit better when leaning forward and worse when supine. The pain may radiate to the shoulder, back, or neck, and they also have a pericardial friction rub. So this is best heard at the end expiration while upright and leaning forward. So pericardial friction rub. Diagnostic studies, we want to do an EKG, and this is when we'll have the diffuse ST elevations in the precordial leads associated with PR depressions in those leads. So PR depressions, ST elevations diffusely. AVR is associated with the opposite, of course, PR elevations and ST depressions. So it's important to know that. They may have some troponin elevation as well. Echo is also useful to evaluate for associated pericardial effusion. So we'll typically have an effusion with that friction that's occurring between the pericardium and the myocardium. An effusion can gather there or signs of mm, impending cardiac tamponade as well. So we want to get an echo in these patients as well. So again, on the EKG, we'll see the knuckle sign, which in AVR, which is the P wave elevation in ST depressions. And then the rest of the leads, especially the precordial leads, we'll see those diffuse ST elevations. And then PR depressions concordantly with those. So the management of pericarditis, it's important to know. Anti-inflammatory meds, NSAIDs, or aspirin are first line for one to two weeks, and the symptoms usually take some time, one to two days, to even start to resolve. And you can also use colchicine as well, which is second line. For Dressler syndrome, again, post-MI pericarditis, fever and pleural effusion or infiltrates, you want to do aspirin or colchicine. Remember, colchicine inhibits uh, neutrophil migration, so we can't kind of mount that inflammatory response as much. So colchicine inhibits that. Next will be pericardial effusion. So with a pericardial effusion, it's an accumulation of fluid in the pericardial space. Normally the pericardial sac has 5 to 15 milliliters of fluid. And some of the etiologies are acute pericarditis as the most common. Viral, idiopathic, immune like SLE or RA. Viral again, Coxsackie B virus is the most common. Malignancy would be an exudative effusion, and lung cancer as well, especially small cell lung cancer. Breast cancer as well, aortic dissection or uremia, again, like from CKD. Clinical manifestations, chest pain, dyspnea fatigue, decreased or muffled heart sounds, it's important to know. The heart's further away, so it's going to be harder to hear it on auscultation. For diagnosis, echo is the test of choice, with increased fluid seen in the pericardial space. EKG, electrical alternance. This is very important to know, alternating amplitudes of the QRS complex. So bigger and smaller, alternating QRS complex. Low QRS voltage overall as well. So it's low QRS voltage and electrical alternance as well because 
the leads are further away physically from the heart and they have to conduct through the fluid. So we're likely going to see lower voltage on the EKG as well as the heart bobbing around in that fluid. So therefore it's going to be therefore not giving the lead um, the same path for each time it beats. Chest radiographs are typically not used. You may see the water bottle sign on a chest radiograph if you do have it, which is enlarging of the heart seen because of the effusion. And for management, it's important to treat the underlying cause. If it's acute pericarditis, serial echoes, and large effusions may need pericardiosynthesis for symptomatic relief. And of course, it's very important to know that the rate of accumulation in a pericardial effusion is much more important than the amount of fluid overall. So the rate of accumulation. We still need to allow the heart to physically fill, and if it fills too quickly in the pericardial space, then it's going to encroach upon the heart's ability to fill. So next we'll go into cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is a pleural effusion, but it's caused by significant pressure on the heart with impending cardiac filling and impending cardiac failure and impeding cardiac filling, leading to a decreased cardiac output and shock. So this is a medical emergency. This is actually an obstructive shock, not a cardiac shock. The rate of accumulation, as we said, of the fluid is more critical than the volume. A rapid accumulation of as much as or as little as 150 milliliters of fluid can cause tamponade, while as much as one liter can slowly accumulate if the pericardium is compliant over time. Etiologies, complications of acute pericarditis or trauma, and also malignancy is the most common cause of non-traumatic tamponade. And it's important to know that we have that um, right-sided diastolic filling abnormality because the right side is much more pliable and can easily be squished if there's more fluid outside of the heart. The classic Beck's triad is important to know for cardiac tamponade, distant muffled heart sounds, increased JVP, and systemic hypotension. So systemic hypotension because we're decreasing our overall stroke volume and heart rate. No blood's basically getting pumped into the aorta so we're going to have low blood pressure, increased JVP, the blood can't fill up in the right side of the heart, so the jugular venous distension is going to be there, and also muffled heart sounds because there's fluid around the heart, we can't again hear it well on auscultation. There'll also be pulsus paradoxus, so this is also important to know. Pulsus paradoxus in tamponade is an exaggerated over 10 millimeters of mercury decrease in systolic blood pressure with inspiration. So why this occurs is the interventricular septum actually pushes over into the left side, causing decreased outflow from the left side of the heart to the systemic circulation. So therefore, you'll have a transient decrease in blood flowing into the aorta, therefore more hypotensive. And this is due to, on inspiration, we have more filling into the right side of the heart. So that's going to bow out the, right, uh, the interventricular septum and push it more to the left side, causing that hypotension. On, we'll also see for clinical manifestations of dyspnea, fatigue, edema, as we said, shock as well, obstructive shock, reflex tacky in cool extremities. So for diagnostic studies, of course, we want to get an echo. We'll see the pericardial fusion and a diastolic collapse of the cardiac chambers. So very important, a diastolic collapse of the cardiac chambers. For EKG, signs of a pericardial fusion, as we said, the low QRS voltage and electrical alternans. Chest radiographs may be an enlarged cardiac silhouette, which is called the water bottle sign. And for right heart cath, that would be showing equalization of pressures in diastole. Management, immer uh, immediate pericardiosynthesis, so very emergently we need to take that fluid off of the heart to remove the pressure. Volume resuscitation and press presser support if needed. Pericardial window drainage if recurrent. So next we'll go into constrictive pericarditis. This will be a loss of pericardial elasticity due to fibrosis, calcification, and therefore thickening of the pericardium, leading to restriction of ventricular diastolic filling. Pathophys is fibrosis that limits ventricular filling, decreasing the stroke volume and cardiac output, Etiologies, any cause of acute pericarditis can also cause this over time. So recurrent pericarditis can lead to scarring and therefore constrictive pericarditis. It could also be idiopathic and viral, as we said, which are the most common. And importantly to know worldwide, the most common cause of constrictive pericarditis is tuberculosis. 
So tuberculosis worldwide, the most common cause of constrictive pericarditis. Manifestations very similar, dyspnea, fatigue, orthopnea, and we'll also have those right-sided heart failure signs with the increased JVD, jugular venous distension, which would lead to further backup, peripheral edema, edema, some nausea and vomiting. Why? Because all that fluid is engorging the veins around the stomach, not allowing the stomach to even fill as much, causing early satiety, nausea and vomiting. Also increased hepatojugular reflex. Kuzmal sign, the lack of inspiratory decline or an increase in JVP with inspiration. So that's kind of paradoxical. And if we compare that with pulsus paradoxus, we can understand both of those. So it will be a little bit different. Kuzmal sign is when we have an inspiration movement, we normally should get more right ventricular filling. However, we don't, and we get increased JVP instead. So it shows that there's a blockage on the right side of the heart coming from outside, in this case, constrictive pericarditis, which is inhibiting the filling, leading to that backup. And how that's different in pulsus paradoxus is during inspiration, we get that right-sided filling, and to compensate, it pushes over that interventricular septum, leading to that systemic hypotension. So these are kind of opposites in a way, pulsus paradoxus and Kuzmal's sign. Pericardial knock is also very important to know for constrictive pericarditis. This is a high-pitched diastolic sound similar to S3. So it's a sudden cessation of ventricular filling. So why is it a sudden cessation of ventricular filling? If there's a constrictive, basically, band around the heart, that's the constrictive pericardium, it's going to, stop, it's going to start filling until it completely stops because there's no pliability of the myocardium in that point. So you're going to have that pericardial knock in constrictive pericarditis. Diagnostic studies, chest radiograph, will show the calcification around the pericardium. can be seen in the lateral view. They'll also have clear lungs, and they may have the classic square root sign on cardiac cath. So square root sign on cardiac cath. Echocardiography, pericardial thickening or calcification. You want to rule out uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy as well. So these appear similar. However, with constrictive pericarditis, this is affecting the whole heart, whereas if you remember restrictive cardiomyopathy, this is just the ventricles, and then we have the atrial kind of ballooning out with restrictive cardiomyopathy. Also, we'll have the classic square root sign, as we said. So square root sign is early diastolic dip followed by plateaus of diastasis. CT scan or MRI is more sensitive than echo, and pericardial thickening or calcification will be seen. So for this, we can do pericardiectomy as definitive management, but otherwise we just do symptom control with diuresis. And you want to manage the edema and uh, venous pressure as well, so diuresis will help that as well. So just to go quickly through some of the important signs to know for constrictive pericarditis again. Decrease in diastolic filling, the Kuzmal sign, the increased JVD, the pericardial knock, the square root sign, and the pericardial thickening or calcification. And to differentiate it again from restrictive cardiomyopathy, in restrictive cardiomyopathy, the atria are not affected. They're ballooning out because it's just the de depositions in the ventricles. But here, it's the whole pericardium that's becoming calcified. So everything's going to be constricted. So that's constrictive pericarditis. Next, we'll So now we'll go into murmurs. So cardiac murmurs, it's important to know for one thing, the difference in the sounds. So a harsh or rumbling sound, you want to think in stenosis, aortic or mitral stenosis, which is an abnormal forward, forward flow of blood through the stenotic valve that should be open. The stenotic lesions lead to a pressure overload behind it. Regurgitation leads to a volume overload. If you hear a blowing sound, you want to think regurgitation. Aortic regurge or mitral regurge, which is an abnormal backflow of blood, regurgitation through an incompletely closed valve. And regurgitation again leads to a volume overload. So we'll go into some of the important to know murmur accentuation maneuvers. So position will affect it, especially for the aortic valve. Sitting up and leaning forward is the best way to accentuate the aortic valve, aortic stenosis and regurge. And for the mitral valve, we want to do the left lying decubitus position. Lying on the left side accentuates the mitral valve, so mitral stenosis and mitral regurge as well. If we want to increase the venous return, this is going to have some effects on murmurs as well. So an increased venous return increases all murmurs and leads to an opening snap too on the left and the right side. 
So increase in venous return would be like leg raising, also lying down and squatting. Squatting, interestingly, increases venous return. So how I think of this is when you squat down, the muscles in your legs contract and push more venous return into your heart. That's how I think about it. And of course, leg raise, you're just straight up dumping the blood into the right side of the heart. And lying down, of course, decreases your vascular resistance throughout the body. So some of the exceptions to increased venous return are a decreased murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and delayed ejection click as well. So decreased hokum and delayed ejection click, decreased prolapse in a shorter murmur duration of MVP, mitral valve prolapse. Decreased venous return, decreased venous return, valsalva or standing. So valsalva decreases venous return because we're increasing our intra-abdominal pressure, which essentially closes off some of the inferior vena cava return to the heart. And also standing, because as we stand, gravity pulls down all the blood, leading to a harder time for the blood to actually get back to our heart. So decreased venous return decreases all murmurs, except hokum and early ejection click, which is increased in prolapse of uh, mitral valve. So mitral valve prolapse and hokum as well are exceptions to the decrease of venous return. Inspiration. Inspiration increases the venous return on the right side, as we stated earlier. So when we take a deep breath in, the right atrium and thus right ventricle have more filling and an increase in heart rate as well. And inspiration decreases venous return on the left side. So again, it pushes over that interventricular septum so that we have less flow coming out of that side. So therefore, in insp during inspiration, we're going to have a decrease in all murmurs and opening snap on the left side. For expiration, expiration increases the venous return on the left side. Increasing all murmurs and opening snap on the left side and delaying the ejection click also on the left side. Also, left-sided murmurs are heard best after maximal expiration. So on expiration, that left slide accentuation. For hand grip, so we need to know a few things about the hand grip. It's important to know that it increases afterload, compressing the arteries in the upper extremity. So as we clamp down those arteries, the afterload is more pressure. We have more to pump against in order to get to those vessels, leading to a decreased of left ventricular emptying, which is a decreased forward flow and an increased backward flow. So this would increase murmurs such as aortic regurgitation, for instance. And it uh, outflow murmurs like aortic stenosis and hokum and MVP decrease with hand grip. Why? Because there's increased filling. So hokum is going to have less of a sound. Mitral valve prolapse is going to have less of a sound as well. And same for aortic stenosis. And also hand grip and amyl nitrate, which is a vasodilator, are the only maneuvers that affect hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and aortic stenosis in the same direction. So both maneuvers affect afterload and forward flow. So because the hand grip increases afterload, the increased afterload prevents blood from being ejected from the ventricles, lessening the blood flowing through the stenotic aortic valve and less blood ejected into the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Regurgitant murmurs like aortic and mitral regurg increase with hand grip due to the increased backward flow. Stenosis increases due to the increase in afterload. And for amyl nitrate, this decreases afterload, direct arterial vasodilation of the aorta, leading to an increased left ventricular emptying, increases forward flow, and decreases flow of the blood. So, of course, therefore, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and uh, mitral valve prolapse, both are in the same direction. So those are going to increase with the amyl nitrate because there's less blood in the ventricle. And also it's going to decrease the murmurs that are regurgitant as well. So this is also why afterload reducers like ACE inhibitors are used in the management of aortic regurg and mitral regurg. So first we'll go into aortic stenosis. So aortic stenosis, the pathophysiology is a left ventricular outflow obstruction leading to a fixed cardiac output, increasing afterload, and increasing left ventricular hypertrophy, and eventually the left ventricular will fail. Most common is valvular disease, and symptoms usually occur when the orifice is under 1 cm squared. Normal is about 3 to 4 cm squared. Etiologies are typically mostly degenerative for aortic stenosis, with calcifications and wear and tear over time, especially when the patient's over 70 years old. 
It could also be congenital and bicuspid as well. It's common in patients under 70 years old. So remember that congenitally bicuspid um, aortic valve in the coarctation of the aorta too is like 70% are concordantly those two things. Rheumatic heart disease as well may be isolated or accompanied with aortic regurge. Clinical manifestations of stenosis, aortic stenosis, are SAD, S-A-D, syncope, angina, and dyspnea. Angina is the most common. And these things can also predict how long the patient has left. So if they start to have angina, they typically have about five years left. If they have syncope, they typically have about three. And if they have CHF, they typically have about two. So syncope, angina, and dyspnea. Clinical manifestations, this is a systolic crescendo-decrescendo murmur heard best at the right upper sternal border, radiating to the carotid arteries. It increases the murmur intensity while sitting and leaning forward, and also increased venous return will lead to an increased aortic stenosis like squatting, also being supine, and leg raise. Expiration as well. Remember, it's on that left side, so expiration will increase it. And uh, remember, as we said, squatting, the legs contract, push more blood back to the heart, so we have increase. What decreases the murmur intensity is decreasing the venous return to the left side. So valsalva or standing as we decrease the return. Also inspiration. Remember, inspiration increases the return to the right side of the heart. So therefore, bowing out the interventricular septum to the left side. And also hand grip, of course, where it increases that afterload, increases the aorta basically clamping down, not allowing more blood to flow out in comparison to not doing that. And also, classically for aortic stenosis, we'll have a weak, delayed carotid pulse. This is called pulsus parvus et tardis, so weak and delayed. So it's a tardy pulse, kind of. Narrow pulse pressure as well. So that's important, narrow pulse pressure with aortic stenosis and a wide pulse pressure with aortic regurge. So narrow with aortic stenosis and wide with regurge. And for diagnostic studies, echo is the first and best test. We'll see that small aortic orifice under one centimeter, where it typically is three to four, left ventricular hypertrophy, thickening, or a calcific aortic valve. On EKG, we should see LVH, left atrial enlargement as well, as it tries to push into the LVH, and also AFib potentially. AFib is a risk factor when we have left atrial enlargement. As the left atrium is ballooning out, the desmosomes and the intercalated discs of the myocytes are getting further and further apart. Therefore, the electrical impulse through them is going to have to jump further places, and that leads to more error. So we have a risk of AFib and other arrhythmias when we have left atrial enlargement. For chest radiograph, it will be nonspecific findings. For cardiac cath, this is definitive, and it may be used only prior to surgery. For management of aortic stenosis, of course, surgery. Aortic valve replacement only is the effective treatment. So that's the treatment of choice, aortic valve replacement. Indications for the aortic valve replacement, AVR, are symptomatic aortic stenosis, or asymptomatic with a very low ejection fraction, or a orifice under 0.6 centimeters squared. And there's two options we can do for the aortic, aortic valve repair. It can be mechanical or bioprosthetic. For mechanical, it's more prolonged in durability, but it's more thrombogenic as well, increased risk of bleeding and strokes, and they have to be placed on long-term anticoagulation. And remember, we're going to bump up that INR when we have that mechanical, mechanical valve. To, instead of 2 to 3, it's 2.5 to 3.5. So for mechanical valve, prolonged durability, but more thrombogenic. And for bioprosthetic, it's less durable, it lasts less long, lasts shorter duration, but it's minimally thrombogenic. It's usually used in patients that are not candidates for anticoagulation, especially long-term. And this is a porcine valve. We can also do percutaneous aortic valvuloplasty, PAV. This results in a 50% increase in the aortic orifice volume area, but 50% restenosis in 6 to 12 months. So it's more used as a bridge to the aortic valve repair in a patient that's not technically a surgical candidate at the moment. So that's the percutaneous aortic valvuloplasty. An intraaortic balloon pump can be used for a temporary stabilization as a bridge to a valve replacement, and medical therapy is not really effective. Severe aortic stenosis prior to surgery should avoid physical exertion and venodilators as well, such as nitrates and negative inotropes like calcium channel blockers or beta blockers, 
These are dependent because these patients are dependent on the preload to maintain the cardiac output. Aortic regurgitation, or also called aortic insufficiency, will be next. So aortic regurg is incomplete aortic valve closure, leading to left ventricular volume overload with eventual left ventricular dilation and heart failure. It could be acute or chronic. Acute is like an acute MI, aortic dissection, or endocarditis as well, can lead to pulmonary edema. Chronic could be an aortic dilation. Marfan syndrome, where the annulus starts to bow out because they have a connective tissue disease. So Marfan syndrome and chronic. Also inflammatory disorders, if you remember aortitis in SLE and RA. Rheumatic fever, also syphilis, and hypertension. So classically on physical exam, this will be a diastolic, blowing, decrescendo murmur, heard best at the left upper sternal border. It's very high pitched, so that's aortic regurge. Increased murmur intensity, sitting while leaning forward, increased venous return, squatting, supine, leg raise, expiration, and hand grip. So for hand grip, if we have that increased afterload, it's going to be just pushing more blood back into the left ventricle through the regurgitant aortic valve. And if we want to decrease the murmur intensity, we'll see things that decrease venous return, so less blood going through. So therefore, less blood can regurgitate back, valsalva and standing. Inspiration also, as we remember, inspiration increases on the right side, decreases on the left side, and male nitrate increases the afterload. And remember Austin Flint murmur. So Austin Flint murmur is in aortic regurg. This is a mid-late diastolic rumble at the apex secondary to a regurgitant jet competing with the anterograde flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle. So an Austin Flint murmur is basically while the left atrium is trying to push through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, the blood's also regurgitating at the same time through the regurgitant aortic valve and they're combining. So they're forming kind of both regurgitant jets and combining in there. So that's the Austin Flint murmur. You also have bounding pulses due to the increased stroke volume. Pulsus bispherines can also be seen, especially with combined aortic stenosis and regurge, or severe aortic regurge. So how do we have aortic stenosis and aortic regurge combined? Is that it's typically that calcified valve, so it doesn't move either way a lot. So it could crack open, and that would be the stenosis, but it doesn't also shut fully because it's so stenosed. So we have aortic stenosis and regurge. And classically, a wide pulse pressure. So why do we have a wide pulse pressure? If we measure the pressure, the blood pressure, in the aorta with aortic regurge, we'll see that we'll have a very low diastolic because all that blood during diastole is just flowing right back through the aortic valve into the left ventricle. And during systole, we have much more blood that's now came from the mitral and from the aortic valve as regurgitin, and it's pumping much more blood through the aorta. So we're going to have an increase in that systolic and a decrease in the diastolic. So it'll be a bounding pulse and a wide gap between the systole and diastole. And there's also so many signs of this wide pulse pressure that we need to know for aortic regurge. There's the water hammer pulse. How I remember this is water hammer is wrist. So this is, will be a swift upstroke and a rapid fall of the radial pulse accentuated with wrist elevation. So water hammer is wrist. Corrigan's pulse is the carotids, so Corrigan, carotid, that's how I remember that one. This is similar to the water hammer, but referred specifically to the carotid artery. We have hill sign, how I remember hill sign is popliteal, so popliteal has two L's and hill has two L's, so hill sign is that the popliteal artery systolic pressure is greater than the brachial artery systolic by 60 millimeters of mercury. This is actually the most sensitive sign as well, the hill sign. We have Dura-Z's sign. This is over the femoral artery, systolic and diastolic ruiz. We have De Musset's sign, head bobbing with each heartbeat. So De Musset, I think of music, so like head bobbing to music. Musset, M-U-S-S, -S, music. So De Musset is head bobbing to music or with each heartbeat. You have Mueller's sign. I remember Mueller is the uvula, so Mueller, uvula kind of. So Mueller and uvula. This is visible pulsations during systole of the uvula. And then we have, of course, Quinky's pulse. And this is easy to remember, Quinky in the pinky. <laughs> so fingernail bed pulsations with light compression of the fingernail bed. So Quinky's pulses are in the pinky as well.
So diagnosis, we need to see an echocardiogram for that regurgitant jet, which is that Austin Flint murmur, as we said. Cardiac cath is definitive, potentially prior to surgery. We want to do afterload reduction for management. How do we reduce the afterload by ACE inhibitors, ARBs, nifedipine, and hydralazine as calcium channel blockers to dilate the aorta and afterload? And for surgical therapy, this is definitive. It's indicated in acute, such as in an MI, where it just kind of breaks, or, uh, or symptomatic aortic regurge, or with left ventricular decompensation as well. So now we'll go into mitral stenosis. So mitral stenosis, the pathophys is an obstruction of flow from the left atrium to left ventricle, secondary to a narrowed mitral orifice. Blood backs up into the left atrium. So due to the left atrial pressure that's been increased, we have some volume overload leading to pulmonary congestion, pulmonary hypertension, and CHF as a result. Etiologies, especially rheumatic heart disease congenitally, is very important. It's almost always the cause of mitral stenosis, rheumatic heart disease. It's most common in the third to fourth decade of life as well. It could be congenital, it could be a left atrial myxoma, which is like a bobbing tumor in the left atrium, or it could be a valvulitis, such as SLE, amyloid, or carcinoid as well. Clinical manifestations, um, slow progression until symptoms occur, then the progression becomes rapid. And pulmonary symptoms, dyspnea, pulmonary edema, hemoptysis, very important. So hemoptysis, those lungs are engorged and some of those small capillaries can break. And we can start vomiting up the, that blood. So hemoptysis and mitral stenosis is important to know. Frequent, bonk, frequent bronchitis, pulmonary hypertension, if rheumatic in origin, symptoms usually begin in the 20s and 30s. Importantly to know AFib, secondary to atrial enlargement and thromboembolic disease. So we said why AFib due to the left atrial enlargement can be caused. And not only because the dilation between the intercalated discs causing um, decreasing the ability to conduct the impulses, but also because there's more space for that blood to pool in that area. So that's the AFib in mitral stenosis. And then, of course, right-sided failure due to prolonged pulmonary hypertension. And mitral facies. Mitral facies is a ruddy or a flush cheeks with facial pallor. This is due to the chronic hypoxia. So mitral facies in mitral stenosis. And also signs of left atrial enlargement, dysphagia, esophageal compression, and also Ortner's syndrome, which is recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy due to compression by the dilated left atrium, hoarseness. So remember that left, uh, recurrent left laryngeal nerve actually comes down and loops under the aorta and comes close to that left atrium. So if we're having a dilated left atrium that could compress upon that, and that nerve is the one that controls the voice. So we have hoarseness as a result. Physical exam of mitral stenosis, prominent S1, forced closure of the mitral valve, opening snap as well, forced opening of the mitral valve. So it's like stuck shut and then it takes a large atrial contraction to snap it open. Also a loud P2 due to the pulmonary hypertension, as we remember. So the pulmonary hypertension, basically an increased pulmonary pressure, pushing back on that valve, snapping it shut. You'll have a low pitched mid diastolic rumbling murmur heard at the apex, and to increase the murmur intensity of mitral stenosis, you want to put them in the left lateral decubitus position. Also, of course, expiration, if we're trying to hear that left-sided murmur. Isometric exercise, increased venous return, like squatting, leg raise, and lying supine. To decrease the murmur intensity, just the opposite, decreasing the venous return with valsalva or standing, or inspiration. Remember, inspiration increases the right-sided. And increased severity of mitral stenosis. <laughs> increased severity of mitral stenosis will have a shorter A2 to OS duration and a prolonged murmur duration. So a shorter um, aortic valve closure to opening snap duration. And for diagnosis, left atrial enlargement, P waves greater than three millimeters, biphasic P waves in V1 and V2, and atrial fibrillation can occur. Diagnosis, we want to look on EKG, and they'll have signs of right ventricular hypertrophy um, with right axis deviation and pulmonary hypertension. We'll also see that left atrial enlargement. And remember, when we see the left atrial enlargement, we want to look at that P wave. So the P wave will be larger than 3 millimeters and biphasic because it takes time to get to the S from the SA node in the right atrium to the left atrium on that other side. 
So it's going to be biphasic, especially in leads V1 and V2. And of course, as we said, we could see AFib as well on EKG. Echo, however, for mitral stenosis is the most useful non-invasive tool. We could also do a chest radiograph. We'll be uh, left atrial enlargement and also posterior displacement of the esophagus as well. And cardiac cath is the most accurate, but rarely done. For management of mitral stenosis, we want to do percutaneous balloon valvuloplasty. This is the best treatment for symptomatic mitral stenosis in younger patients with non-calcified valves or refractory to medical management. We could do a mitral valve replacement, or we could do medical management as well with diuretics and sodium restriction. And also, of course, we want to treat the comorbid comorbidities of AFib with beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and anticoagulation if they do have AFib. Next, we'll go into mitral regurgitation. So mitral regurgitation is an increase in backflow from the left ventricle to the left atrium, leading to left atrial dilation and increased pulmonary pressure. So similar findings to mitral stenosis, however a bit different here. Etiologies, leaflet abnormalities, mitral valve prolapse is the most common cause of mitral regurg. Also rheumatic fever, the most common cause in developing countries, could also be endocarditis, valvulitis, annulus dilation. So the annulus is the ring that basically starts the valve right around the circular ring. This, and this could be dilated in things like Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos or even PCKD. So polycystic kidney disease could lead to that dilated annulus. Also, of course, papillary muscle dysfunction, myocardial ischemia, infarction, ruptured chordae tendineae, collagen and vascular disease, or dilated cardiomyopathy as well could lead to that progressive dilation of the annulus as well. So it could be very acute too for mitral regurg if a chordae tendineae ruptures after being weakened in that area that had an infarct, that could be an acute mitral regurg. Clinical manifestations, chronic would be heart failure symptoms, dyspnea, AFib, hemoptysis. Acute would be pulmonary edema and hypotension. If your physical exam of mitral regurg, blowing, hollow systolic murmur, blowing, hollow systolic murmur, best heard at the apex which, with radiation to the axilla. It's high pitched. Increased murmur intensity, in the left lateral decubitus position, expiration, isometric exercises, increasing venous return, as we said, squatting, leg raise, lying supine, and hand grip. If we want to decrease the murmur intensity of mitral regurg, then we want to decrease the venous return through valsalva and standing, inspiration, and male nitrate. And classically for mitral regurg is a widely split S2, laterally displaced PMI, and S3, and a soft S1 if severe. For diagnosis, echocardiogram, most useful non-invasive test, hyperdynamic left ventricle and a regurgitant jet flowing from the left ventricle to the left atrium. EKG will be more non-specific with left atrial enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy as it has to supply blood through the aorta and back to the left atrium, and AFib, chest radiograph, non-specific, left atrial enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy, pulmonary edema. Med uh, management. Medical management, you want to symptom, do symptom control with afterload reducers like ACE, ARBs, um, nitrates, diuretics. Surgical, repairs preferred over replacement. So indicated if the ejection fraction is 60% or less, or they're refractory to therapy. Next we'll go to mitral valve prolapse. So mitral valve prolapse, MVP. This is when the leaflets of the mitral valve bulge or prolapse into the left atrium during, during systole, so left ventricular contraction. Mitral valve prolapse is the most common cause of mitral regurg in the U.S., and it's more common in young women as well, 15 to 35. And it's seen also in 2-5% two, two to of the population. So the etiologies most commonly are myxomatous degeneration of the mitral valve, and of course connective tissue disorders like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Marfan syndrome, osteogenesis imperfecta as well. Clinical manifestations, mostly asymptomatic, but they could have the classic autonomic dysfunction. So basically, very sympathetic here. Um, anxiety, atypical chest pain, panic attacks, also palpitations and arrhythmias, syncope, dizziness. So a lot of sympathetic and panic type symptoms for that autonomic dysfunction in MVP. Symptoms are associated with mitral valve or mitral regurgitation progression, not commonly though, and strokes are very rare. Physical exam may have a narrow AP diameter, especially due to their history if it's Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos. 
low body weight, hypotension, pectus, pectus excavatum. So remember that for Marfan's. Mid to late systolic ejection click, best heard at the apex, and may be associated with a uh, mid-late systolic murmur. Any maneuvers that make the left ventricular smaller, decreasing the preload, result in an earlier click and a longer murmur duration, valsalva or standing, due to increased prolapse. Same for hokum. So MVP and hokum, same direction. Maneuvers that make the left ventricular bigger, increasing the preload, result in a delayed click and shorter murmur duration, squatting, leg raise, supine, due to decreased prolapse. So we're going to have a louder murmur when there's less ventricular filling due to a larger area and more space for the during systole blood to traverse and splash up against the prolapsed mitral valve. If it's less sound it's going to be a more full left ventricle because there's less space for it to traverse during systole and splash up against the mitral valve. So more space for it to go therefore a left a less filled ventricle is going to be a louder murmur. So anything that decreases that left ventricular size results in an earlier click and a longer murmur duration. So diagnosis is by echo, posterior bulging leaflets with tissue redundancy, so too much tissue. Management, reassurance in most patients, MVP is, has a good prognosis. You could do beta blockers, but only in patients with autonomic dysfunction as well. So if they have that autonomic dysfunction, we can give them a beta blocker. And endocarditis prophylaxis is not needed in MVP. And remember what it is needed for congenital heart disease, prior endocarditis, valve prosthesis, cardiac transplantations, etc. So next will be pulmonic stenosis. So pulmonic stenosis is a right ventricular ventricle. So pulmonic stenosis is a right ventricular outflow obstruction of blood across the pulmonic valve. It's almost always congenital in a disease of the young, such as in congenital rubella syndrome. They'll have a harsh mid-systolic ejection, crescendo decrescendo murmur, maximally heard at the left upper sternal border radiating to the neck. The murmur increases with inspiration, more flow to that side, and longer murmur duration increases the stenosis. Systolic ejection click, you'll often hear a buried S1, wide split S2, a delayed P2, and you may have an S4 as well due to that hypertrophy. Management is balloon valvuloplasty. For pulmonic regurgitation, PR, is always congenital as well. Pulmonic hypertension, tetralogy of Fallot, endocarditis, rheumatic heart disease, and this is retrograde blood flow from the pulmonary artery into the right ventricle, leading to a right-sided volume overload. Clinical manifestations, mostly clinically insignificant. If it is significant, there'll be right-sided failure symptoms backing up into the roads or the systemic circulation. And one thing we need to know about is the gram steel murmur. The gram steel murmur in pulmonic regurge is a brief decrescendo early diastolic murmur at the left upper sternal border, second left intercostal space with full inspiration. So full inspiration, bringing more blood, increasing the heart rate to that right side of the heart, will be a gram steel murmur, and it's that decrescendo early diastolic murmur in pulmonic regurge. It increases in augmented murmur with increased venous return, squatting, supine, especially inspiration, and again decrease the murmur with decreased venous return, valsalva, standing, and expiration. No treatment is needed in most with pulmonic regurge. Next will be tricuspid stenosis. So tricuspid stenosis is blood backing up into the right atrium, increasing the right atrial enlargement, and leading to right-sided heart failure. Mid-diastolic murmur for tricuspid stenosis at the left lower sternal border, the xiphoid fourth intercostal space. Increasing the intensity would be increased venous return, of course, in inspiration. Opening snap could be occurring. OS usually occurs later than the opening snap of mitral stenosis. Tricuspid regurge, lastly. Tricuspid regurge is a holosystolic blowing high-pitched murmur at the sub area, the left sternal border. You'll have classically Carvalho sign for tricuspid regurge. Carvalho sign is an increased murmur intensity with inspiration. Due to the increased right-sided blood flow during inspiration, which we already know, helps to distinguish tricuspid regurge from mitral regurge. And you may have a pulsatile liver as well from all that backflow. 
So Carvalho sign is increased murmur intensity with inspiration. Even so, we can see the Carvalho sign in many more things when we talked about increased murmur intensity with inspiration for right-sided heart uh, murmurs, but Carvalho sign specifically for tricuspid regurg as well. Next will be triple A, abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is a focal aortic dilation over 1.5 times normal, which is over 3.0 centimeters, which is considered aneurysmal. And also it's important to know infrarenal is the most common site, infrarenal. The pathophys is proteolytic degradation of the aortic wall and the connective tissue leading to inflammation in the area and ballooning out. So proteolytic degradation. Smoking is important to know is the main risk factor, the most important and the most modifiable risk factor. And also older men is common too, and Caucasians, hyperlipidemia, atherosclerosis, connective tissue disorders like Marfan's, syphilis, and hypertension. But the most important overall for AAA is smoking. Protective factors are female, diabetes, interestingly, non-Caucasian race, and moderate alcohol consumption, interestingly. And remember, inferrenal is the most common site. Clinical manifestations, mostly asymptomatic, may be found incidentally on imaging or patients with an abdominal brewery or palpable abdominal mass. Symptomatic, unruptured. Patients present with abdominal flank or back pain. On exam, they may have an abdominal brewery that may be auscultated, and a palpable abdominal mass may also be palpated. For symptomatic and ruptured, this is an emergency, of course. They'll be hypotensive or syncope. Flank ecchymosis could be seen. It might be an abdominal brewery, a pulsatile mass, abdominal or flank pain. And of course, a symptomatic ruptured, AAA, is, an, is a medical emergency. It also could be from an aortoenteric fistula. This is most commonly in the duodenum. And it presents in an acute GI bleed in patients who underwent prior aortic grafting. The diagnosis is by CT with IV contrast. This is the best initial test in symptomatic, hemodynamically stable patients to determine the size, presence, and extent of the aneurysm. Focused bedside ultrasound may be the initial study of choice in a hemodynamically unstable patient with the suspected AAA. So CT is quick, however, and a bedside ultrasound is quicker. So if we suspect it's actually ruptured, we just want to get a quick ultrasound just to see if it is. So these people are going to need immediate management. Patients with a known AAA who present with classic symptoms or signs of rupture can be taken to the OR immediately for surgical repair without preoperative imaging. Asymptomatic or, or suspected AAA, you want to do that ultrasound. This is the initial test in the asymptomatic patient to monitor progression as well. Management, symptomatic or ruptured, immediate surgical repair endovascular stent, graft, or open repair, beta blockers to reduce the shearing force, as well as decreasing the expansion and rupture. So it's, an, it's very important to know, and this is highly tested, the abdominal aortic aneurysm screenings. So how do we screen for this? You should do a one-time screening via abdominal ultrasound, not CT, ultrasound in men 65 to 75 who have ever smoked. So even if they've only smoked one pack here, they still get this 65 to 75 one time abdominal ultrasound in men who have ever smoked. So it's important to know the progression and how we monitor it as well. So if the aneurysm is 3 to 4 centimeters, you want to monitor by ultrasound every year annually. If it's 4 to 4.5 centimeters, we want to monitor by ultrasound every 6 months. If it's over 4.5 centimeters, we want to do a vascular surgery referral. And if it's over 5.5 or if it's over 0.5 centimeters expansion in six months' time, we want to do immediate surgical repair, even if it's asymptomatic, symptomatic, or in patients with an acute rupture. So if, even if it's expanded quickly and it's asymptomatic, we still want to do that repair because obviously if it ruptures, that would be catastrophic. So three to four centimeters, again, monitor every year, four to 4.5 every six months, over 4.5, referral to vascular surgery, over 5.5, or over 0.5 centimeter expansion in six months, immediate surgical repair. And remember that screening one more time, one time screening via abdominal ultrasound in men age 65 to 75 years of age who have ever smoked. So now we'll go to aortic dissection. So aortic dissection is a tear through the innermost layer of the aorta, the intima, 
the tunica intima, due to a cystic medial necrosis. Ascending is most common near the aortic arch or the left subclavian. This is about 65%. 20% are also descending, and 10% are in the aortic arch. And the ascending is the highest mortality. So this makes sense. The highest mortality would be ascending, not only because it's quicker right off the start of the aorta, the higher pressure, but also because this goes into the carotid arteries to the brain first. So we need to perfuse the brain. If the tear is more distal, then we're still perfusing the brain a bit, and just our lower extremity and uh, lower whole part of the body is going to have less blood. But the brain is most important in this case, of course. So, in ascending, like we said, highest mortality. Risk factors, hypertension is the most important. So, in triple A, smoking was the most important, but in aortic dissection, hypertension is the most important. So, also age over 50 and 20 to 30 in patients with Marfan syndrome, also patients that are manned. Also in men, vasculitis, trauma, family history, Turner syndrome, and collagen disorders. Again, Ehlers-Danlos, Marfan syndrome, PCKD. Manifestations will be chest pain, a sudden onset of severe tearing, ripping, knife-like characteristics. Very characteristic of aortic dissection to have that severe tearing, ripping, or knife-like upper chest or back pain that may radiate between the scapulae. So it's in, you can actually tell where the dissection is in an estimation based on where the pain is. So here, if you have an ascending aorta tear, you're going to have that anterior chest pain. So this is typically a Stanford type A or a DeBakey type 1 or 2, that you'll have that anterior chest pain. If you have it in the, in, in the aortic arch, you'll have it in the neck and jaw, the pain. So aortic arch for the neck and jaw, and this would still be a Stanford type A, but potentially a DeBakey type 2. And if you have it in the descending aorta, this is when you'll have that interscapular pain, especially with a DeBakey 3 and a Sanford B, and this is distal again. So you'll also have unequal blood pressure in both arms. This will be a variation in pulse and blood pressure over 20 millimeters of mercury difference between the right and left arms, and also decreased peripheral pulses in the radial, carotid, or femoral as well. They may be hypertensive or hypo, they may have back pain, spine ischemia, altered mental status, new onset aortic regurg, if ascending as well. For diagnosis, there's many things you can do, but you should do CT angiogram. You could also do an MR angiogram if there's time, and a transesophageal echo are the most commonly used first-line imaging modalities for a suspected aortic dissection. So that's CT angiogram, MRA, and TEE, or TTE. Chest radiograph, a widened mediastinum is classic. You'll see that intimal layer ballooned out. So the widened mediastinum on radiograph. It may be normal in 10%, so a normal chest x-ray does not rule out a dissection. For management, you can do surgical or medical management. It's important to know which one to do in which case. So for surgical management of the dissection, this is used in an acute proximal tear. So that's a Stanford type A, a DeBakey type 1 or 2. or acute distal with complications like vital organ involvement, impending rupture as well. Pre-op blood pressure control as well should be done. And that's for surgical management. For medical management, this would be more if it's a descending aorta or a distal aortic dissection. This would be a Stanford type B or a DeBakey 3. In this case, you'll do non-selective beta blockers like labetalol with sodium nitroprusside added if needed. So you can actually add labetalol plus the sodium nitroprusside. And you remember, for CL, carvedilol, and labetalol, care less with receptors. They affect alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2. So we use labetalol in this acute aortic dissection for medical management if it's a descending, a Stanford B, or a DeBakey 3. And again, systolic blood pressure is rapidly lowered to a goal of 100 over 120 within 20 minutes. So that's, that one that's the one of the three indications for this type of management in a hypertensive emergency such as this. And to go over the classification more formally, the aortic dissection classification, type 1 DeBakey, originates in the ascending aorta, propagates at least to the aortic arch, and often beyond it distally. Type 2 DeBakey originates in and is confined to the ascending aorta. Type 3 DeBakey originates in the descending aorta, rarely extends proximally, but will extend distally, of course. 
and then to Stanford. So we have Stanford A and B. Stanford A involves the ascending aorta and the aortic arch and possibly the descending aorta. Stanford B involves just the descending aorta, distal to left subclavian artery origin, without involvement of the ascending aorta or the aortic arch. So those are your aortic dissection classifications. Next we'll go to peripheral arterial disease, PAD. So this is atherosclerotic disease of the arteries of the lower extremities. Intermittent claudication is the most common symptom. This is lower extremity pain with any type of exercise or even ambulation. And the vessels involved in the area of claudication and the percentage we'll go over. So if it's at the aortic bifurcation or the common iliac, they'll have buttock, hip, and groin pain. And this will be about 25 to 30%. So with this, it's important to know Lariche syndrome. So Lariche syndrome is three things. It's claudication of the buttocks or thigh, impotence, and decreased femoral pulses. So claudication, buttocks or thigh pain, impotence, and decreased femoral pulses. So that's the Lariche syndrome. If it's at the femoral artery or its branches, this would be the thigh or upper calf. And this is about 80 to 90% actually. And this includes the popliteal artery as well. So femoral or popliteal artery, is, which includes the lower calf, ankle, and foot, which is also 80 to 90%. So just to go through it one more time, characterized within that 80 to 90% is thigh, upper calf, lower calf, ankle, and foot. And this is femoral artery, popliteal artery, or its branches. And if it's just confined to the foot, it's tibial or peroneal arteries, and that's about 40 to 50%. And don't forget that Lariche syndrome, claudication, impotence, and decreased femoral pulses. They could also have ischemic breast pain. This would be in very advanced disease as well, though. And it's most common at night and relieved with foot dependency. So when we put our foot on the ground, gravity pulls more blood through those congested arteries. Physical exam for the pulses will see decreased or absent pulses. We'll also see breweries if there's over 50% occlusion. And of course, decreased cap refill. For the skin, we'll see many atrophic skin changes, muscle atrophy, thin, shiny skin, hair loss, thickened nails, cool limbs, and areas of necrosis. Ulcers, especially on the lateral malleolus. So remember the medial is peripheral vascular disease, and lateral is peripheral arterial disease. For, on the, for color, we'll see pale on elevation and dependent rubor. So this is a dusky red when you put your foot down allowing it to be more dependent with the gravity pulling the blood through. For diagnosis, it's very important to know the ABI, the ankle brachial index. This is the most useful screening test. It's simple, quick, and non-invasive. It's positive for peripheral arterial disease if the ABI is under 0.90. So 0.50 is severe. If they have rest pain, it's typically under 0.4. And a normal ABI is typically 1 to 1.2. If it's actually over 1.2, this could be a possible non-compressible vessel, a calcified vessel, which may lead to a false reading. So it's non-compressible over 1.2, calcified vessels, false reading. And again, diagnostic of PAD if under 0.9. Arteriography, however, is the gold standard, but it's usually only performed if revascularization is planned in the future. So there's a lot of management we can do for these patients with PAD. Supportive first line, exercise, fixed distance walking program is important. Decreasing the risk factors like smoking cessation is associated with the greatest benefit. Also control their lipids and diabetics and their foot care. We can do platelet inhibitors like silostazole is the most effective. So we can also do platelet inhibitors like silostazole, which is the most effective medical treatment. And of course, aspirin, clopidogrel, and pentofixillin. So silostazole, most importantly, for peripheral arterial disease. And of course, revascularization. Percutaneous transluminal angioplasty, PTA, is the first-line revascularization procedure. You can also do bypass grafting or endarterectomy, but this is last line. So again, first line is that exercise, fixed distance walking, and of course, the lifestyle management. And then for platelet inhibitors, silostazole is the best. And of course, revascularization. Next we'll go to acute arterial occlusion. So acute arterial occlusion is acute limb ischemia, rapidly developing, or sudden decrease in limb perfusion. This is a vascular emergency, and typically it's thrombotic. 
thrombotic occlusion in most cases is the most common cause with pre-existing peripheral arterial disease, most commonly in the superficial femoral or the popliteal artery. Clinical manifestations are the six Ps, paresthesias, which is the earliest sign, also pain, pallor, pulselessness, poikilothermia, so cold, and paralysis, which is a late finding and, asso and associated with the worst prognosis. So paralysis is the latest finding with the worst prognosis, and paresthesias are the earliest finding. And of course, the six Ps are paresthesias, pain, pallor, pulselessness, poikilothermia, and paralysis. And symptoms usually occur distal to the occlusion as well. Decreased cap refill, decreased or absent pulses, and cool temperature, as we stated. Workup is a bedside arterial Doppler to assess for the pulses, and a CT angiography or, ca uh, or catheter angiography is first line. An immediate threatening limb may need to undergo further evaluation and treatment at a surgical suite. So we want to get that immediate surgical consult for this. Reperfusion is the mainstay of treatment for an acute arterial occlusion with a surgical bypass, surgical or catheter-based thromboembolectomy or endarterectomy, thrombolytic therapy, or percutaneous angioplasty. Next we'll go over thromboangitis obliterans. This is also known as Berger's disease. So thromboangitis obliterans. This is a non-atherosclerotic inflammatory small and medium vessel vasculitis leading to vaso-occlusive phenomena. You want to suspect this in younger smokers and tobacco users with distal extremity ischemia and ischemic ulcers and gangrene to the digits. Risk factors are smoking is the strongest association and it's most commonly seen in young men 20 to 45 years of age, especially in India, Asia, and Middle East. Clinical manifestations, a triad of distal extremity ischemia, both upper and lower extremities, claudication in the lower calf or arch of the foot, and ischemic ulcers, also Raynaud's phenomena, and superficial migratory thrombophlebitis due to the decreased blood flow in the medium and small arteries and veins. So again, Raynaud's distal extremity ischemia, both upper and lower extremities, and a superficial migratory thrombophlebitis. Diagnosis is, you'll also see an abnormal Allen's test. So remember the Allen's test, including the ulnar um, artery and the radial artery. Delayed perfusion in the radial ulnar arteries, as we said. Aerotography, we'll see corkscrew collaterals. So corkscrew collaterals, seen in the distal vessels. Very important to see a picture of those corkscrew collaterals for thromboangitis obliterans. And a biopsy is definitive. Management, smoking cessation is the cornerstone of management. You also do wound care, potential amputation if gangrenous, and you can also do ileoprost. Ileoprost is a prostaglandin analog that helps with critical limb ischemia while smoking cessation is in progress. Calcium channel blockers may help if they have concordant Raynaud's phenomena as well. So basically smoking cessation, care for the wound, you may have to do amputation, and ileoprost, that prostaglandin analog, helps with the ischemia, and potentially some calcium channel blockers for Raynaud's. Next will be an atrial myxoma. So an atrial myxoma is a primary cardiac tumor, it's the most common, and 80% occur in the left atrium, and most are found near the fossa ovalis. The pathophys is a ball valve obstruction of the mitral orifice, mimicking mitral stenosis. So it's basically a pedunculated tumor that acts as a ball valve in between um, the atria and the ventricles, mimicking mitral stenosis. The clinical manifestations are weight loss, syncope, dyspnea, triad of embolic phenomena, mitral stenosis-like symptoms, and constitutional flu-like symptoms, interestingly. For physical exam, it'll be associated with mitral stenosis-like findings with a prominent S1, trouble closing, low-pitched diastolic murmur as well. So mitral-like stenosis findings, low-pitched diastolic murmur as well. Transesophageal echo is the best test, and we'll see again that pedunculated ball valve obstruction in the mitral valve orifice. And for management, of course, surgical removal for atrial myxoma. Next will be giant cell or temporal arteritis. So this is a large and medium vessel granulomatous vasculitis of the extracranial branches of the carotid artery. So typically the temporal artery, the occipital artery, ophthalmic artery, and posterior ciliary artery. Mostly I've seen temporal artery. The same clinical spectrum, however, as polymyalgia rheumatica, 
and remember, 50% are, have concurrent polymyalgia rheumatica with GCA. Risk factors are women over 15 years old, and typically they'll have headache, jaw claudication with mastication, and visual changes, anterior ischemic optic neuritis is the most common, monocular vision loss, and CRAO, central retinal, central retinal artery occlusion. So importantly, headache and jaw claudication, and they have a risk of actually losing their vision, so this needs to be treated promptly. And the headache that they have is new in onset, it's very localized, often unilateral, lancinating in that temporal area for GCA. They may, have, they may have some scalp tenderness in that area, and the temporal artery may be pulseless or normal, but it also could be tender. Constitutional symptoms, fever, fatigue, weight loss, night sweats, and malaise. And for diagnosis, GCA is a clinical diagnosis with headache, jaw claudication, fever, and visual changes. You'll have an increased ESR and CRP on labs. Potentially a normocytic, normochromic anemia as well. And temporal biopsy is the definitive diagnosis. However, it's not always positive. You may also see a classic halo sign, which is temporal artery ultrasound, showing thickening of the artery, stenosis, or occlusion. So basically, it is clinical, but you will have an elevated ESR and CRP, and definitively, you want to do a temporal artery biopsy for definitive diagnosis. Initiate high-dose corticosteroids once GCA is suspected to prevent blindness. Do not delay treatment to do the biopsy or for the biopsy results. Blindness is the most common complication. Steroid-sparing agents or steroid refractory agents can also be used after too, like methotrexate or azathioprine, and a low-dose aspirin may help too. So most important, high-dose glucocorticoids, increased ESR, temporal artery biopsy, mostly a clinical diagnosis, headache, jaw claudication, um, amaurosis, visual changes, scalp tenderness, um, concordant polymyalgia rheumatica, women over 50, granulomatous vasculitis. So next we'll go to superficial thrombophlebitis. So superficial thrombophlebitis is an inflammation and thrombosis of a superficial vein, most commonly associated with IV catheterization, also pregnancy, varicose veins or venous stasis. We have to know the Trousseau sign, which is a migratory thrombophlebitis, which is commonly associated with malignancy, especially pancreatic cancer. So that's Trousseau sign, which is a migratory thrombophlebitis. Not Trousseau sign due to the hypocalcemia with the blood pressure cuff, but the Trousseau sign of migratory thrombophlebitis associated with pancreatic malignancy most commonly. Clinical manifestations are tenderness, pain, induration, edema, and erythema along the course of a vein under the skin. And classically, they'll describe it as a palpable cord. So a palpable cord. You want to do a venous duplex you'll see a non-compressible vein with a clot and wall thickening. Hypercoagulability workup should be done, looking for factor V, which is the most common cause, factor V Leiden, that is. Also prothrombin gene mutations, protein C and S, also antiphospholipid antibodies and lupus anticoagulant, factor VII, and homocysteine. For migratory phlebitis, you want to do a malignancy workup, again, looking for that pancreatic cancer. CEA, carcinoembryonic antigen, for gastric cancer, PSA for prostate cancer, prostate specific antigen, colonoscopy, a CT scan, a mammography as well could be done, as indicated, you know, based on your suspicion. But typically, the migratory thrombophlebitis, we need to know that it's pancreatic cancer. And these are also in patients with factor V Leiden. Supportive is the mainstay, actually. NSAIDs, extremity elevation, warm compresses, typically, no IV antibiotics unless they're septic in which case you want to do broad spectrum, which is penicillin plus aminoglycoside, if they are febrile. But typically, in the question, they'll ask you about a patient who has this, and they're not febrile. So you just want to do supportive with some NSAIDs and pain relief, and extremity elevation, and warm compresses, etc. You can do, however, vein ligation and excision, which is called a phlebectomy. This is if they have extensive varicose veins, if they have a septic phlebitis, or persistent symptoms despite the supportive measures. So that's superficial thrombophlebitis. Next we'll go into DVT. DVT, deep vein thrombosis. So DVT is the most important consequence of pulmonary embolism in 50%. Both are manifestations of a single entity. Most DVTs originate in the calf, of course, 
and the risk factors are SHE, S-H-E, stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial damage. So this is the classic Virchow's triad. Intimal damage will be like trauma, infection, or inflammation. Stasis will be immobilization, especially during surgery or, or having prolonged sitting for over four hours. Hypercoagulability, protein C or S deficiency. Factor five, Leiden mutation. Antithrombin three deficiency. Oral contraceptive use, malignancy, also pregnancy, and smoking are all risk factors for hypercoagulability. So again, for Virchow's triad, that's she, stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial damage. Manifestations, typically unilateral, swelling and edema of the lower extremity, greater than 3 centimeters is the most specific sign. So you want to take the circumference of both lower extremities to see if there's greater than a 3 centimeter difference. They may also have a positive Homan sign, although it's not reliable which is when you dorsiflex the calf and you palpate it and see if it's painful. And that will be that calf pain, calf pain and tenderness. For diagnosis, duplex ultrasound, venous duplex ultrasound, usually the first line imaging. You can get a D-dimer. However, it's highly sensitive, but it's not specific. So there's two main uses of a D-dimer overall. If you get a negative D-dimer with a low risk for DVT, you can exclude DVT as the diagnosis with that negative D-dimer. In a patient with moderate risk, however, a positive D-dimer and a negative initial ultrasound, you're kind of stuck. So you need to do serial ultrasounds in that case. In general, a positive DVT should be followed by ultrasonography as well. You could do a contrast venography. This is definitive and gold standard, but it is invasive, difficult, and rarely used. For management of a DVT, you want to do anticoagulation, of course, which is the first-line treatment for most patients with DVT. You can do low molecular weight heparin plus warfarin, or a low molecular weight heparin plus either dibigatran or idoxaban, which are DOAX, or monotherapy with rivaroxaban or apixaban, or apixaban, also DOAX. Then there's the IVC filter. So the IVC filter is mostly done for three main reasons. If they have recurrent DVT despite being on anticoagulation, or if they're stable and anticoagulation is contraindicated, or if they also have a right ventricular dysfunction with an enlarged right ventricle on echo. Thrombolysis or thrombectomy is generally not performed and reserved for massive DVTs or severe cases. So it's important to know the recommended duration of therapy and depending on what type of patient we have. So if they're the first event with a reversible or time-limiting risk factor for VTE, such as they just got out of surgery or something like that, then you want to do it for at least three months. And this would be again like trauma, surgery, OCPs, or pregnancy. So you want to do three months of anticoagulation in that case if they have a DVT. If they have a first episode of idiopathic DVT and there's no malignancy, you want to look if it's a distal DVT or proximal. Then you want to do long-term anticoagulation if it is a proximal DVT or PE. So that's long-term if it's idiopathic. So they don't know the cause of it, so we want to do that long-term anticoagulation. You can do three months if they're severely symptomatic with a distal DVT. No treatment and surveillance ultrasound if asymptomatic with a distal DVT. If they're pregnant, low molecular weight heparin. And if they have a malignancy, low molecular weight heparin. So we'll go through the Wells criteria, although we did do it in the pulmonary section. We'll go through it more here. Just to go over some of the clinical features of the Wells criteria and what you might see on a PE, you want to look for any active cancer, including treatment within the past six months or any palliation, that's one point. Paralysis, paresis, or immobilization of the lower extremity is one point. If they're bedridden for more than three days because of surgery, that's a point. If they have localized tenderness along the distribution of the deep veins, maybe a palpable cord, that's one point. Swelling of the entire leg is a point. Unilateral calf swelling of greater than three centimeters below the tibial tuberosity. Unilateral pitting edema collateral superficial veins. However, if they do have an alternative diagnosis that's as likely or more likely than a DVT, that's minus two points. So if they have a low probability for DVT, that's negative two to zero. If they have moderate, that's one to two. If they have a high probability, that's three to eight points. Or you could just do the two things. If it's high, if it's over four. If it's low, it's under four. And then to go over the different types of heparin and PAD versus PVD. So low molecular weight heparin 
It potentiates antithrombin-3. It's an SQ injection. For compliant, low-risk patients, they can be charged home during bridging therapy. The duration is about 12 hours for low molecular weight heparin. And there's no need to monitor the PTT. It's weight-based. It's more predictable. Protamine sulfate is the antidote, although it's not as effective in low molecular weight as it is for unfractionated heparin. Still protamine sulfate, however. And it has a lower risk of HIT. So that's heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. It is contraindicated in renal failure with a creatinine over 2. And because low molecular weight heparin is excreted by the kidneys, you want to look out, you want to look out for that. And of course, thrombocytopenia is a contraindication. So one differentiation that we need to say is low molecular weight heparin is better because it has low risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. However, if you want to have the antidote, protamine sulfate is not as effective for low molecular weight heparin as it is for unfractionated. So speaking of unfractionated, it's a similar mechanism. It potentiates antithrombin-3. However, for unfractionated, it inhibits thrombin and other coagulation factors as well. And this is given by a continuous IV drip. So you need hospitalization for bridging therapy for unfractionated. The duration of action is just one hour after the IV drip is discontinued. And you must monitor the PTT. It has to be 1.5 to 2.5, the normal value. So you have to monitor it with unfractionated. Protamine sulfate is the antidote. And heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is more common in unfractionated than in low molecular weight. So now we'll go through peripheral vascular disease and peripheral arterial disease with just some key comparisons. So peripheral vascular disease, we want to look for leg pain that's worse with dependency, standing or prolonged sitting as it all drains down. It improves with walking and elevation of the legs, which helps that venous return. And we'll have a cyanotic leg with dependency as well. For leg ulcers, they'll be medial with uneven ulcer margins. And skin findings are typically to have that stasis dermatitis, which is that eczematous rash and thickening of the skin. It'll also have a brownish pigmentation. Pulses and temperature are usually normal, and they have prominent edema as well in peripheral vascular disease. For peripheral arterial disease, we have the opposite. We have leg pain better with dependency and rest, worse with walking as the lower extremity requires more oxygen to those muscles, elevation of the leg, and cold. For redness of the leg with dependency, we'll have that classic dependent rubor and a cyanotic leg with elevation. And on the leg ulcers, we'll have the lateral malleolus ulcerated with clean margins. So these arterial um, ulcers are typically very clean in the margin, whereas the venous have a lot of stasis dermatitis and um, very uneven ulcer margins. We'll have some atrophic skin changes like thin, shiny skin for PAD, loss of hair, muscle atrophy, paler, and also interestingly thick nails. Also livido reticularis, which is that mottled appearance of that lower extremity. And of course, decreased pulses, decreased cap refill, and the temperature is usually very cool and with minimal to no edema for PAD. So we'll go into varicose veins next. So varicose veins are dilations of the superficial veins due to failure of the venous valves in the saphenous veins, leading to retrograde flow, venous stasis, and pooling of blood. There are some risk factors like family history, females, increased age, standing for long periods, of course obesity and increased estrogen use, and chronic venous insufficiency. Manifestations mostly asymptomatic, but may be present due to cosmetic issues, dull or ache with pressure, physical examination, dilated visible veins, telangiectasias, swelling, discoloration, venous stasis ulcers as well, and severe varicosities resulting in skin ulcerations, and they may have some ankle edema as well. The management is typically conservative overall, starting with compression stockings, leg elevation, and pain control. They can progress to do ablation, however. This would be a catheter-based endovenous thermal ablation, laser or radiofrequency, ligation or stripling, or sclerotherapy for varicose veins. Progressing to chronic venous insufficiency, these are changes due to venous hypertension of the lower extremities as a result of venous valvular incompetency. This is most commonly um, occurs after a superficial thrombophlebitis, after a DVT, or any trauma to the area. 
So the leg pain is worse with prolonged standing or prolonged sitting with their defeat, feet dependent, and the leg pain improves with ambulation or leg elevation. It's, it's classically described as a throbbing, aching, or a heavy leg, and they'll have stasis dermatitis on physical exam. This is more so of an itchy, eczematous rash, inflammatory papules, crusts, or scales, excoriations, or weeping erosions, brownish, dark, purple hyperpigmentation of the skin. This is due to hemosiderin deposition. Venous stasis ulcers at the medial malleolus and dependent pitting leg edema, increasing leg circumference, some varicosities and erythema with normal pulse and temperature, or the classic atrophy blanc. So this is atrophic, hypopigmented areas with telangiectasias and punctate red dots. So that's atrophy blanc. Management is still conservative if you can, which is the initial treatment of choice, leg elevation, compression stockings, exercise, weight management. You should, you should treat the underlying disease if you can. Um, surgical intervention can be done. It's reserved for patients not responsive, however, to conservative measurements. And ulcer management. So you want to do compression bandaging, zinc impregnated gauze, and wound debridement, and aspirin. Accelerates the ulcer healing. And the last topic. We'll go through ASA, salicylate, or aspirin, or acetyl salicylic acid. So the mechanism of aspirin is a non-selective and irreversibly inhibiting cyclooxygenase, COX-1 and COX-2, decreasing prostaglandin and thromboxane A2 synthesis, producing an anti-inflammatory, analgesic, antipyretic effect, and reducing platelet aggregation. Indi indications for aspirin are pain, fever, arthritis, anti-inflammatory, and high doses. Also, of course, antiplatelet aggregation using ACS, MI, TIA, and thromboembolic stroke prevention, rheum rheumatic fever, and Kawasaki disease. So remember, this is the only place we can give pediatrics aspirin is if they have Kawasaki disease. Contraindications are very important to know. So it narrows the afferent arterial, leading to renal injury, acute renal failure, interstitial nephritis, remember, remember AIN, acute interstitial nephritis, always involving NSAIDs, so that's aspirin, gastric mucosal injury, gastritis, gastric ulcers, due to the loss of the protective effects of prostaglandins, so remember our protective factors of the GI tract, BMP, bicarb, mucus, and prostaglandins, so here we're inhibiting those prostaglandins. Also, pill-induced esophagitis can get stuck in the esophagus, leading to some erosion and ulceration. Decreased uric acid excretion. So remember, DAN, DAN, diuretics, aspirin, and niacin are the drugs that increase gout exacerbations. So those are important to know. And of course, increased risk of Rye syndrome if used in children with a viral infection. Asthma exacerbation, possible hemolytic anemia with G6PD and enhances the effect of lithium, warfarin, heparin, and digoxin. Acute toxicity or overdose could lead to ototoxicity, cranial nerve 7 toxicity, some GI symptoms, of course, neurologic, um, ARDS as well, respiratory alkalosis early on from respiratory center stimulation leading to the hyperventilation. So this typically leads to a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Remember our mud pilers mnemonic, mud pilers mnemonic inhibits oxidative phosphorylation in the Krebs cycle, leading to accumulation of lactic acid. So remember how we have to treat this overdose from salicylates. But remember, typically it starts with that respiratory alkalosis due to the hyperventilation blowing off the CO2, leading to that alkalosis in the beginning, but then the aspirin overtakes it and leads to that high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So of course, supportive care and IV hydration, but definitely alkalinization of the urine should be done in aspirin overdose and serum IV sodium bicarb to increase salicylate excretion and decrease CNS toxicity. So very important IV sodium bicarb for that alkalinization and that increasing of excretion and decreasing CNS toxicity. You could also do activated charcoal to block salicylate absorption if you ingested the salicylate within the past two hours So and they have a secure airway. So you can only do that if it's very acute and they have a secured airway for the charcoal. And then last case is dialysis. So that's if they have a salicylate concentration over 100 milligrams and if it's very severe. So you want to do alkalinization, potentially charcoal, 
in dialysis as last line for salicylates. So that will conclude the cardiovascular system. Go ahead and leave a comment or subscribe if you want to see more. Um, and let me know in the comment section if there's things that can be improved upon. And um, otherwise, we'll see you in the next system.